crimes used to be a lot easier to get away with. Prior to 1987, when DNA profiling was first used to get a criminal conviction, it would seem that as long as you weren't caught in the act, and didn't explicitly tell anyone you planned to commit the crime, you could get away scot-free. It didn't matter if you'd left the weapon at the scene of the crime, gotten a number of injuries in the struggle, or had been covered head to toe in the victim's DNA. As long as no one saw you do it, you could live the rest of your life as a free person. Men and women used to be charged, tried, and imprisoned on hunches, or because they seemed like the type of guy who would kill someone, rather than any kind of direct evidence. Motive could be whatever the police said it was, whether that be they were jealous of a new promotion the person got, or if they wore all black most of the time. If someone new moved into the town the day before a murder, they could be charged on that alone, even if they had an airtight alibi. But through the use of DNA evidence and forensic science, the rate of patently false convictions went down. If one wanted to commit a murder, they would have to go through lengths to not be caught. Movies and television shows would depict a killer planning the perfect crime so as to not be caught, wearing gloves so they wouldn't leave any fingerprints, taking their victim by surprise so their DNA isn't found under the person's fingernails, and making sure that nothing left at the scene could be tied back to them. As long as they were careful and they kept their distance while committing their murder, they could potentially get away scot-free. Today, thousands of cold cases are being solved through testing DNA evidence, and the case we will be covering today is one of those times. Welcome back to another episode of Dreading, or if this is your first time here, welcome. Today, we will be covering the recently solved cold case of Robin Cornell and Lisa Story. This case came to us via a Patreon request, and after watching some of the material we will be looking over today, I understand why. This case does involve the murder of a child, and researching this case was extremely mentally taxing. As such, I want to urge that anyone who is sensitive to cases involving children to click off the video. Cases like this can be traumatizing, and though I don't go into graphic detail, it's important you put your mental health and well-being before anything else. As always, if there is a case you're interested in going over on this channel, feel free to let us know in the comments down below, or email us at treading.official at gmail.com. We are constantly adding new cases to our backlog, and responding to emails and corresponding with those involved. So if there is a case you feel we should pay more attention to, let us know. This video was brought to you by Scentbird. Did you know that scent is the most powerful sense to trigger a memory? According to brain scans, different fragrances trigger strong memories because of the brain regions that process them. Going out into a freshly mowed field reminds me of working on the farm with my dad and grandfather. Certain perfumes remind me of my mom and sister, and if I smell certain scents, I'm immediately transported back to when I was younger. But in today's modern age, it's harder to find a signature scent that people can attach to you. Or at least it was, prior to Scentbird. Scentbird is a fragrance subscription that lets you choose a new designer fragrance to try every month for just $17. Which is a steal, given that a lot of luxury fragrances start at at least $50 for a travel size. Every month, you get to pick what you want to receive so there are no surprises. They have over 600 perfumes and colognes, and a lot of unisex options. They carry brands like Gucci, Prada, and Versace, as well as indie labels like Skylar, Hectic, and Confessions of a Rebel. This month, Scentbird sent me Oh So Vert, Luzi Patchouli, which my brother really likes. It's incredibly earthy and different, with a surprising amount of citrus in it. It manages to be both clean and musky at the same time, which I've never really experienced. They also sent me Cross River Gorilla by Sanctuary, which I've been wearing all month and plan to repurchase. I would have never picked up the scent on my own, but it's really earthly as well and cool. It's a lot of natural, woody smells mixed with leather. If you're interested in trying Scentbird risk-free and finding your new signature scent, use coupon code DREADING for 55% off at Scentbird, which is just a little over $7 for your first month. Again, that's code DREADING for 55% off in both US and Canada. Thank you again to Scentbird for continuing to sponsor my content, and thank you to all of you who make sponsorships like this possible. Now, let us begin. Robin Cornell was a typical 11-year-old. She was excited about everything, and every day, she had new dreams that she wanted to pursue. She would tell her mom, Jan, and her babysitter, Lisa Story, about her dreams, and how one day she was going to be a lawyer, or a doctor, or an actress. And every day, they would tell her they knew she was going to do it all. Robin was extremely well-loved in her community. According to the parents of Robin's classmates, she was the type of child who talked to everyone. It didn't matter if someone was considered weird or unpopular, she would make sure no one was left out. 
But unfortunately, on May 9, 1990, her young life and all of her dreams would come to a tragic end. That day, Jan and Robin helped Lisa move into their shared home. Lisa had worked as a babysitter for Robin for a short while and had gotten close to the family. She was an international student who loved photography and motorcycles, and when she needed a new place to stay, it only made sense for her to move in with a single mother and her daughter. That way she could be there whenever Robin needed looking after. According to people around the small group of women, they all loved each other, and Lisa had become an aunt to the 11-year-old. They celebrated the move over dinner before Robin turned in for the night, exhausted by the day's events. As Lisa and Jan cleaned up the home, Trying to sort through all of their things, Jan got a call from her boyfriend, asking if she wanted to go over and watch some television with him. Initially, Jan said no. She had had a long day and was as exhausted as her daughter was. But Lisa encouraged her to go out and have some fun with her boyfriend. Lisa reminded her that the whole point of her moving into the home was to provide her with around-the-clock child care, and she didn't mind taking care of Robin for the night. After a little bit of encouraging, Jan decided to go telling Lisa she would be back within a few hours. She went into her daughter's room, kissed her on the head, and said, Good night. I'm going to Donnie's. I love you. And that, unfortunately, was the last thing she would ever say to her daughter. After Jan had left Robin and Lisa, a person had entered the town home through the sliding glass back door and quickly surveyed the home. First, they found Lisa's story in the room she had just moved into and quickly subdued her. Lisa fought back against the attacker, grabbing a fistful of his hair and clawing them the best she could. But after a short struggle, she was suffocated on her bed with one of her own pillows. The attack was loud and woke up the 11-year-old. Not knowing what was happening and not believing she was in danger in her own home, she got up to see what was happening. But once the intruder saw the young girl, he quickly assaulted her as well, hitting her multiple times in the face before she was knocked out. He then suffocated her as well. After killing both Lisa and Robin, he sexually violated them, leaving DNA in and on their bodies, as well as their bedsheets. He left their bodies in disturbing positions, with the desire to humiliate them in their death and traumatize whoever was to find the bodies. Following the murder and post-mortem sexual assaults, the killer appeared to have taken a shower, seemingly unconcerned with the idea of being discovered. Shortly thereafter, they left the scene, unknowingly leaving their car keys in the kitchen of the home. The next morning, Jan woke up at 4 a.m., still at her boyfriend's house. She had accidentally fallen asleep on his couch and realized her mistake. She flew into a panic, both because she had not returned home like she said she would and because she had to start work at 4.30 in the morning. Her boyfriend's home was only a few blocks away from her own, but she knew she was going to be late. She rushed home, but immediately knew something was wrong as she couldn't get into the door. The door had two locks, a deadbolt, which worked, and another in the doorknob, which did not but one key was supposed to open both. Everyone who had come to her home knew better than to lock the doorknob, and she knew Lisa would have never done so. Once more, she began to panic. She quickly rushed to the back of the home that she shared with her daughter and the babysitter, and found the sliding glass door completely open, with the blinds blowing in and out. She yelled out for Lisa and Robin, hoping they were playing a prank on her, or that Lisa might have gotten drunk and left the house in disarray, but no one answered. The home itself was freezing, as the back door had been open with the air conditioning put on full blast. Jan hurried through the house, and was horrified to find Lisa and Robin dead on their beds. When Jan found her daughter deceased in her own bed, she quickly fought to save her life. She moved Robin to the ground and began to do CPR, hoping that she would be able to bring her back from the dead. But it was too late. Both Robin and Lisa were beyond saving. Multiple neighbors heard the commotion and called the police, and were traumatized by what they found. The details of the case were horrific, and the fact that such a brutality had been done to a girl who was only 11 years old, who asked her mom in the days leading up to her death if she was old enough to have her first kiss, made many officers sick. Many who looked at the case stated without a shadow of a doubt that it would be solved quickly. Whoever had taken Robin and Lisa's lives had left a plethora of evidence. They had left their DNA everywhere and had seemingly forgotten their car keys. But that was not the case. Police canvassed the area, obtained hundreds of DNA samples, and followed up on every lead that they could, but nothing came of it. Jan spoke to the police frequently, trying to keep her daughter and friend's case at the top of their minds, but it had stalled, and people had moved on. She reached out for help from different groups and former police officers, hoping that they could provide answers, but they too came up short. The story was featured on television shows like America's Most Wanted in the hopes that continued publicity would lead to a break in the case, but the case would remain cold until 26 years later.
Joseph Seiler was in Lee County Jail on a felony aggravated battery charge for shooting his son with a pellet gun in August of 2016 when his DNA was placed into the criminal database. Seiler had not been connected to the case and had never met Robin or Lisa prior to the murders. However, once his DNA was added to the criminal database, it showed that it was a match for the DNA that was found in and on both Lisa and Robin. He had conclusively been shown to have been the person to kill both Lisa and Robin. However, he denied any wrongdoing. He stated that he had never met Lisa or Robin, and that there was no way that it was his DNA at the crime scene. He claimed that the DNA that they found was likely his uncle, his brother, or his father, and that it had been them that committed the crime, as they lived less than five miles away from the murder, which would also put him close to the murder at the time. He would then change his story, stating that it was possible for the DNA found at the scene to have belonged to him, only because he had slept with someone at that location before, and that Jan, Robin, and Lisa had never cleaned their sheets. At times, he would state that he had sex with Jan while on vacation once, and that he had simply left so much DNA during their sexual escapades that it was still showing up years later. He also routinely stated that the DNA that was found at the scene couldn't possibly match him as the hair that was found gripped in Robin's fist was blonde, and he was brunette. But to be clear, there was never any record of the hair being blonde. His story made no sense, and it was clear to anyone who saw the facts of the case that he was guilty, and many believed he would eventually admit to his guilt prior to the trial. The evidence was overwhelming. However, he refused to, instead pleading not guilty in court. It's unclear that he sincerely believed that he could beat the conviction, but it's unlikely that is what he wanted. He had gotten away with murder for two decades, and he wanted to continue to have control over his life, especially if that meant re-traumatizing all of those who had been involved in the case. On June 8, 2022, while awaiting trial, Joseph would write a letter to the judge in his case. The following is that letter. Honorable Robert Branning. I have a fair offer to avoid bringing this to jury trial. If you order full retesting of all exhibits, with NB32 prefix, and any of them test to contain either victim's epithelial profile, I will waive a jury trial and allow you to personally impose sentencing. However, you must agree to drop all charges if my DNA genotype is mixed with, as I have said from the beginning, either redacted or redacted partial profile, because if either redact are in any NB32 exhibit, there is no way possible it could originate from the night of the crime. You know this. Pausing for just a moment, but the DNA that they matched with Joseph was not old DNA. It wasn't found on the bedsheets from years earlier. His hair was found clutched in Lisa's hand and in her mouth. So his argument that while she was being killed by another person who left no DNA in the home, she grabbed hold of a random patch of his hair that had been left on her bed for years prior. That makes no sense and is clearly false. But continuing with the letter. To include zero in an independent lab not affiliated with FDLE. NB32A1 plus 2 NB3261 underscore 2 NB32E and all things connected. This of course must also test and verify my actual genotype. If my genotype is neither 1.1.1.2 or 1.2.1.2, you let me go. I am a man of my word and I will give you my word if my genotype DNA is in any way mixed with either victim. Redacted. I will waive a jury trial. Put me to death. I give you my assurance. I am in no way connected to either victim. The only exhibit allegedly tying me to this crime is NB32A, which I contest is Geno reading of 1.2.1.2, because any DNA expert will tell you a mix of four people rarely yields an uncontestable genotype identifying one single individual. Excuse me if I doubt my genotype is either the genotypes quoted in this case. I do not believe myself to be either 1.1.1.2 or 1.2.1.2. CCPD is hiding information. You cannot contest. Retesting of SV1K has ruined the state's capital rape case. No discernible geno reading means no scientific foundation. The second rape charge had zero foundation from the very start because no amplifiable DNA was present. You have no case for rape. And lastly, the very light blonde hair in Redacted's mouth and stuck to both bodies and found on both transport sheets, very light blonde is found in 2% of the population worldwide, pretty much points to another person, as I have very dark brown hair. Again, pausing for just a moment to say that the hairs that were found at the scene were brown. When the evidence was collected and logged, it was logged as brown hair. 
when it was discussed in police documents and records, it was described as being brown. Joseph saying the DNA was blonde is just false. But back to the letter. Dark brown haired individuals don't leave dozens of blonde hairs behind. I am innocent. There's no way to contest a non-matching genotype, fingerprints, hair color, and a mix of either adult female redacted mixed with my DNA. Your Honor, read Discovery, especially Mary Legrand's interview. Redacted can in no way remember the number of men quoted throughout Discovery. They're both senile. And even gamble, if I'm in any way mixed with either victim, I welcome your best, no trial. If I prove my honesty, you let me go. Being young, on vacation, sleeping with divorced, willing, consensual older women is in no way a crime. Dementia can't excuse genotype reports. Even odds say it can go either way. Respectfully maintaining my innocence, Jay Zeeler. And do you really want this returned to your courtroom? I will not plead to a crime I had no part in. Freeing me is no gift, homeless and penniless at 60. I will leave Florida within 24 hours after reviewing my chronic care medication and disability. Also, sir, did you know my father is a disgraced pedophile, Cape Coral, third in command, Cape Coral police shift commander, supervisor, along with his brother from Punta Gorda, both with pregnant 12-year-old girls on public records, and Cape Coral, both on probation in 1990, and were never looked at by CCPD, even though they lived within five miles the night the crime happened? This is why they're hiding this. This is why CCPD wants to close this on the hush-hush quiet down low. They absolutely have the wrong person and have had the pedophile who caused this on probation employed by them underneath their noses for 30 years. And now, after charging me by jumping the gun on lineal, they know they face public humiliation if they reveal the perpetrator of this crime was one of their own. And they've ignored the lineal for six years to avoid embarrassing themselves. Think I'm lying? Check. Mr. Feinberg is aware. I will provide all family history plus info. It's someone in my family, brothers, uncle, or father. All right, so that is that. This is similar to Dustin McFetridge writing the judge in his case and promising that he is innocent and should be allowed to just leave prison. Joseph believes that he should just tell the judge he is innocent and all the evidence against him is fabricated, and then he'll be allowed to leave. He is a man of his word after all. The DNA would be retested by another lab prior to the trial, and once more, the DNA was found to be an exact match to Zeeler. Moreover, his allegations against his family held no weight, as their DNA had been in the system for longer than Zeeler's, and was not a match to what was found at the scene. The case would eventually go to trial in May of 2023, and Zeeler's defense had an extremely hard time contesting the facts of the case. They were forced to fight that despite Zeeler's DNA match, he had not been the murderer. They tried to argue that the hair had been blonde, not brunette, and that the murder had been done to ruin Jan's life. They argued that Jan was leading a double life, and that her shady actions had led to her daughter's and friend's death, but they showed no evidence of this. Joseph would eventually take the stand in his own defense, and it would go horrifically. Whenever we cover cases where a person takes the stand in their own defense, we discuss what they would need to do in order to convince a jury. Usually, their goal is to seem as meek and docile as possible, making it impossible to imagine them hurting anyone. They want to seem innocent, kind, and fragile, with the hopes that their actions will speak louder than the evidence. But in this case, that is not true. There is so much conclusive evidence that Zeeler is the one who killed Robin and Lisa that there is no arguing that he is innocent. So, let's see what he does. Mr. Shirley, your witness. Thank you, Your Honor. Please tell the jury your name. Joseph Adam Zeiler. Are you the defendant in this, in this case? Yes. May I approach? Approach. Mr. Zeiler, let me show you what's been previously identified as our exhibit A. Can you tell me what that exhibit is? There's a picture of me and my son who's clutching my back and my um, cousin, one of two twins, um, Danny. How old are you in that picture? 26. What color hair do you have in that picture? Hold on, let me think about that. How old I was, sorry. In less than a minute on the stand, Joseph has already made himself appear untrustworthy and guilty. This testimony would take place on day three of the trial. 
after the jury had been made aware of all the evidence. Joseph's demeanor, posture, and inability to answer the question correctly the first time would confirm his guilt to the jury. Moreover, this is his attorney. He would have been prepped on how to respond to this question, and the fact that he is unsure says a lot. I guess I was, I'll say 26. I have a problem with, with dates. Um, what color was your hair? Uh, same color. I was born with very, very dark brown. Okay, have you always had that color hair? Yes, sir. Let me show you what's been uh, previously identified as our exhibit B. Can you, do you recognize that exhibit? Yes. Is that a photograph? Yes. Do you recognize the person in the photograph? Yes. Who is that? That's my older brother, um, Robert Joseph Zeiler, who I was raised with, but I believe he's my half-brother. We'll get to that in a minute. Okay. I'd, I'd like to have these admitted in evidence, please. No objection. Yeah. Yeah. Publish to the jury. Hold on. <clears throat> Defense A and B are admitted. You may publish. Thank you. Rather than pass in office, like look. These two men both have brown hair. Do you have any other brothers? Yes, I have a brother. Um, Steve, he was five years older than me, but he <clears throat> he died, I believe, about 2008. And uh, obviously you have a father. Well, um, <clears throat> I really don't know who my father is because, of course, I was born with very dark brown hair, and my brothers were born with light sandy hair, and my mother kept that secret, um, I guess, for her own safety. Okay. Back in 1990, when this event occurred, uh, where did your brothers reside? Well, both my brothers were here in December of 89. All right, stop. Where's here? In Florida. Okay, where in Florida? Oh, Cape Coral. Okay, did they did they live in Cape Coral? Yes, they were, they were working on the Cape Coral Hospital as block, a block mason and laborer. Okay, and uh, was your father, or the person that may be your father, was he living down here then? Yes. Where was he working? I believe he wasn't working. He was living on a houseboat in Marina Town, but I believe he was retired from working. From where? Well, he didn't leave voluntarily. He was arrested in Cape Coral driving the Cape Coral squad car. Was he a member of the Cape Coral Police Department? Yes, sir. He was like the fourth member down from chief of police. He was the shift commander of the Cape Coral Police Department. Joseph is unable to answer a question directly. When asked if he is a father, he states that's a hard question because he no longer thinks the person who raised him is his father because he has darker hair. We've attempted to look into this, and there's no evidence that the man who raised him isn't his father. When asked where his relatives were living in 1990, he begins to talk about their jobs, and only tells the court, Cape Coral, when prodded by his attorney. He is refusing to be direct, and only answers questions in a roundabout way. This is a telltale sign of someone not being truthful. Think of a time when you ask a question to a child. You ask them if they finished their homework or cleaned their room. And instead of saying yes or no, they begin to tell you how they were in their room, and then they heard a noise, and then they found a toy they had lost a year ago, and the toy was a Power Rangers action figure, and they remembered this really, really great episode of Power Rangers that they saw another year ago, and so on and so forth. They don't want to tell you something that you don't want to hear, so instead, they try and distract you by telling you something else entirely. That's what Joseph is doing, because he's about as smart as a three-year-old. All right, let me ask you a, a couple of questions. Um, where were you born? I was born in a in, uh, little company of Mary Hospital in Evergreen Park, Illinois. How long did you live in Illinois? Uh, 
I lived in Illinois until I was 16, and my parents, I call them my parents because I'm so used to calling that man my, my father, so I will slip up once in a while, but the man I believed was my father at that time forced me to move down here with him and my mother because my mother wanted me to finish high school. Okay, so you and your mother and the person that maybe your father moved to, where, where down here? We moved to Parkwood Estates was our first residence, which is uh, Central Fort Myers by Pagefield. Okay, how long were you in Florida? Um, one second. Um, well, I've on and off, back and forth, so from from Florida to Illinois, you know, so, I mean, at least a half a dozen times. Were you ever a resident of the state of Maryland? Yes, I was. All right, and, and back in 1990, were you uh, registered as a driver in the state of Maryland? Yes, I was. Oh, has your hair ever been light? No, never. Do you know Jan Cornell? No, no, I, I don't know Jan Cornell. Do you know Lisa Story? No. Do you know Robin Cornell? No. There was another name that was mentioned uh, during um, the questioning, a Leanne Deller? Uh, no, I, all them names I read in my discovery and that's how I became aware of them names. Okay. Have you, you, you saw photographs of the residence where this event occurred? You've been here during trial, haven't you, Mr. Zeiler? Well, yes, I've been here during trial, but when the, the Cape Coral police interrogated me, they didn't show me the owner of the apartment. Okay. I'm asking you now, have you seen photographs that were admitted into evidence depicting the scene of the event? Yes. Have you ever been in there? No. Now, you made phone calls after you were initially arrested for the event that occurred with Ms. Nisley's son. You made phone calls to her, did you not? Yes, he's my son with her. Um, so it, it, are you the, are you the birth father of that child? Yes. Um, <clears throat> when he was born, Bonnie was still married to her, uh, first husband. So they put his name on the birth certificate, but I agreed to sign the paper to have it removed. Okay. So do you, do you basically raise that child as your own? Yes. The uh, the letter that you wrote to Bonnie that was read in court, you were making reference to somebody who was living in the house and who needed to go on. Who were those references about? That's, that's our son together, Zachary. Okay. At any point in time in the letter, were you making any admissions to having committed this offense? Zachary's offense? No. No, the not, offense for no. which you're charged in this courtroom. No, not no, not at all. What were you referring to? Um, I was referring to my altercation with my 26 year old drunken son. The uh, you made reference to something that happened in 1990. What was that? I was arrested in July of 1990. Um. Because it was my son's birthday, that's how I remember my oldest, my oldest son, um, Joey's birthday, and I had, I had a pistol on board my sailboat. He was visiting me, and when I went across the street to go do some laundry, I didn't feel comfortable leaving the pistol on the boat with him. I was trying to be responsible, and. Uh, I took the gun with me across the street to do some laundry. And while I was there, I stopped in a jewelry store to try to sell uh, or tr sell 
uh, a couple items so I could buy him a birthday present. Okay. And were you ultimately held responsible for that? Well, yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, sir. <clears throat> Well, with, without getting into all the events, is yeah. that part of your prior felony conviction? Oh, yes, yes. All right. Back in May of 1990, were there any warrants out for you? Yes, there was There was a warrant out for me in St. Mary County, Maryland, uh, issued 52990. That was... That was the day that I left because they came to my work trying to find me and my boss covered for me. I jumped on my, my motorcycle and I headed here. All right. Was there a warrant for you out of Chicago issued in 1987? Yes. Yes. Did you make reference in either the phone calls or the letter to those warrants? Well, yeah, that's exactly what I was talking about, about the stuff we talked about before. I previously mentioned how when you take the stand in your own defense, you want to come off as innocent. You want to appear forthright, honest, and completely incapable of doing what you're being charged with. And Joseph has managed to do the opposite. His attorney, going through all of his prior warrants and charges, we get the sense that Joseph is not entirely a trustworthy person who is not above breaking the law. In the brief glimpses we get of his prior crimes, from shooting his son with a pellet gun, we know he isn't above harming others, and he's completely alright with running from the law, like what occurred in this case, and he's doing nothing to make any of his actions seem justified. Uh, were, you, were you ever stopped in the state of Florida? Yes, yes, um, probably four or five times all together, but only twice with Bonnie, with me. Now she recited that the, uh, the time that you were stopped was much later on uh, in your relationship. Do you recall when the first time you were stopped for well, the yeah, Chicago warrant? The first time we were together when we were stopped <laughs> together was at leaving Heavenly Pizza in North Fort Myers. We were driving um, her Jeep and the police pulled us over and um, they put me in the back of the squad car and held me for close to an hour and a half. Did they release you? Yes, but they told me at any time that the warrant was still active. Did you hear Sustained. Excuse me? What the police said. Sustained. Move on. But, but you were aware that that warrant is still active? Yes. Where were you? Well, let me ask a different question. Um, you heard the, the last state's witness testify with regard to some comments that you made while you were in the custody of the Cape Coral Police Department. Did you hear those? Mm-hmm. Is that a yes? Yes, yes, sorry. Yes. All right, one of those comments was something about the death penalty. Why did you talk to the officer about the death penalty? Well, I was being facetious because I knew that they arrested the wrong person. Where, where were you on May 9th and 10th of 1990? I was in Maryland. And... Mr. Zeiler, um, you've heard experts testify in this case that uh, they are convinced that at least one, if not all three, of the sites of uh, uh, semen or of other bodily fluid that were placed on the bed sheet, the pillow, and or the exterior of the young lady's genitalia was your semen. Uh, is that possible? No, it's not. This statement directly goes against his own letter. Again, he claimed he had sex with Jan, and that's how his semen and his hair was found in the home. To quote his letter, being young, on vacation, sleeping with divorced, willing, consensual older women is in no way a crime, unquote. But now, while on the stand, he is claiming he never met her. Uh, Judge, at this time, I have no further questions. Um, Mr. Zeiler may want to address the jury.
Let's go over the defense briefly here, because it's important. Joseph says he didn't do it, that he was out of state when the crime occurred, and therefore it cannot be him. However, his attorney offers no evidence of this. There are no bank records that place Joseph in Maryland. He doesn't have any records of working in Maryland at the time of the crime, and there's quite literally nothing placing him there. They provide nothing to supplement his statements, and instead, his simple answer is supposed to be enough for the jury in this case. According to Joseph's lawyer, Joseph wanted a moment to address the court himself and give his own perspective as to what happened, which is ridiculous. The lawyer knows this. He doesn't want to ask if it's okay for his client to go on a monologue about his thoughts on the case. But, as we will see, Joseph is incredibly aggressive and entirely unwilling to compromise. It was also theorized by court TV correspondents that Joseph was going to perjure himself while on the stand, and that he wanted his lawyer to ask him specific questions for him to do so, and he would be unable to do that. From whom the letter is coming says Joseph Adam Zeiler at the top, and then it, there's more, but that's the first part. Yes. And what are the numbers 47492 slash 835775? That's my ID number followed by my booking number. At the Lee County Jail? Yes. And the address of 2115 MLK Boulevard, Main Jail, Fort Myers, 33901, that's the, where you're being housed? Yes. And that letter was addressed to who, sir? J.G. Batista and family. At what, well, um, who, do you, did you address this envelope? Yes. And who was J. G. Batista and family. Well, I thought it was Jenny Gal Batista. Oh, so you were trying to send this letter to Robin's sister then? Yes. Okay. No. Yes. Um, I was trying to send it to family, actually. So I guess I was trying to send it to everybody. The whole Batista family? Yes. And in that particular letter, uh, did you uh, profess your innocence by claiming that it was a relative of yours that did this murder? Yes, I was trying to defend myself because no one would listen to me. Sure, it calls for a yes or no. Did you, in the letter, profess your innocence or allege your innocence by saying that a relative of yours had done these murders? Yes. What he just admitted to was horrifying. His DNA was at the scene, not a family member's, not an unknown, blonde man, his. And he decided to send a letter to whom he believed was the victim's family, which is obviously disgusting. Did you suggest, in addition to that, no, did you tell the people who this letter's addressed to that you slept with Jan Cornell, Janice, and a friend of hers in 1989, and therefore that's why your DNA is in the courtyard's north condominium. Yes, I, I thought so because she didn't wash her sheets. You know whether or not Miss Cornell washes her sheets? Also, I, how I got that is by the information I was giving, given from you was discovery, and I thought that the only way my DNA could have gotten there was me sleeping with Jan Cornell and Leanne Deller. As a reminder, he said in direct examination that he had never slept with Jan Cornell or Lee Ann Deller. Did you sleep with Jan Cornell and Miss Deller? It's possible because I was here. Well, now you were here. I mean, I was here in December 89. I testified to that earlier. And what I believe happened is I slept with Jan Cornell and Leanne Deller, and they were just too much of a pig not to wash their sheets. He just called the mother of the victim, the woman who discovered the body of her 11-year-old daughter, and performed CPR on her, a pig. Jan had no part in the crime, and had fought for years to keep her daughter's name in the public eye. In her testimony, she broke down discussing finding her daughter and her friend dead, and how she is haunted by that night. She is a victim in this, and he just called her a pig, all while asking the jury to overlook the concrete evidence that he is the killer, and changing his story to state that he was in Florida at the time of the murder, and he somehow believed that he was going to be found innocent.
And during your direct exam by uh, counsel, your attorney, you just you indicate you've never been in their condominium. I'm speculating that the only way my DNA could have got in there is if I slept with them during December 89 while I was here for the month of December. And then it would have to follow that your DNA would have stayed viable for five. The, hold, let me finish my question. For if it was January, February, March, April, May of 1990, and then, well, okay, I don't want to make it a compound question. Your DNA would have still been there five months later. Yes. And that's because they're pigs and they don't wash their sheets, exactly. right? Exactly. You know that? Well, I, I, I assume that, just like you're assuming that I, that. But just so the record's clear, when I said they're pigs and they wash their sheets, that's what you said. Absolutely. All right. And sitting in, in jail, pending charges on this case, uh, you thought that this was appropriate to send the 11-year-old who was murdered to the mother? Well, nobody would listen to me, so I was trying to defend myself. Can I speak? No, sir. Wait for a question, please. May I retrieve the exhibit? Go ahead. <clears throat> Approach with, with uh, Exhibit 312. 312. Take a moment to look at that letter, please. Was the previous exhibit admitted? Move to admit 311 if I didn't. No objection. 311 is admitted. Sir, on the second page, uh, that which shows the envelope which was sent to, again, J.G. Batista and uh, addressed from Joseph Adams Eiler with the same numbers. Is that also a letter you wrote? I concede I wrote all this. And in this second letter, you, uh, you, you told Jan Cornell, you directed this towards Jan Cornell, correct? And when you said this. I can't and say unless you show me the letter. I am. I want to direct you to the page right now, page three. So it's the, the page right after the envelope picture on the second paragraph. Did you address to Jan Cornell the following? The only way, underlined, is to admit you possibly could have slept with me as a night encounter and you can't remember, you won't be sure, you won't retest. Did you? Hold on a second. Okay. I don't see Jan Cornell's name above that. Joseph believes that he's besting the lawyer here and that he's coming across completely rationally, which is absurd given what is currently happening. He makes unbroken, aggressive eye contact with opposing counsel, trying to establish dominance. He raises his hand to shush the lawyer when he begins saying things he doesn't like, and he bites back at his statements in an inane, self-serving way, all believing that the jury is going to look at his actions and think, oh yeah, this guy couldn't have done this. He's completely delusional. You said Jan Cornell's name was there. No, I, no, on no, that no. Page. I said, were you, who were you? I'll ask it this way. Who were you addressing when you made that statement? Did, is there someone else in the Batista family you slept with? Let, the, to you? let the witness answer the question before you ask another question, sir. Yes, Your Honor. Well, uh, yeah, I, yes. Yes to what? I don't know. Ask it again. I, All right. What the fuck? I'm going to ask it open-ended. It's fine, right. right? A very open-ended question. When you made that statement in the letter, who were you directing that Jan to? Cornell, I was trying to get her to ask to retest NB32A because it doesn't contain my DNA. It does. And Joseph is not an expert when it comes to DNA. So him attempting to give expert testimony about the subject is moot. I don't believe. I don't believe it is. You've been sitting here for the last two and a half days, right? Pretty much, yeah. Did you hear the testimony of who was it that retested? Which, Jim Pollock. Of Jim Pollock, 
Was it Jim Pollock? It was Jim Pollock. It was no, no, the retest. The retest. That Ordovan, Vicky Molino. All right. All well, the DNA witnesses, did you hear them say that they actually did retest NB32, that they actually took the sheet, recut another sample, and had another analyst do the same test? Did you hear that? Yes. So the retesting was done. I believe FDLE is siding with the prosecution. Of course they're going to say that. So let's go over what he believes happened. He believes he slept with Jan Cornell or her friend in 1989, and she never washed her sheets afterwards. Then, months later, Lisa and Robin were killed by another person, a blonde-haired mystery man who just so happened to have the same DNA as him. Then, for over 20 years, the police pretended to look for the culprit of this crime, but knew it was either his father or his uncle, both of which are pedophiles who had previously worked for the police. They hid this fact for years, and it was only decades later when Joseph's DNA was taken after he shot his son, that they decided to pin the crime on him. So everyone in multiple testing labs, the police, and the prosecution got together to pin the crime on him, for no reason, and all the evidence that makes him look guilty was all planted and fake. That sounds about right. Okay, and their opinion on that was that Jan Cornell was excluded from that DNA. I don't think she was. I think that if it was listed, that's the reason I asked for it to be retested, because I don't believe that. Now, if you flip the page for me and you go to the fourth page of this pack of that exhibit, and I'm going to ask you to look at the bottom. Did you uh, also direct this to Jan Cornell? If you knowingly allow them to convict the wrong man out of spite and vengeance, I will drag this, parentheses, and you, Robin and Lisa, through appeals all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court in Washington, D.C. Absolutely. I wrote that. And did you also write on the next line, I'm innocent, I will prove it, no matter how long it takes, do you really want the rest of your life spent in court? Yes, I wrote that. You're threatening then Miss Cornell with how you what you're going to do should she not what what do you want her to do? Well, she's calling me a rapist and a murderer, so what I can't I can't write that. So, I mean, she's calling on. me a rapist and a murderer and I'm calling her a pig for not washing her sheets. At what point in the 20 uh, in the 33 years has Miss Cornell called you anything? What do you mean? At what point well, she... Why am I in court today? You're all trying to, com to convince this jury that I somehow left blonde hair and Lisa Honor, Stewart's mouth and clutch in Robin that. Cornell's fist because Mr. that's the piece of paper right here Mr. that they're trying to hide from you. Mr. Right Siler. Here. I still see the body of 11-year-old Robin Siler. Cornell yeah. with the hand, with the hair of her Let killer. The jury will step out. The blonde Mr. hair... So we're going to stop this here, because that was horrible. Joseph would be admonished by the judge and threatened to be placed in contempt of court. If you are interested in watching the rest of the cross-examination, I will leave a link to it in the description down below. Notably, he would end up flipping off the cameras in court while testifying, as if he couldn't get any worse. Joseph believed he was going to be able to walk away from this case with the jury on his side. He believed that simply by him saying that the evidence was fake, and that all the experts in the case were lying, that he would be able to get away with murder. But that was far from the case. The evidence and his behavior on the stand resulted in an incredibly short deliberation, and Joseph was found guilty on all counts. The jury would recommend the death penalty for Joseph, citing his harassment of the victim's families and his lack of remorse. I don't know how bad you have to fuck this up to where a group of people all kind of sit down and think, you know what, yeah, he needs to, he needs to leave the planet. He's too much of a liability. While awaiting his sentencing, he would attack his own lawyer in the courtroom. According to his attorney, Kevin Shirley, he seemed like he didn't want our conversation to be picked up by the microphones. So he waved me down and I bent over and he struck me. He had also etched the word killer into his veneers, flashing them at the cameras as he waited to hear his sentence. Joseph had been hoping to get a retrial, but after the assault, the judge denied his motion and decided not to overturn his conviction. The judge would then sentence him to death. According to an interview he would do with NBC2, after he was sent to death row, Joseph had etched the words killer into his teeth because he was, quote, playing the role after being convicted. 
He then stated that his attorney had sabotaged him during the trial because he was sleeping with his aunt, and that he would eventually get a new trial and prove his innocence. He was quoted as saying, The conviction's going to be overturned the minute I get post-conviction DNA testing. I'm confident in that. I know where I've been, and I ain't been there. Which is an objectively odd thing to say, when according to his own testimony, he doesn't know where he's been or if he's ever slept with Jan Cornell or not. Joseph is now back in court facing harassment charges, stemming from the multiple letters he sent to Jan Cornell, threatening her not to testify. But regardless of what happens in that case or what Joseph believes, he will never see the light of day again. If you... For 33 years, Jan Cornell has kept this last recording of her daughter Robin's voice. I don't even know where to... To begin. And now, for the first time in 33 years, Cornell says she's at peace. Knowing that Robin and Lisa are going to have justice on the books forever. Because that's all I could ever make sure happen for them after this. Thank you again to Scentbird for continuing to sponsor my content. Confidence can get you anywhere. The idiom is simple enough, and simply means that those who project themselves as being confident are able to do so more than those who don't appear so. Let's say you were trying to sneak into a festival. All of your friends are going, but you weren't able to get tickets. So you and your friends devise a plan. They will all go inside first and get their wristbands for the event. But once inside, one of your friends will take off their wristband, and another friend, still wearing theirs, will walk out and give you the spare one. The plan should work, should you both appear confident and not draw attention to yourself. The beginning stages of the plan go perfectly. They walk in, no issue. But you, sitting outside of the gates, begin to get nervous. You have the feeling that people are staring at you, like they know what you're about to do. And out of fear, you begin to stare at security. You anxiously keep looking at them trying to see if they've noticed you, and because of your suspicious gaze, they have. This makes you even more frazzled. You begin to wring your hands and try to look comfortable, but you can't help yourself. You feel like now, everyone around you knows what you're up to, and everything you do is making you look worse. Finally, your friend comes out of the venue with the spare wristband in their pocket. They greet you with a smile and seem calm and collected, but immediately, they sense that something is off about you. They notice the security already looking at you, and they see how pale you've gotten. There's no way for you to put the wristband on here, so they try to get you to calm down, to go on a short walk with them, so you can relax and go through the gate with no issue. But it's already too late. You've attracted the security's attention, and now they know what you two are up to. But had you appeared self-assured and confident, chances are you wouldn't have attracted all of that negative attention. You could have just walked into the event with the wristband and your friends with no issue. There are countless ways that this kind of unseen confidence can help people in their daily lives. But in today's case, we will watch as a person lets their confidence destroy them and their life. Welcome back to another episode of Dreading, or if this is your first time here, welcome. Today we are going to be covering the case of Richard Merritt, and how this disgraced lawyer thought he would get away with his crimes by taking the stand. This case was recommended to us by someone who purported to be close to Richard in his youth, and after my brother and I researched this case, it's easy to see why they thought this would make for an interesting video. As always, if there is a case you're interested in us covering, feel free to let us know in the comments down below, or email us at dreading.official at gmail.com. We're constantly adding new cases to our backlog, responding to emails, and corresponding with those involved. So if there's a case you feel that we need to pay more attention to, let us know. If you're interested in seeing these videos as soon as they're finished, our Patreon is linked down below. We're constantly adding new videos over there, and currently, the next month's worth of videos are available to be watched at your leisure. Our Patreon is how we're able to make this content consistently, as YouTube regularly demonetizes our channel. But to be clear, even if our channel was fully demonetized, we would still post the majority of our videos here for public consumption. But with all that said, let us begin. According to those who knew him, Richard Merritt was an egotistical man. Upon first introduction, most people would state he was charming. He could make you feel like the most important person in the room, simply because he, a self-identified, incredibly successful lawyer, was paying attention to you. But that charm quickly wore off. He seemed to be in a constant competition with himself and others, always looking to one-up anyone he believed was doing better than him. On multiple occasions, 
when someone he knew was talking about a promotion they received or some accolade that they had just gotten, Richard would get noticeably frustrated, seething at the idea that someone was doing better than he was. Usually, this would result in him lying to the other person, claiming that he too got a huge salary bump, one that was always slightly larger than the other person's. But his ego also led him to getting violent. His ex-wife would describe how Richard, upon not getting his way, would fly off the handle. His behavior was akin to a three-year-old throwing a tantrum in a supermarket after being told they couldn't get what they wanted. The hysterics, the aggression, and the willingness to cause damage to those around him all matched a child's bad behavior, but they were amplified by the fact that he was an adult man. Richard boasted about his career as a lawyer and how he was set to be one of the most successful in his area, and from public appearances, he wasn't lying. He took on multiple civil lawsuits, usually around elder abuse and medical malpractice, which made him incredibly wealthy. With the money his work brought in, he was able to buy himself a Porsche and go on multiple lavish vacations with his family, usually purchased to try and make up for a violent outburst he had around them. But public appearances weren't everything. Richard's success came at a great cost to his clients, as he would often settle their cases without informing them and take the money from the settlement for himself. He would then pretend that he was still working on their cases, claiming that civil lawsuits take a long time, and hoping that his elderly clients would perish before getting suspicious. In multiple instances, he continued to charge a client well after their case had been settled, which cost the client thousands of dollars that they didn't have. Richard kept his theft a secret from everyone in his life, choosing to state he was just that good at being a lawyer. Eventually, two of his clients caught on to his fraud, and they contacted the authorities, providing concrete evidence that he had stolen their money. At first, Richard told his wife that this had all been a giant misunderstanding, and that he had done nothing wrong. He informed her that these clients were unsatisfied with his work, and that instead of moving on with their lives after losing a case, they made it their mission to destroy him. A warrant was issued for his arrest, and he reported to the county jail, where he was immediately bailed out by his wife, believing that within a few weeks, everything would be cleared up. However, when word got out that Merritt had defrauded at least one of his clients, his other clients began to look at their records more closely, and found that they, too, had been victims of his scheme. Within a few months, more than 17 different people had been identified as having been victimized by his fraud, and he was once again arrested. After Richard informed his wife of the truth, she immediately divorced him and took full custody of their two children. She moved them out of their family home, fearing that Richard would try to lord it over their heads and force his way back into their lives, and she made a direct apology to all the victims, stating she was unaware of where the money was coming from. Without his wife's paycheck or the ability to find work for himself, Merritt was forced to move back in with his mom, Shirley. Shirley Merritt was known for being an extremely kind and generous woman taking special care to put others before herself. She worked in patient and family services at Children's Health Care of Atlanta, and former patients would remember her for always making them smile, whether that be with her humor or with her baked goods. On a number of occasions, Shirley would bring whole cakes to work, handing out slices to her patients and colleagues, knowing that the current patients weren't exactly there voluntarily. By February 2017, Marin would admit to knowingly stealing $75,000 from his clients and voluntarily surrendered his license after being disbarred. As he awaited trial, the courts ordered that he wear an ankle monitor at all times, which he happily accepted. He hoped his compliance would lead to him being offered a deal, but the investigation into his fraud continued, and eventually it was found he stole nearly $500,000 from 17 different clients. Merritt would also forge the signatures of many of his clients on checks, and then cash them for himself. Merritt's guilty plea would result in him being sentenced to serve 15 years in prison, followed by 15 more on probation, which Merritt himself seemed to take on his chin. He told his lawyer as well as the judge that he accepted his sentence, as he had made a grave error in conduct, and planned on being a model prisoner. He was told to report to prison on February 1st, 2019, and in the days leading up to it, he was allegedly in good spirits. His lawyer would state that, quote, days before he was to turn himself in and begin serving his sentence, Mr. Merritt sounded upbeat and optimistic about his chances of parole after serving just five years, unquote. However, he would never report to prison. Instead, on January 31st, Richard would violently attack his mother in their shared home after she made food for him. 
What prompted this attack is unknown, but according to the autopsy, Shirley was stabbed repeatedly with a kitchen knife in her face, neck, and torso. The frenzied stabbing also ended after the knife blade was lodged into her head, and the handle was discarded on the kitchen floor. Following the stabbing, her head was beaten further with a 35-pound dumbbell, and her body was thrown down the stairs of the home into the basement. Following the attack, Richard stole his mother's car before cutting off his ankle monitor. He then proceeded to go on the run for the next eight months, hoping to avoid jail time altogether. When Shirley Merritt's body was found, the police were able to quickly surmise what had happened. Stressed about his impending prison sentence beginning, Richard made a choice to go on the run instead of facing the consequences for his actions. He killed his mother savagely, stole her car and some of her possessions, then left to start a new life for himself. A manhunt quickly began. The crime scene investigators were able to find evidence of his involvement in the murder. His DNA was present on the dumbbell that had been used to bash in his mother's head, and his DNA had been present at the scene, but notably no fingerprints were able to be matched on the knife that had been used as the frenzied attack only left partial prints. Merritt would eventually be caught eight months later, living in Tennessee, where he went by the alias Mick Malvo. He immediately joined multiple dating sites and came up with different backstories for himself, including stating that his mother had recently passed away from leukemia. He had begun a semi-serious relationship with a woman when he would be arrested and brought in, this time for the murder of his mother. In court, Richard refused to back down, stating he was innocent of any wrongdoing and that he was the real victim in all of this. He would claim that he didn't murder his mother, but he witnessed her murder. According to his story, two armed men came into the home and attacked his mother in front of him. He claimed that these men were motivated by his crimes and wanted to get revenge on him, so instead of harming him or shooting them both, they violently killed his mother in front of him. Merritt then claimed the two gunmen, who never used their guns, if he ever uttered a word about what had happened, they would kill his ex-wife and two children. He says that is why he fled to Nashville to start a new life. So let's see how that obviously fictional story goes over. The evidence in this case is beyond damning. No one else's DNA was found in the home. Merritt immediately went on the run and didn't call emergency services for his mother, and he had an incredible stressor to serve as a motive. But he insists that he wasn't responsible. This is an impossible task, but in order to make his version of events seem plausible, he will have to appear completely incapable and incompetent while on the stand. The jury has to believe that he isn't capable of causing harm to his elderly mother, and that his going on the run was a choice made out of fear or a mental break. So let's see how he does. Thank you, Your Honor. The best call is Mr. Richard Merrick to the stand. Certainly, Grant. You swear, brother. I do. All right, and he's already failed. So much of taking the stand in your own defense is based on presentation. You need to seem as defenseless and incapable of the crimes you were accused of as possible. And in this case, because Richard made multiple obvious attempts to get away, he should be attempting to seem timid, afraid, stressed, and a bit mentally incompetent. We want to be able to look at him and see someone who wouldn't think through their actions and would make a stupid decision out of fear. But instead, he seems pompous and arrogant. His lips are pursed. And when swearing in, he raises his eyebrows, which makes his attitude seem smug. In every other portion of his life, his confidence was seen as an asset. But here, it actively works against him. What's your, state your name, Mr. Merritt? Uh, Richard Vinson Merritt. And Mr. Merritt, where were you born? Fort Belvoir, Virginia. And did you grow up in Virginia? Well, initially, um, so the first three years of my life there, my father was in the Air Force. He was career Air Force. He actually retired as a, a bird colonel after 24 years of service. But at the time I was born, um, we were stationed there. I believe is at the Pentagon. We stayed there for about three years. When I was three years old, we moved to Maxwell Air Force Base in Montgomery, Alabama. Stayed there for another three years. And went back to D.C. where we stayed until I was 13 when my father retired. And at that point, he took a job with McDonnell Douglas, which back then was one of the world's largest military aircraft manufacturers. We went and lived overseas in Saudi Arabia for two years. At that time, you could not attend school past the ninth grade in Saudi Arabia. So um, I came back and actually went my sophomore year at the Paideia School here in DeKalb County. 
And then my dad was transferred to St. Louis to company headquarters where I spent my junior and senior year of high school. So I moved around a lot. Firstly, the majority of the information he just gave is absolutely useless in regards to his testimony. However, his response is interesting, as it shows how Richard will take a simple question like, did you grow up in this area, and manipulate the question to brag about himself in some way. Secondly, his answer still works against him in what he is attempting to do here. The type of person who becomes so flustered at a crime scene that they go on the run for eight months to begin leading a new life out of fear is not the kind of person to sit calmly on the stand and recount their life story like this. His voice is steady. His mannerisms indicate that he believes that his life story makes him better than those listening. And when placed next to what he's accused of doing, it makes him appear callous and heartless. What's your father's name? He went by Ken, but his full name was Robert Kenneth Merritt. And when did your father pass? He passed away in November of 2000. Obviously, your mother's name was? Shirley. Richard has just spoken the name of the woman that he claims was killed in his presence. This was the woman who worked with sick families and children for years, was known to be a delight in the community, and took him in despite his crimes, and he remains emotionally unaffected. Even if he were to try and force an emotional response, or act one out horribly, that would be better than this. Again, his lack of reaction when standing trial for her murder is alarming. Do you have a brother? I do. And what's your brother's name? Robert Kenneth Merritt II. And is there an age gap between the two of them? About nine years. Who's older or who's younger? Uh, My brother would be the older one. Now, growing up, what was the the names of the family? Was it just the four of them? It was just the four of us. Um, As I just mentioned, we moved around a lot. That was primarily when my brother had already gone off to college. Um, He was in college by the time I was third or fourth grade. So, um, but the dynamic when, when he was still around or came to visit was, you know, we had a very traditional conservative Southern military household. My father was, as I said, career military. He went on to be a successful businessman. My mother sold real estate and was very good at it with her personality and natural intelligence. She was a, a star at it. And, um, you know, my brother and I, you know, we, we got along. Um, my father definitely ruled the roost. He was he was the boss, but uh, my mother certainly um, had her say, too. It was definitely a partnership. Now, when did you guys move to 1590 Planners Road? My parents bought that house in the summer of 1993. That would have been the end of my freshman year at the University of Georgia. Now, is that where you went from your grad? Yes, I went to UGA. And did you graduate from UGA? I did. What did you you major? I was a double major in English and political science, basically pre-law. And did you go to law school? I did. And where did you go to law school? I went to law school at Mississippi College School of Law in Jackson, Mississippi. Now, while you were in undergrad, did you meet a certain lady? I met a certain lady. Her name was uh, Janine Minicosi. I met Janine when she was a freshman and I was a junior. I'm about a year and a half, maybe a little bit more than a year and a half older than her. But we met through a, excuse me, we met through a mutual friend. And how long did you date before you got married? Well, early on, we we dated off and on as as kids do at Georgia, just enjoying the, the scene there in Athens. But as I proceeded into my senior year, it was, I guess, spring quarter of my senior year, getting ready to graduate, uh, we became more serious and decided we wanted to stay in a committed relationship. Now, by the time, what year did you get married? We got married in 1999, about a week after I graduated law school. And during that time, was she a veterinarian yet? No, she, I believe she started her first year of vet school, either my second or third year of law school because she was still had a couple years to go when I graduated law school. Now, by this time, when you got married, was your, was your father still around? Yes, he was. What year did he pass? 2000, about a year after we got married. So during this time, did your mom help you out? Yeah, they both did. Um, at the time, I, you know, I, I took me 
three attempts past the bar. I passed it the third time. I failed the first two times. I did thankfully have a job as a project manager with a local internet company, so I didn't have the pressure of needing the license, although it certainly would have been nice to, to get that under my belt right away. But yeah, there were times when, when my parents helped us here and there while she was still in school, sure. After your father passed, what was the relationship between you and your mother? Well, after my dad died, it was, as you can imagine, just my brother and I and our immediate family. We are close to a lot of extended family, had a lot of close friends. But in terms of our family, it was obviously just my brother, mom, and I, and uh, we were close. So far, there's been no emotion of any kind in his testimony, which does not align with his story. Imagine the person who helped you throughout the years who took you in, even when your wife left you. Imagine that person was killed violently in front of you. Now try to recount even one memory where they are present. The amount of grief you would likely feel just talking about them would be immense. But not for Richard. He's direct and forthright with all of his information, only pausing to emphasize how even though it took him three chances to pass the bar, he didn't necessarily need to pass immediately because he already had a job. I'll be skipping the next three minutes of the testimony as Richard talks about his children, but it should be noted that when talking about his son and daughter, he relays how good of a father he is through his own accomplishments instead of theirs. He also actively states that his son was the kind of kid any parent would want and that he went to all of his activities, while he didn't do so with his daughter, who has cerebral palsy. And you mentioned your practice. What type of law did you practice? Well, in 2010, um, I opened up my own law firm, and before that I had been at a large law firm in Buckhead, but I've always been a litigator, primarily civil litigation, mainly personal injury, uh, wrongful death, medical malpractice, some business litigation. When I opened up my own firm, I also did a little bit of criminal defense. I really didn't do felony work. I did a lot of DUIs, things of that nature. It should be noted that according to financial records, it was technically Shirley who opened Richard's law firm, as she paid for the lion's share of it. Now, during this time, around 2010, and as the practice grew, what type of lifestyle were you and Janine? Yeah. When the firm opened in 2010? Well, we were a very sociable couple. We lived in a very uh, diverse neighborhood in Smyrna with a walking distance to downtown Smyrna where a lot of the restaurants and, and whatnot were at. The neighborhood was primarily people like us, two professionals, small kids. So there were a lot of children the same age as our children's ages. We got together for barbecues. We went to events together. We had each other over at each other's houses. There were a lot of sleepovers for the kids. Kids played baseball together uh, in the local Smyrna Little League. So there was always something going on, whether it was a neighborhood event or going to some sort of lawyer event or an event, an event associated with her veterinary practice. We were, we were out and about. Now, by this time, when the father's passing, did anyone else live in... 1590 Planter Grove besides your mother? No. And up until her death, did anyone else live there besides you? No, no. Now, during this time, 2010, 2015, what was your relationship with your kids and your wife? Uh, in 2010? 2010 to 2015. How was the family dynamic? The only way to describe my family dynamic and my marriage was it was it was a dream. We were happy. We were fun loving. We laughed a lot. You know, Janine and I did a fair amount of traveling. Um, we were always doing things with the children. We didn't like to sit around and watch TV. We weren't that type of couple. We weren't sedentary by any means. Um, I was always trying to promote her career, and she was promoting mine. A lot of times we'd find out that we had clients in common and didn't even know it. And um, it was just a very idyllic way to live, to be married and to, and to raise kids, to be in a place that you enjoyed, around people you enjoyed, and to, to be building something, to be building a future. Now, during this time, around 2010, and as the practice grew, what type of lifestyle were you and Janine? When the firm opened in 2010? 
Well, we were a very sociable couple. We lived in a very uh, diverse neighborhood in Smyrna with a walking distance to downtown Smyrna where a lot of the restaurants and, and whatnot were at. The neighborhood was primarily people like us, two professionals, small kids. So there were a lot of children the same age as our children's ages. We got together for barbecues. We went to events together. We had each other over at each other's houses. There were a lot of sleepovers for the kids. Kids played baseball together uh, in the local Smyrna Little League. So there was always something going on, whether it was a neighborhood event or going to some sort of a lawyer event or an event, an event associated with her veterinary practice. We were, we were out and about. Now, by this time, when the father's passing, did anyone else live at 1590 Planter Grove besides your mother? No. And up until her death, did anyone else live there besides you? No. No. Now, during this time, 2010, 2015. What was, what was your relationship with your kids and your wife? Uh, in 2010? 2010 to 2015. How was the family dynamic? The only way to describe my family dynamic and my marriage was it was it was a dream. We were happy. We were fun loving. We laughed a lot. You know, Janine and I did a fair amount of traveling. Um, we were always doing things with the children. We didn't like to sit around and watch TV. We weren't that type of couple. We weren't sedentary by any means. Um, I was always trying to promote her career, and she was promoting mine. A lot of times we'd find out that we had clients in common and didn't even know it. And um, it was just a very idyllic way to live, to be married and to, and to raise kids, to be in a place that you enjoyed, around people you enjoyed, and... To, to be building something, to be building a future. His ex-wife would disagree with this statement, claiming that Richard was incredibly volatile, especially when he drank. On multiple occasions, she would barricade herself and the children in rooms away from Richard, believing that he would try to hurt them, but felt uncomfortable talking to law enforcement about it because he worked in law. Now, in 2018, what happened? In 2018, I was arrested in Cobb County for multiple counts of theft, forgery, and uh, there were some counts also of elder exportation because I did steal money from some elderly folks. Now, your arrest, was that a big deal in Cobb County? Yes, it was a big deal in Cobb County. Um, just a little bit of background. I was one of the few lawyers in Smyrna, and Smyrna has grown a lot since I started my practice in 2010, but it was right on the little village square across from the courthouse, uh, I was the only firm there that was part of why I picked that area, because I saw a need. I wanted to be the local lawyer that people went to first for help. And it was a very successful vision. And um, so the practice grew. And when things went south quickly and I got arrested several years later in 2018, uh, it was a shock to our neighbors, the local community, and to, to the Cobb County Bar. Even when talking about his financial crimes, he cannot make himself seem repentant or remorseful. He was asked plainly if his arrest was shocking to the community, which is a simple yes. All he had to do was say, yes, I had a great reputation, and in an act of selfishness that I truly regret, I squandered that reputation and stole my client's money. But instead of doing anything close to that, he gives himself some kudos for picking the location of his practice that he stole people's money from, talks about how successful it was, and talks about how pristine his reputation was in the area because he was just that good. Now we got arrested. How many times did you get arrested? Actually, the first time I got arrested in connection with the Cobb County fraud was in April of 2017. It was shortly after spring break that year. We had just gotten back, and I had a letter from the Cobb County Magistrate Court telling me that I needed to appear at a warrant application hearing. And what that basically means is somebody has taken out a warrant for your arrest, and a judge has to determine if there's probable cause or not. So this hearing was on a Monday morning, and I went to the hearing, it happened to be 
two of the older ladies who were victims in the main arrest uh, in January of 2018. They had taken out a warrant for one th- account of theft by conversion, alleging I'd stolen $70,000 of their settlement money. We had the hearing, and the judge found that there was probable cause. And the judge said, well, I'm going to set your bond at $2,000. And I will give you until tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. to appear at the Cobb County Jail. I left court. When I saw Janine that night, I told her as soon as I saw her after the kids were in bed, I said, I need to tell you something. She said, what? I said, I have a warrant for my arrest. And I explained to her what it was. I said, I don't know the extent of it. I know they're claiming I stole $70,000. need to figure out more about it. But in the meantime... I need to appear at the Cobb County Jail tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. And so the next morning, she went with me early to James Bond Bonding Company, one of the bonding companies up there off of County Services Road. And we filled out the bond paperwork. She was the surety on the bond and paid the 200 some odd dollars down, which is the 10% of the 2,000. And I turned myself into the Cobb County Jail shortly before 9 o'clock and was out by 2 o'clock that afternoon. He doesn't realize it, but his statement here fully corroborated his ex's story that he had denied, that being that he lied to her about his charges when the investigation started. As stated previously, he told his ex-wife that the charges were false and that they were being brought by two vindictive ex-clients. And here, he outright states that he told his wife about what the women were claiming, not that he had actually stolen their money and the money of 15 more of his clients. So the first time... She bonded you up. Correct. Um, Janine knew that I had been accused of a felony theft. She knew that I had booked in and out of the Cobb County Jail. And that was the last we ever discussed it until I was arrested along with everybody else, all the other victims, I should say, in uh, January of 2018. So the second time, did she provide any assistance to get you out of jail? No, she did not. Uh, To say she was less than pleased would be a a vast understatement. Um, I was driving to deliver papers to somebody the morning of January 31st, 2018. Uh, Several months earlier, I had voluntarily surrendered my bar license. Um, The bar had been investigating this. I knew what was coming. And it was just odd to me that I had never received an invitation from a detective to talk about it or anything like that. They just built their case and then wham, there it was. So that's how they chose to proceed. But I was arrested on um, January 31st. I was, as I said, going to deliver some papers. A Cobb County Sheriff's Deputy SUV pulled up behind me, blue light of me. I pulled over in a Taco Bell parking lot and several unmarked uh, Crown Vicks appeared as well. I didn't learn until several hours later the scope and and extent of what I was being charged with. I reached out to her from the jail. I knew based on my experience as a lawyer that I would not be bonding out in the next few weeks, and sure enough, did not have a formal bond hearing before a Superior Court judge until about two weeks later. But Janine was very upset, didn't understand what was going on, which is certainly understandable. I frankly didn't know the extent of what was going on, although I had a pretty good idea. And that's that was her reaction at the beginning of that whole process. The fact that Richard is saying this on direct examination, not cross, is astounding, because once more, that makes him look horrible. It's clear, based on Richard's reaction to this question, that he is still incredibly mad at his ex-wife, despite the fact that her wanting to divorce him after finding out he stole hundreds of thousands of dollars from his elderly clients is more than rational. He states that she didn't have all the information and was simply confused and angry when she filed for divorce five days after he was arrested for the second time. He shakes his head, furrows his brow, and seems incredibly flippant about the whole ordeal, as if it's common sense that she would have stood by him. He is also upset that he hadn't been talked to by the people investigating him. He mentions that the cops simply put the case together and never contacted him for an interview, and implies that by not doing that, they did poor work. The police didn't need to talk to you about your financial crimes, Richard. They didn't need to go over your statements, because they had your court records and your financial records. Mind you, had the police actually spoken to Richard prior to his arrest, it's not as if he would have been honest with them. So that 
case, how many victims were there? There were 15 victims and 34 felony counts. And you mentioned all of you sit in jail waiting for the court. It's about two weeks, maybe a little less. And did you end up having a higher lawyer on that case? I did. And who's your lawyer? David Willingham. And were you able to pay him or, or did somebody else pay at that time, uh, funds were extremely tight and limited. Um, I was in the Cobb County Jail. Janine was scrambling to try to make sense of what was going on and take care of the children. So my mother graciously offered to assist with his initial fee payment. And where was your mother's general demeanor and feelings at this time? My mother was upset. She was disappointed. She raised me better than that. And um, she had every right to be upset with me. It was a disgrace. And uh, there's no excuse for my behavior. But she was upset. But at the same time, um, I was her son. She truly did believe that one should hear out all sides of, of a situation before making an opinion. And she gave me the benefit of the doubt. And her goal was to help me get out and then I would get a very stern talking to once out. But her goal at the time was just to support me and try to help me get up the bond money. How much was your bond? The bond was $400,000. The down payment for the bond in order to actually get me out was 10%, so that would have been $40,000. How was that? Day? My mother, it took about two months, but what she ended up doing was taking out a home equity line of credit, basically a second mortgage on her home, in order to come up with the 40000 So ultimately, how much time left between your getting a bond and getting out of jail? I believe it was about 65 or 66 days. And what were the conditions on the bond? Well, the bond conditions were as follows. I was to have a curfew of 5 p.m. to 8 a.m., which meant, obviously, I had to be back at her address. I had to live at her address, first of all. That was the first bond condition. Second condition was I had a curfew of, as I mentioned, 5 p.m. to 9 a.m. So I had to be back by 5 p.m. and I couldn't leave to leave the next morning until, I'm sorry, it's 8 a.m., 5 p.m. to 8 a.m. Obviously, I had to reside at her home in 1590 Planters Row in Stone Mountain, DeKalb County. I wasn't to drink any alcohol, do any drugs without a prescription, not to break any laws of the state of Georgia, pretty standard stuff. They also had me surrender my passport within the first 24 hours of release, which I did, and I was required to wear an ankle monitor. Now, once you were released, what was the relationship between you and your wife? It was very contentious. Um, she felt that I had led a double life. She didn't understand why I took money from these people. Um, she was upset. She was shocked. We went from having an idyllic life to having nothing. Um, oh, despite my urges to try, it was decided that she didn't want to stay in the home, so we let the house go. It was a very nice house that we loved and had lived in and raised our children in and planned to stay in a long time. So the house was gone. Um, she decided to move into a rental home in East Cobb and Marietta, where the public schools are, are are quite good, and my son had attended the Lovett School, which is a private school, but he wasn't going to be able to go there anymore. My daughter went to public school because of her disability, so thankfully she could attend school wherever she wanted, um, based on having a disability. But it was a, it was a major upheaval. I mean, it, overnight it was as if a bomb went off in our lives. And at some point in time, did she file for divorce? Uh, very quickly. She filed for divorce four days into my arrest. And did that divorce ultimately complete? Yes, the divorce was finalized, I believe, third week of June 2018. And I, I didn't fight her on the divorce. I understood her emotions. I understood the reasons uh, for it. Um, I certainly didn't want her 
to be accused of having any part of my misdeeds because I, I truly did act alone. Uh, she wasn't involved. I think early on some folks may not have believed that, but it turned out that the divorce not only was what she wanted emotionally, but uh, perhaps helped out in segregating you know, my behavior from you know, obviously her not having an involvement. I didn't mention this earlier, but one of the reasons that Janine felt as if Richard had lived a double life and couldn't be trusted around the children was the fact that shortly before his second arrest, he had pawned the family's specialized van, used specifically for their daughter's disabilities. So, I mean, I don't know, Richard, maybe that's why she felt she needed to get away from you so quickly. Now, after your release, what was your relationship with your kids? My son was 14, 14 and a half at the time, and as I said, we were very close, and he had me up on a a pedestal like a lot of boys do their father, and he was upset with me. He yelled at me, he ignored me, he cried, he he was hurting. There's no relevance to his kids' feelings. You've heard from Dr. Minicosi, and she went into detail about the things that the son felt, things that the son did, and things the son told her during this time period. But that doesn't make it relevant. So how is this relevant? Judge, I'm the mom. All right. But your mother, by this time you're living with your mother. Yes. And you're out of jail. Correct. What was your relationship with her? She was, she wasn't pleased with my behavior. Um, she was embarrassed, but at the same time, she was willing to give me a chance, give me a place to live, help me, help me survive. I mean, I, I really didn't have much other than my personal effects and an old pickup truck, literally. So she opened up her home to me, and it was strange being back under her roof at, I guess I was 43, 44 years old when all this went down. Um, but, you know, it, 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 after the first several days and weeks, you know, we got into a routine and it, it was fairly normal under the circumstances. Again, this is a great moment to show emotion. He's been given the chance to go into detail about how his mom helped him in a moment of need, how she stuck her neck out on the line for him by taking out a line of credit to bail him out and letting him stay under her roof. He should feel remorseful or at the very least embarrassed that she had to do this because of his crimes. But he is direct and matter of fact, as if what she did wasn't a big deal. Your mother, are you fighting? My mother's a very strong-willed person. I believe the term firecracker was used, and that is a very good term. I would throw another one out there. She's a steel magnolia. My mother is a strong Southern woman, and she had no problem telling me what I thought, uh, what she thought rather down to what I wore, to my opinions on certain things. But it was certainly not toxic. We were both opinionated people. We spoke our minds. Um, But we also laughed a lot and spent a lot of time together. So I, it, there's nothing abnormal to me or her about it. Now, as your criminal case made its way through the process, um, did you start to feel some external pressures? You mean as we got closer to uh, sentencing. sentencing? Yes, it was. It was a very odd time starting in. I would say right around the 1st of January 2019, my sentencing hearing had been set way back in September of 2018. Uh, I actually wanted a plea earlier and get on with it and get on down the road to prison, but the DA at the time in Cobb County wasn't ready yet. He wanted to make sure there weren't any more victims, which was fine. It's certainly his prerogative. So there weren't any more victims, and then the plea date was set for September, I'm sorry, in September, the plea date was set for January 18th of 2019, a Friday. And about, right about the 1st of January 2019, my mother's house kind of sits up on a cul-de-sac. And you can see the whole cul-de-sac. And 
I saw an abnormal amount of cars pulling slowly through, stopping in front of our home. Uh, my mother noticed the same thing. I began receiving hang-ups on my cell phone, numbers I didn't recognize. Some said unknown number, but area codes of numbers I didn't know. My mother was receiving the same thing. She showed me her phone as wanting to know if I knew who these numbers were, and, and I didn't. And this seemed to go on with some frequency uh, up until January 14th of 2019. Now, during this time, were you speaking with your wife? Yes, of course. And likewise, does she have concerns? I believe, you know, if I recall correctly, she did. Um, the, the victims in this case have been characterized, and I don't mean this disrespectfully, I'm just trying to answer truthfully and honestly. The victims have been characterized as... Objection, Your Honor. What the victims have been characterized as is not relevant. I don't know if that's hearsay or where he's coming up with this, but I don't believe that that's relevant. And they're not victims in this case. There's no, only no. one victim in this case. Correct. So how is this testimony relevant? All right. I'll sustain the objection. So while we don't know exactly what Richard was going to say, it was clear that he was trying to set up a narrative that the men and women he stole nearly half a million dollars from were stalking him and his family. He was trying to insinuate that the elderly clients he had taken on were going out of their way to harass him, as well as his mother and his ex-wife, although his ex-wife denies this happening. This is clearly done to give an alternative version of events, where it would make sense that his mom would be attacked and killed. Of course, that does not make any sense, because let's say that his victims are stalking him and his family, let's say they weren't satisfied that he had been sentenced to 15 years in prison and felt like he was getting off easy, why wouldn't they attack him? According to his own story, they had guns. They could have shot him in the legs, stabbed him and beaten him with the weight, but they didn't. Instead, according to him, they brutalized his mother, then allowed him to go and start a new life without so much as laying a hand on him, which doesn't make any sense. Had his victims been willing to kill anyone in their case, they would have obviously killed him, but they didn't do that, mostly because they were elderly men and women who wouldn't be able to. Now, we're here with you. Oh, was your yes. And did you ever feel that maybe somebody was out to get you? Absolutely. No doubt about it. Now let's talk about at some point in time, as we can see, that's in one, a cartoon rock. Yes. And where, what day is that? That was January 14th, 2019. And who received that cartoon? That cartoon was received at my mother's home at Planters Row in DeKalb County. It was personally delivered in her mailbox and discovered by her. Did you have discussions with her about it? Right away. I was, I believe, on my way to work. I was working at a warehouse at the time, and I received a call from her informing me of receipt of this cartoon and she was upset and literally as I hung up with her I received a call from my ex-wife Janine who you've heard from and she was upset and what was concerning to me because it was directed at me as well not only in the substance of the cartoon but obviously had to deal with something I was involved in in Cobb County. What concerned me was that these are copies of the same cartoon being delivered 40 miles apart, two different counties, with a county or two in between these counties. And it was a concerted effort, whoever delivered them. Again, this is going towards the narrative that Richard's family is being unduly harassed due to his crimes. In this story, apparently a cartoon and a rock, or a cartoon rock, I'm not sure, was left in his mother's and ex-wife's mailbox. I wasn't able to find the contents of the cartoon, but we can assume it was threatening, and scared both women enough that they called Richard. 
Richard suspects that this was a concerted effort, as his ex-wife and his mother live 40 miles away from each other. But that being said, it's completely possible for this to have been done by one person, and have that person doing it for reasons besides what Richard is alleging. Some records indicate that the police believed that Richard himself had left the cartoon in the mailboxes as a way to argue to the court that he and his family were being unfairly penalized. Obviously, it's suspicious that the day before Richard is sentenced, both his mother and his ex found harassing images in their mailbox. But if that led to Richard having two people in his family speak to the court on his behalf, the judge would likely be more than open to considering probation. But even if the person who did this wasn't Richard, a person putting a cartoon in a mailbox is not the same as a person killing someone. Is it a kind thing to do? No. But the way Richard is trying to shape this action as being a precursor for what happened to his mother is ridiculous. Now, within a day or so, what happened to your mother? Well, actually, it started the night that she received the cartoon. Um, I got back, and she was upset. Um, she started feeling dizzy, having difficulty breathing, having chest pain. Uh, and it's, she, she just was very concerned about the cartoon, about the effect on Janine and the kids. And I should add that Janine felt as if, um, well, she didn't feel, she was quite adamant that she was keeping my son Jack home from school the next day and she wasn't going to go to work. And she had called somebody at the Cobb County DA's office or sheriff's office, and I'm not sure which to inform them of it, and my mother was concerned that they weren't going to do anything, and in fact, they didn't. Um, so there, there was definitely concern on, on both sides. My mother had these symptoms. She decided that she needed to go to the ER. Well, I had the ankle monitor on, and the curfew had been moved back to midnight because I had started a job at Petco Warehouse up in Gwinnett County, and in order to, to make my hours, I had to be able to get the curfew moved back, which my pretrial officer, basically my probation officer, was happy to do because they want you to have a job. So long story short, I wasn't still going to be able to drive her because my mother really didn't make the decision to, to go to the hospital until probably 10, 30, 11 that night. There's no way I could take her there, drop her off, and get back and not be in violation of my monitor. So she was able to drive herself. They admitted her, and I think she was admitted at early morning hours of the 15th, and she was discharged sometimes on the 16th. Now, after she was discharged, did your mom still have concerns? It was all we talked about. Um, she got back home that Wednesday when I first encountered her. I remember distinctly sitting at the kitchen table. We were we were a kitchen table family, so discussions were had at the kitchen table or around the, the kitchen counter, around the island where the sink was. So we talked about it. And back a few days earlier on Monday, I had taken a picture of the cartoon on my phone and sent it to my lawyer, David Willingham, so he was aware. And I'm, if I'm not mistaken, he received a copy as well as something else. And and Mr. Queen, this has turned into a lot of narrative. So you need to either ask some specific questions or instruct your client to confine his answers to the questions that are asked. So I'll sustain the objection. Yes, so what did your mother do in response to the cartoon as it relates to the attorney's one? She began to draft a letter to Mr. Willingham. And to your knowledge, was that letter delivered? To my knowledge, it was. On what day was this? What day? What, was January 15, 16, 17? What day were we? I remember her showing me a draft of the letter quite soon after she got home because my mother was the type of person to handle stuff while I was fresh on her mind. So she showed me a draft of it. I said, do whatever you want, send it. And I, I 
I have no reason to think that's not what happened, and, and, and it did in fact happen. Now, what day was your sentencing here? Friday the 18th. And how did that go? It was a quite an event. Um, court that day was to start at 9 a.m., and it lasted all day. Did you have a plea on that day? I did. Did the victim get an opportunity to express their opinions regarding the sentence on that day? They certainly did. And the way it worked that day is I showed up and entered my plea, but there had not been an agreement on the precise sentencing. I rejected the state's initial offer. The judge assured us that he would not go more serious than that offer. So the hope was maybe I would end up getting a little less time than what the state initially recommended. The judge heard testimony from the victims all day. I believe I was the final person to testify. And then the judge pronounced his sentence 435 in the afternoon. Based on his phrasing and tone, it's clear to see that Richard is annoyed at the fact that his own victims were allowed to give victim impact statements at his sentencing. He also seems to believe that having to speak last at his trial is somehow unjust, despite stealing hundreds of thousands of dollars. You said you testified. Was it a trial? No, it was not a trial. I, I pled guilty in the first few minutes of the proceeding. The rest of the day was simply about the judge hearing from victims, hearing from me, and making a decision on what he wanted the sentence to be. There's no question about my guilt at any point. And what was the sentence? The sentence was 30 to 15. Plus, I had to pay back $526,000 in restitution. Now, in, did you go to jail that day? No, I did not. When were you report to the jail? The judge was gracious enough to give me two weeks to report, which would be February 1st by 5 p.m. at the Cobb County Jail. And he made it abundantly clear what would happen if I did not show up. What would happen if you didn't show up? If I did not show up, he would revoke my sentence and it would be a serve 30 sentence, which could affect, it could affect parole and all sorts of other things. So the sentence would be much harsher if I did not appear as scheduled and ordered. After sentencing, what did you do during this period of time between sentencing and the day before the show up? Well, um, that day, um, just starting off with what, how it was handled, I mean, I, I wasn't surprised. I wasn't upset. I accepted my punishment, and my mother and I got in the car and we left. Now, turn your attention to. Uh, Mr. Jeffco, what's your relationship with Mr. Jeffco? Mike is technically um, some degree of a cousin, but we come from a large family where, you know, we don't really get in all that, and I knew Mike my whole life, and we were close. And was there understanding for Mike to take you, originally take you to jail? Yes, um, I believe Tuesday or Wednesday of that week, my mother and I decided that it would probably be best at at that time when we had the discussion, that Mike um, come and take my mother to, I mean, I'm sorry, take me to the Cobb County Jail. Now, is it that your mother didn't know how to get there? No, my mother had been to the Cobb County Jail plenty to visit me and to go arrange the bond. So, what caused things to change with that plan? Was Jeff going to right. Uh, Thursday night, after I got back from seeing the children uh, my mother and I were talking and we just felt like it was a private family matter an intimate family matter even though Mike was family it was something that she and I wanted to share and handle that was really all there was to it we didn't want to inconvenience him so did you ask your mother to call Mike off we both decided that it wasn't necessary for him to be there why is that because we didn't want to inconvenience Mike, because um, we actually had a few things we wanted to talk about, and we, we just frankly didn't need anybody else's help. So here, Richard's lawyer is trying to give an alternate reason for events. Originally, Richard was going to be driven to the prison by his cousin, and this had been set up weeks in advance. 
This was allegedly done because Shirley didn't want to witness her son walking into prison and felt that that would be too hard on her. However, directly before the murder and completely coincidentally, Richard and Shirley would reverse their decision and tell Mike that he no longer had to come over to pick Richard up. Now, this could have been completely innocent. Maybe Shirley wanted to see her son off, and she did feel like it was her responsibility. But it's also incredibly convenient, as Richard had been the one to kill his own mother. It would mean that no one would discover her body for days, and he would get a head start on the police. So the morning of the first, what time did you get back to the house? Oh... Around 8.30, I think, somewhere in there, 8.30, 8.45. And tell us what happened that day. So when I left the doctor's appointment and was driving back, I, it was the last time that I saw Mia uh, before I knew I had to turn myself in later in the day. Mia was my baby girl. She's my princess. So naturally, I was sad. Um, it was a sad ride home, just like the night before after saying goodbye to Jack. When I walked into the way that she got back into my mother's house is that I would park my car in the driveway. Her car was in the garage. If the garage door wasn't open, I'd open it and walk through the garage door into the kitchen. So I walked into the kitchen. I'm sorry? I was opening the garage door. The garage door opener. Did you have a separate garage door or was it on the panel, on the door? No, no, it was in, it was in my car. Yeah. So was you open the garage door? I, I went inside and it had been obvious that I, I was upset. I had tears in my eyes and she just came over and hugged me. She knew why I was sad about saying goodbye to my children. Richard discussing how upset he was is almost comical, as he is talking about his last interaction with his children, and he has no emotion. And he's been talking about his mother being brutally murdered in front of him, and again, he has no emotion. He's shown absolutely no emotion besides annoyance this entire time. Well, shortly thereafter, um, we both, she sent Mike the text saying that things aren't so good here, and that's exactly what it was about. We were, it was just... Just not a happy day. I mean, I was about to go away to prison for possibly 15 years. So it was a private time. I, there was no yelling or screaming. I just, and, and I sent him a similar text, and that was that. So after those texts were sent, I started to go through some of my stuff and sort through some of my personal effects and my mother and I, oddly enough, I had been so busy spending time with the kids and, and doing other things. She and I hadn't had a discussion about how to organize my clothes or, or what maybe to sell or, or any of that kind of basic housekeeping type of stuff. It, and those were things we needed to talk about. That's what we mentioned in the text when we said we need to discuss things. That's it. Now, was there a plan for you all to have lunch together? Yes, my mother um, was a great cook, fantastic cook, and she was going to make spaghetti. So did she start preparations for lunch? Yes, she did. And then what happened? It was, you know, the plan was we were going to eat around 1 o'clock so that we could be on the road by 2, no later than 2.30. It was, I believe, Super Bowl weekend, Friday afternoon traffic, a bunch of stuff going on in Atlanta. And, you know, obviously we don't want to be late to the jail, given the importance of me being on time. I was walking from the kitchen. I had just left the kitchen from keeping her company while she was making the spaghetti when I heard a very loud knock at the front door. We weren't expecting any visitors. So I went to the front door, and I opened it. And there were two individuals there, two men, and they both were pointing pistols at me. And they told me to let them in. So what would you do? I let them in. This would be traumatic. Recounting an event as terrifying as the one he has just begun to recount would be daunting. But again, he still has no emotion. His tone is almost comical, as if this is funny to him. When you testify in a jury trial, you want to get them on your side. You want them to see you in this hyper-specific way and make your version of events so real that they can't help but agree with you. But everything that Richard has done is completely contrary to what he is saying. He doesn't seem to care about anything that he's talking about. 
even though his life hangs in the balance, as if he believes that he can win them over just by being there and explaining this nonsensical story to them. I had never seen these guys before, and they were pointing pistols at me, so I let them in. I let them in. They shut the door. Uh, about this time, my mother came to the foyer where I was standing with these two individuals, and they said, head to the basement and don't say an effing word. So did you go to the basement? The taller of the individuals, he was older, probably in his 50s, about six feet, athletically built, walked past me, put the gun at my mother's lower back, and she started to head towards the stairway to the basement. The fact they said head to the basement led me to think they knew we had a basement and had cased the house before. The younger of the men, he's probably about 5'8", five, 5'9", five, shoulder-length brown hair, pudgy, he put his gun on my back and we followed them. She opened the stair door to the basement, flicked on the light. It was a two two-step process to get down those stairs. You had four or five steps that went down, there's a landing, and then you make the turn, and there's the longer flight of stairs. They proceeded first. My mother was crying. She was making sounds like she might be wanting to scream or shout. And as they made the turn on the landing and took those first few steps, by this point, I and the guy behind me who had the gun on my back made it to the landing he told her to shut the f up and push her down the stairs and look at his face after saying that this is not the face of someone who is recounting a traumatic event this is not the face of someone who is telling the truth this is the face of someone who believes that they are getting one over on everybody because they're just so clever and then what happened to your mother? it was the worst sound i've ever heard in my life um she plunged headlong into the wall. It's a sound I can hear to this day as I'm sitting here. And I could tell that there was a dent or a hole in the wall. She was trying to get up and move around, but from my vantage point, she appeared like she couldn't get her balance. Was your mother injured at that time? And she certainly appeared to be. And as I moved like I was going to try to go down the stairs. The guy dug the pistol into my back and grabbed my shoulder. The gentleman who pushed her down the stairs put his pistol behind his back into the the back part of his jeans. He ran down the stairs, turned the corner, and came back with the 35-pound weight that has been seen during the course of this trial. Where did the knife come from? Well, (laughs) the knife came later. Um, He just laughed. He laughed while recounting how his mother was viciously killed, but he seems entirely unaware that he's doing a bad job. Richard is very, very confident in all of his bullshit. This monster took this dumbbell and proceeded to bludgeon my mother right in front of me. And she was, she stopped moving at this point. He then told the man who had his pistol in my back to bring me down to the bottom of the stairs. They shoved me over to the tile where the dumbbell rested. And then the older guy took off up the stairs. He came back a few minutes later with the kitchen knife and proceeded to stab my mother repeatedly in front of me. I I cannot believe what I was seeing. I didn't understand what would be the purpose because she wasn't moving. Why is any of this happening? It was a complete and utter nightmare. So what did you do when this happened? There's nothing I could do. I had a a pistol to my back. I couldn't believe this was happening. I had no clue who these people were or why they were doing this to us. So he stabbed her with such force that the handle broke off the knife. I didn't realize at the time that the knife was still stuck in my poor mother's face. He put the handle down on the tile across from the dumbbell. He then turned and looked at me, and he pulled out his cell phone. 
And he proceeded to show me a picture of my ex-wife dropping Mia off at her school, a picture of Jack being dropped off or picked up at Lovett, a picture of them all getting out of her van at their rental home in Marietta, and a picture of her either coming or going from her clinic in Bindings. And he said, and I'll never forget this as long as I live, if you say a single word, they're next. I had no doubt who they were or what next meant. And then they left. Let's go over this stupid story. So in the weeks leading up to his sentencing for stealing hundreds of thousands of dollars, Richard and his family start receiving anonymous harassment from his victims. The harassment gets so bad that direct threats in the form of a cartoon are left at his mother's and ex-wife's mailboxes. However, the very next day, he's sentenced to 15 years in prison and to pay restitution to his victims. Then, two weeks later, the very day he is supposed to report to prison and begin serving his sentence, the two men who are not his victims come to his house, brutally murder his mother in front of him, seemingly because of his crimes, and then tell him if he doesn't keep his mouth shut, they will kill his entire family. Which is ridiculous. If someone wanted to enact revenge on Richard, why would they go through the effort of not killing him? He had seen their faces, they had their guns drawn on him, and they had come there with the express purpose of killing him. But when push came to shove, they decided to kill his mother, threaten him a little bit, then leave him there completely unharmed. That doesn't make any sense. But we've seen defenses like this before, most notably in the case of Diane Downs. And then, how much longer did you stay there? I stood there numb and incapable of moving for what seemed like minutes. These guys had left. I went upstairs. All I could think about was Janine and the kids and what these monsters could do. And I went and got a small backpack out of my room. I put a few few clothes. I didn't pack much. Some basic toiletries. And I left. He was smiling during the first half of that statement. I don't want to definitively state that that was a duping delight smile, but he is extremely pleased with himself. The majority of the testimony has been laying the groundwork for his defense, and he seems to believe now he is bringing everything home and really convincing everyone of his stupid-ass story. Now, why did you take your mother's car? I took my mother's car because it had more gas in it than my car. It had a bigger tank, and I had no idea where I was going or where I was going to end up. And it seemed to me in that state of mind that at least her car would be easier to sleep in. And that's why I took her car. This statement alone is damning. He didn't state that he was in a mental crisis. He didn't claim to be going through a psychological break as a result of seeing his mother being brutally killed. Instead, he says he chose to take her car because it had more gas in the tank, as well as better gas mileage and it was easier to sleep in. His thinking was incredibly logical, and the fact that it was after witnessing his mother's death would make him look even worse in the eyes of the jury. So where'd you go? When I left her house, um, I went out of the neighborhood. I don't even know what time of day it was when I left, but I went out of the neighborhood. I made a right and went up, I believe it was called Rock Bridge, but it becomes Five Forks Strip and we're right at the DeKalb County, Gwinnett County line. And I made a left, I'm not sure if it was Arcata or Killian Hill, but up by the Kroger there and just started heading towards 85. Now, how much time did it take you to get to Nashville? That where you go? Did you go straight to Nashville? No, no, I didn't go all the way to Nashville in one one shot. Um, no, I I ended up going to the QT station at Indian Trail in '85. I stopped to get a couple of bottles of water, some snacks. Um, I only had eighteen dollars cash on me. Um, I t- 
topped off the tank, I believe, put some gas in it. And then I proceeded towards, towards Cobb County, towards 285 and then ultimately to 75. Why cut your monitor off? Well, the reason I cut my monitor off is I was concerned by the time I got north of Cobb County, you know, I was within, I believe, an hour or so of when I was supposed to report. I had no idea if just by routine the monitoring people were watching me or not. So that's why I headed towards Cobb County. I didn't want to do anything that would get me involved with the police because I didn't want it to come back to hurt my family if these guys found out and thought I had said something. Now, why did you take both phones? For that very reason. I had every reason to believe, based on this horrific event, that these individuals had a lot of hate for me, had been following me and or my ex-wife and kids, and perhaps they had our numbers, perhaps they were the ones who had been calling and hanging up. I, I didn't know. I, I wanted to have the phones in case they had demands. If they went back to the house, I had to know what was going on. And if Janine called either myself or my mother, I wanted to know what was going on with her, that she was okay, that the kids were okay. So that's why I took both phones. He's now directly claiming his mother's murder had to do with his crime, but that doesn't make sense. Again, if most people wanted to take revenge on a person, they wouldn't attack someone tangentially related to the person. They would simply attack the person they want revenge on. Moreover, most murderers would not go through the effort to kill a stranger as violently as Shirley was murdered. According to Richard's own story, they had guns. They had the means to kill her without hurting themselves or exerting that much energy. And yet, for seemingly no other reason than they wanted to get their steps in, they repeatedly walked up and down the basement stairs in order to retrieve new weapons to use on her and left Richard completely unharmed, which again makes no sense. So how long did it take you to get to Nashville? Ultimately, I probably got to Nashville. I mean, I, I think they're an hour behind, but I, I ended up in Nashville after dark. Of course, it was wintertime, so it gets dark early everywhere. But I, it was probably 7, 8 o'clock Central Time by the time I actually got there. Why did you stay in Nashville? Nashville is a big city. I had no more money to buy gas, and it seemed like a safe place to pull off and park and try to figure out what in the world was going on. And eventually, did you get a job in Nashville? Yes, I got a job at a at a bar uh, called Betty's Bar and Grill on the west side of Nashville. And you heard yesterday, well, last week from. Um, Kelly Richardson. And how did you meet Kelly? I met Kelly online. And did you start living with Kelly? Fairly quickly, yes. With two in a relationship? Yes. Did she know who you were? No, she did not. And why didn't you tell her? I did not tell her because, again, in my mind, with how horrific the events of my mother's murder were, how graphic the people were capable of such insane violence, I had to believe that they would keep their word and take it out on my ex-wife and my children if anything was said. So I adopted a new identity and I made a vow to myself that I would never reveal who I was. And there were many, many times I wanted to to Kelly but I wanted to tell her that I was accused of a murder I did not commit. But I didn't because I didn't want to endanger her and I didn't want to endanger Janine and the kids. Now, Kelly, did you and Kelly ever have any problems? Anything bothered you too? No, no, absolutely not. She was telling us that around about the date when she got arrested, that she wanted you to move out. Or stay somewhere else. What was going on? Kelly, 
at the time was a PhD student in chemistry and she had a lot of work to do and she needed her space. It wasn't relationship space. It was, Hey, just go find somewhere else to be for a day or two so I can get my project done. That's all it was. Now, during, by that time, what happened to the car? I want to say it was the Wednesday or Thursday before I got arrested. I got arrested Monday, September 30th, 2019 in Nashville by the Marshals. I want to say Thursday the 26th, I woke up. I believe Kelly was already in class or at her lab, and the car was gone. Kelly lived in an attic apartment in an old house on 18th Avenue. Um, near the university and I didn't know it but apparently there were a lot of break-ins and um, learned after the fact that the car had been broken into and during investigation of it by the Vanderbilt police the car got towed and that's what ultimately led to my capture so I woke up walked out the car was gone so did you have anywhere to stay with the car being gone not right off the bat no Tell us how you ended up getting arrested. Yeah, on that Monday, I was, um, the weather was starting to change in Nashville. It was getting cool at night. Um, I was walking in West Nashville in an area called Sylvan Park where Betty's was and a few other places that I knew. And there was the old Southern thrift shop, which I had bought good cheap clothes before. And I was just looking for a light jacket because I didn't have one. And as I was done browsing through the store. I didn't see one. I started to walk out, and next thing I knew, I was surrounded by five or six marshals, and my face was in the floor, looking up at them. And they told me I was under arrest. So, Richard, getting back to February 1st. Yes. Did you kill your mother? Absolutely not. I loved my mother. She stood by me. I'm not a violent person. Never laid a finger on anybody. Imagine you're in Richard's position. You killed your mother, but you think you can get away with a murder if you convince the people around you that it wasn't really you. It was actually these two identified people that there's no direct evidence of. You work on your story so it fits all the evidence that was found at the scene, and you meticulously plan for your day in court. Besides, you're a lawyer. You know this. You can get away with this. And then, when you get in court, you try and assert your innocence. This is the best you can do. Richard has shown zero emotion when talking about his mother. When going over the horrific details of her death, he smiled and seemed pleased with himself. I personally gave a lot of shit to Nancy Brophy and Tony Todd when they took the stand in their own defense, but at the very least, they both pretended to cry. Personally, I think it's kind of funny how his narrative presents the fact that his mother's murder had the unintended consequence that he just had to skip town and not go to prison. It's almost as if he's saying, hey guys, I really wanted to go serve 15 years in prison, but I can't, which is a total bummer. That was it in terms of his direct examination. Richard had accomplished literally nothing he had set out to do, but he seems pretty satisfied with himself. So that's really all that matters. So now let's watch the cross-examination. Mr. Merritt, what you said happened in front of your eyes on February 1st, 2019 must have been horrifying for you. It was. You said that it shook you up. Absolutely. You were afraid for your own life? I was so traumatized by what happened to my mother, I really wasn't worried about myself at that point. Okay, but you were concerned for your wife? And your daughter and your son? Yes. And you were so scared that you got out of there as fast as you could. Right? I did. Okay. Made the decision not to turn yourself into the Cobb County Jail, right? Correct. And um, instead, you cut your ankle monitor off. Yes. But before you even did that, you made some stops along the way. You stopped at a Kroger on... You, you stopped at a Kroger per, first, correct? No, I didn't actually stop there. Okay, but you stopped in the parking lot and you drove around the parking lot in the Kroger, right? Correct, I did. Okay, because you didn't need gas at that point because your mom's car was full enough to get you out of there. That's what you testified to, correct? To get me 
most of the way there, yes. Okay. And then you stopped at a QT in Norcross, and we saw the video of that. Do you recall? I do. Okay. And you were there for how long? Do you remember? I honestly don't remember. Okay. Did you feel that you were being chased at that point? At that point, no, I did not. Okay. Did you feel like your life was in danger at that point? I didn't know, honestly. Okay. Okay, so you bought waters and a candy bar. Yes. Okay, and then you drove around 285 West, and you took the 75 North exit, right? Correct. Now, tell me if I'm wrong, but your wife's uh, practice is over in Vinings, uh, kind of a, a, on West Paces Ferry and Paces Mill. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, and so you passed that exit when you got on to 75 North. Correct. And you did not stop to tell your wife that you had just watched your mother being killed and her life was in danger, correct? No, I did not. Okay, and your son's school, Love It, is just down the street from that. It's on West Paces Ferry, is that right? Yes. And you did not make any efforts to take that exit, which is the exit before the exit to your wife's veterinarian clinic, um, to pick up your son from school or alert anyone that his life was in danger. My son, I believe, was with his grandfather that day. He wasn't at school. Okay, but you never made any phone calls to your wife? Correct? No, I did not. You never called Jack's school, right? No, I did not. You never called Mia's school, right? No, I did not. And so Jack was with Sal. That's your uh, previous father-in-law. Did you ever call Sal McCosey to let him know that you had seen this horrible event and that he and your entire family were in danger? I didn't call any of them because the killers told me don't say a word to anyone. So I took them at their word based on what they did. Okay, but they weren't following you, right? I don't know if they were following me or not. Okay. All right. So they could have very well been behind you. It's entirely possible. I have no idea what vehicle they were in. Okay, and a safe place to go would have been the Cobb County Jail, which you drove right past on 75 North. Is that correct? The instructions were, and I took them at their word based on what they did to my mother, don't say a word to anyone. The last place to go would be to somewhere like the Cobb County Jail. Well, apparently Richard thinks this is still hilarious. The prosecution is pointing out all the narrative flaws in Richard's thinking. How if he believed everyone in his life was in danger, he would have stopped along the way and called someone to give them a warning. She points out all the times he could have, all the stops he made along the way, but he never did. And when responding, Richard begins to smile, as if this back and forth is funny, as if what she is saying is so comical because it's outlandish, despite the fact that everything he said for the past hour is clearly false. And why is that? Well, you have law enforcement there. If they have people in Cobb County, they know a report. I'm more likely to say something because I'm in the safety of the jail. That made no sense to me whatsoever. Okay, so you didn't make any calls to anybody to warn them that their lives were in danger. Right? These gentlemen told me, and I use gentlemen very sarcastically, these monsters told me, don't say a word to anyone. After what they did to my mother... I didn't say a word to anyone, without qualification. Okay, so these monsters, do you think that they were the same people who had been chasing your house starting at the beginning of January? Well, they sure knew we had a basement right off the roof. Okay, and how many times had people driven off around the cul-de-sac, or driven around the cul-de-sac, as you testified earlier? Suspiciously, at least 20 or 30 times by my count. 20 or 30 times? Did you ever get any of their tag numbers? It would have been possible to run out there in the dark and get their tag numbers. Did you ever call the police to say, oh my gosh, somebody is following me? Did you Actually, ever do that? Actually, my mother and I did discuss it. You discussed it, but you never called the police, and you never made a report of people casing your house or running around the, the cul-de-sac in their cars, right? No, we didn't. Did you ever talk to any of the neighbors about what was going on? Uh, I didn't. I can't say if my mother did or not. Okay. Um, so... You weren't concerned at this point about these people riding around in the cul-de-sac because you obviously didn't make any, do anything to, to prevent it from happening. Quite future. the opposite, ma'am. I told my lawyer immediately when it happened who did absolutely nothing. Okay. All right. We got Nick Cage over here with the decimating responses, but there's a huge issue with what he's saying. He stated that his mother's home was being obviously cased, so much so that his elderly mother noticed as much. However, no one else in the neighborhood noticed any unusual cars in the neighborhood. 
no one else saw any suspicious activity, and the only person, besides the decedent, that knows about this alleged harassment is Richard's former lawyer, who did not report and cannot testify. It's basically the perfect excuse. It's like in middle school, when you lie and say you have a girlfriend who goes to another school, but no one else knows her. They don't have social media, but they totally are a model and they exist. But Richard's entirely delusional about how poorly his story is coming across. He is absurdly confident, cocking his eyebrow up and trying to be snarky to the prosecution, as if what she's saying is ridiculous. All right. And you knew he did absolutely nothing. Uh, he told me he was actually going to reach out to his contacts at the DA's office, where he used to work alongside the person who prosecuted me, as well as his contacts with law enforcement and Cobb. They all did absolutely nothing. Okay. Um, but did you ever call DeKalb County Police? Because that's where your mother's house was located. No, I didn't call, and neither did my mother, to my knowledge. Okay, and you understand that DeKalb County Police would have jurisdiction over your mother's house. Of course they would, ma'am, but the root of the activity was all indications sourced out of Cobb County. All right. Um, so these two, you called them monsters, right? Yes. You've never seen these guys in your life? Never. And they were both kind of big. You said one was pudgy. What about the other one? He was athletic and thin. Okay. And could you describe what they were wearing? Yes, I can. What was that? The athletic thin one was wearing sort of a black thermal long sleeve top and what looked like dicky khaki pants. Okay. And what kind of gun was he holding? Could you see? I'm not a gun guy, but it was a semi-automatic, sort of like the police have. It was right. not a revolver. What color was it? It was black. All right. And what about the other guy? What What did he look like? You said he was pudgy, but how else did he look? I uh, was pudgy, had shoulder length brown hair, brown eyes, five eight five nine, and he was wearing a camouflage hoodie. Okay. Well, um, did he have the hoodie up? No. Okay. So you got a knock on the door after being followed or having people suspiciously drive around your neighborhood for several weeks, right? Yes. And this was the day that you were supposed to turn yourself into the jail. Yes, it was. And you looked out the window, right? I did. And you saw that there was a guy all in black, right? I didn't say it was all in black. A black shirt and dicky pants. He was wearing a black top. That was it. And a guy wearing a camouflage hoodie, right? And blue jeans. Yeah. And you had never seen these guys before, but you decided to answer the door. I opened the door. I had we don't we did not have a peephole in the door. It was not uncommon to just open the door. Could have been a neighbor. Could have been anybody. I certainly didn't expect that in the middle of the day. Okay. And um, they held you up at gunpoint. Yes, they, they said, "Let us in now." They didn't shoot you. No, they didn't shoot me. They didn't shoot your mom. No, they did not. In fact, um, is it fair to say that they killed her with the kitchen knife from her own knife block? I believe they did, yes. Okay. Um, and you wrote letters while you were in custody for this offense. Is that correct? Yes. You wrote many, many letters to your friends and family members, correct? Uh, mainly family members, yes. Okay, specifically you wrote letters to Jean. Yes. And you wrote letters to your brother Rob? Yes. Okay. And you told them that it wouldn't be unlikely that your fingerprints would be on that knife, correct? From the standpoint that we all used the knives in the kitchen, I lived in the house, it, it very well could be on there. I all don't right. know. Did, did you uh, tell him... Um, any fingerprints that may exist are easily explained um, as the dumbbells were mine. Did you tell him that? Yes, I did. And I regularly use the knife in question to prepare food, correct? Yes, I did. Um, and you said you worked out three to four times per month and you were living there for 10 months. So it would not be hard to explain that evidence away if it were to appear. Correct, because I knew what the murder weapons were, so I saw the gentleman who used them, absolutely. Okay, but you never told him anything about the two guys who came into the house with guns and bludgeoned your mother to death. See this? This is important. You would think that while in police custody for his mother's murder, a murder he claims he didn't commit because two strangers just so happened to kill her the day he was supposed to report to prison, you would think that he would tell his friends and family what actually happened. He would want to unburden himself of their distrust and show that he didn't actually do the crime he's being accused of. 
you would also think he would now want to warn them of the danger they are supposedly in. But instead of doing that, he tried to justify why his DNA would be present at the scene of the crime, and why his fingerprints would be on the weapons. You really don't that have that kind of capacity to write from being incarcerated. I told him the key facts. Oh, okay. You told him the key facts that two guys broke into your mother's house? I don't recall if I told him that or not. Okay, and in fact, what you actually told him is... Uh, the timing and substance of this disclosure will all make sense. Yes, because I knew that I didn't do it, and I would have to sit here in my defense one day, absolutely. But you never said anything to Janine about um, these two guys who were supposedly out and knew her whereabouts in any of these letters, right? Janine wasn't reading anything I sent her. Okay, and what about your brother? You never said, listen... Um, these two guys are out, um, they've got photographs of our family on the phone, and you need to look into this, you need to do something and keep everyone safe. I had absolutely no confidence that law enforcement would do anything at that point, because they took out the warrant for the murder of my mother the same day they found the body, and investigated nobody else. But there was no need to investigate anyone else based on the crime scene and the circumstances. All the DNA that was found at the scene of the crime belonged to Richard and his mother. No neighbors stated they saw anyone suspicious or out of place when the murders took place. And no one person besides Richard had ever claimed that two men dressed suspiciously had been anywhere near the home at the time of the murder. Not only that, but he failed to call law enforcement and went on the run, spending eight months living under a different identity. He's trying to state that the suspicion being placed on him by law enforcement is unjustified, when in reality, it would be ridiculous to ignore him as a suspect. He had means, motive, and opportunity, but he wants us to ignore all of that, because he, the criminal who stole half a million dollars from the elderly, swears he wouldn't have done this. Okay, and um, you never, you, you did take, so you said you took your mother's car, right? Yes. And you took your mother's phone as well, right? Yes, I did. And um, that, that doesn't make really a lot of sense. Can you explain why you took your mother's phone? I took my phone, of course, and I took her phone because of all the calls we had been getting on both my phone and her phone. I assumed that these were the same folks who had been calling us that had killed her. They might have some sort of demands. Janine might call my phone or my mother's phone if these guys made a move on her or the kids, and I wanted to know exactly what was going on. That's why I took both phones. You've seen the phone records that the state admitted into evidence, didn't you? Of course. Okay, both you, um, and, and you've had the opportunity to review those phone records, right? Yes. And there were phone calls made to both your phone and your mother's phone while you were on the run, right? Uh, if... I don't recall anybody calling me while I was on my phone anyway. Okay. She may have received some texts. A lot of those were SMS, not necessarily phone calls. You never picked up any phone calls to your mother's phone on February 1st, 2019, did you? No, but if I recall correctly, the calls that came in were people in her contacts, so I had no worries that they were the ones who killed her. Okay. And you got rid of those phones? Yes. You got rid of them before you even cut the ankle monitor off, or around the time that you cut the ankle monitor yes, off? Yes, I, I don't dispute the data or your expert. So there was never any intent to turn them over to the police so that they could see whether anyone was after your mom or asking for demands, as, as you mentioned before? No, because I took them at their word. Say nothing or this will happen to your family. Okay. Um, Richard is pretty wild. Again, to be responding to the prosecution like this, as if what she's saying is ridiculous, is lunacy, especially when he's blatantly telling the jury, in this case, that he had evidence that everything he was saying is true, but he destroyed all the evidence while on the run. Sure, there's no proof that anything I'm saying happened, and no one can corroborate my story, but trust me, would I, a man who's going to prison for fraud and elder abuse, really do this? So whose idea was it to turn turn Jeff Coat, Mike Jeffcoat, down that morning? It was actually my mother's suggestion. She says, I don't really need Mike to come today. And I said, okay, as long as you're able to drive and get yourself back. All right. That was and, the extent of the conversation. All right. And, um, but you, both you and she texted Mike. Are you aware of that? Of course. Okay. Um, you went to Nashville. Is that the first place you went? Or did you stop anywhere else along the way? 
I believe I stopped in Chattanooga to use the bathroom at a Walmart. Okay. Um, and you spent those entire eight months in Nashville, right? Yes. All right. Um, you, and let, let's be clear, the name you used was Mick Malvo. Where did that name come from? The alias that I used was from New Orleans. It was a Cajun sounding name. That's why I picked it. All right. And you made this driver's license, State's Exhibit 82, yourself, right? Uh, yeah, I got the template online, yes. Okay. And you actually had the sleeves that you put driver's licenses in, or at least the kind that you put this in, in your car when it was collected, right? I printed it off and believe the business card, plastic laminates, that's, that's what I got. All right. And even the birth date on this is incorrect. Yes. All right. Because it says here that you were born on February 25th of 1980, right? Correct. When actually your birthday is February 23rd, 1974. That's right. Okay. So you subtracted six years on your age because you didn't want to get caught. I did not want to get found and have my family hurt as a result. I was trying to disappear to protect them. Hey guys, come on, please. I really wanted to go to prison for 15 years, but the day I was supposed to report in to begin my sentence, I was forced to go on the run. Not because I wanted to avoid prison time, but because two unknown men were going to murder my whole family if I were to get justice for the crimes I committed. Makes a lot of sense, and it's pretty noble when you really think about it. All right. Um, but you did go on to a dating app and meet women on that, right? Yes. Okay. Um, so you didn't have any concern about putting your, your um, information out on a, on a dating app, did you? What information specifically? Any of it. Well, I wasn't putting information out there as Richard Merritt. Okay. All right. Um, and did you speak with a New Orleans accent to Kelly? No. All right. And you were never a marketing executive. Right? No, I was not. That was just something you made up to create this new persona of Mick Malvo. Yes, that's correct. All right, and you did not go to LSU. No. You were a Georgia fan. I went to Georgia, yes. I'm and Georgia. you weren't an LSU fan. No. And you were not a Saints fan. Actually, I have been a Saints fan my whole life. Okay. Um, but you put those stickers on your mother's car as part of this persona of Mick Malvo. Yes, I did. Okay. Um, so that was part of the deception. Is that right? I would call it protection. All right. And you also put a stolen license plate on your mom's car. This is true. I did. All right. So that was part of the lie as well, because you didn't want to be found by these monsters. Absolutely right. Or the cops. That would lead to the monsters. Absolutely right. Okay, and you said that you were staying with cousins in Nashville, correct? I believe that is something I said, yes. But that's not true either. Is it? No, it wasn't true. You you didn't have any cousins or family in Nashville? Not to my knowledge, no. Okay, and so you didn't really have a place to stay in Nashville? Not at first, no. Okay, until you met Kelly. Correct. So you were using her for a place to live, is that right? I wouldn't go that far, no. Okay. Um, you told Kelly that you did not have any kids, correct? That's true. I and did. you said you had a niece, though, with cerebral palsy. I did. And you never said anything about um, any kind of nephew, right? No, I did not. You said that your mom had died of leukemia. Is that a lie that you told him? I, that's what I told him. Okay. Um, and... You grew your hair and beard out while you were there? Yes. And again, that was part of the persona of Mick Malvo because you didn't want to get caught by these alleged monsters, right? Yes, that's And true. you didn't want to get arrested either. Well, that would definitely lead to compromising my family, yes. All right. Mr. Merritt... When you originally stole money from your clients, you stole, what, about $500,000, more or less, right? Yes, correct. Um, and most of these clients were elderly. Not most of them, about a third. 
About a third. Okay. Um, are you aware that the average age of the clients who are chart who are listed as your victims in the indictment is sixty one point two years old? I wasn't specifically targeting the elderly. I believe the law states that sixty five and older is elder exploitation. Oh. Again, he's incredibly smug in his replies back to her, and it's not making him look good. He tries to one up her and claim he didn't actually target the elderly, even though he absolutely did previously stated his practice worked mostly with the elderly in the direct examination. And when she points out that the majority of his victims were over 61, he tries to fight back with technicalities. This entire time he's been on the stand, he was supposed to come off as extremely timid and incapable of hurting the people around him, but he's failed so spectacularly that I can't even put it into words. Okay, most of your victims were in their 60s and 70s. Is that right? I really don't know the numbers, man. Okay, and they had been injured in car accidents and other kind of insurance claims. That's 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 kind of the meat of the folks that you were representing and that you stole from. Is that right? That's correct. And you would tell them you 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 would you would settle their claims with the insurance company and not tell the clients that you had settled, right? That's what I did. And so you would take their money from the insurance company and keep it as your own, right? Well, it would be put back into the firm for the most part, but yes. Okay. And you also promised to put some money in your escrow account for certain clients, right? Yes. And again, you didn't put any of that money in an escrow account pled to all this in January of 2018. Okay. And you did this because the firm was in trouble. It was, yes. Okay. So is it fair to say, Mr. Merritt, that when you're in trouble, you lie to try to get out of it? I don't believe that's fair to say at all. Yes, it is. Okay. Is it fair to say that when your firm was in trouble... You deceived many of your clients, at least the 17 listed in the indictment? That is correct. I pled to that, yes. Okay. And is it fair to say that you deceived the people who you worked with and worked for at Betty's Grill as to your name and where you were from and who you were? Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Okay, and is it fair to say that you made up an entire story and told a lie to Kelly Richardson because that would be a convenient way for you to get what you needed at that time? I genuinely cared for Kelly. I didn't need her for a place to stay. Okay, and yet your entire relationship with her was a lie. Parts of it, yes. Okay. So is it fair to say that you have lied and deceived to get out of trouble in the past? I don't think that's fair to say. Okay, so the day of February 1st, 2019, these two guys came in, they killed your mother with her kitchen knife and your weight, right? Yes, they were my weights. And they um, didn't steal anything from the house. I don't know if they did or not. Okay, and um, they didn't break in. You said that you let them in yourself. No, I'm not aware that they tried to break in before. Okay, and they had never tried to break in prior to that. I can't say... Who tried to break it in at any given point? I okay. I don't know. Because nobody, as far as you know, had tried to break into your house prior to that. I'm not aware of anybody trying to break in, no. Okay. But they did not leave a scratch on you. They roughed me up a little bit going down the stairs, but no, they did Okay. And you were the person who they were after, right? I'm quite certain that that was their intent when they came there, yes. Okay. But they just let you go scot-free. I believe when my mother started to get loud, that's when the gentleman pushed her, and then he finished her off. 
so she wouldn't make any noise. That's what I personally think. And they didn't realize what they got into and they took off. I don't know what their real intentions were. We never got that far. Okay. They never pulled the triggers of either of those guns? No, they did not. Okay. And there was no struggle that caused any furniture to tip over, right? I don't recall any, no. Okay. Where did they get that knife from? I believe they got it from the butcher block in the kitchen. Okay. I don't have anything further. No, Judge. After his cross-examination, the defense rested their case, and closing arguments were said the following day. Richard had believed that he put on a stellar performance. Sure, he didn't cry or seem like he really cared about his mom that much, but he told the jury what to believe, and he felt that that was enough. He expected to be fully exonerated for all of his crimes and to walk out a free man. However, less than an hour later, the jury had reached their verdict. Guilty on all counts. In the Superior Court of DeKalb County, State of Georgia, State of Georgia versus Richard Vincent Merritt, defendant, indictment number 19CR2141-4, Judge Courtney L. Johnson. Verdict form, as of count one, malice murder, we the jury find the defendant guilty. As of count two, Felony murder. <clears throat> we, the jury, find the defendant guilty. As of count three, felony murder. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty. As of count four, aggravated assault. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty. <clears throat> As of count five, aggravated assault. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty. As of count six, possession of knife during commission of a felony. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty. Before receiving his sentence, Richard addressed the court. She shall give in the case now pending before this court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Yes, ma'am, I do. Okay. Mr. Merritt, before you say anything, I want to make sure that you understand that you do have the right to appeal your conviction in this uh, case. I am going to give you some more instructions about your appeal rights once we've concluded with the sentencing hearing, uh, but I'm sure that Mr. Queen has discussed this with you, but I do want to make sure that I reiterate that to you for the record. Yes, Your Honor. May I proceed? Yes. Your Honor, I realize the words aren't going to adequately convey what has occurred throughout the past week and the previous several years. I was raised right by two very good people, beautiful people, my mother and father. I had a beautiful family that I've lost. I've long since lost them. I lost them in the Cobb County case. Things were never the same after the arrest. I had as I said, a beautiful family, beautiful children, a beautiful wife, inside and out, all of them. The world was was truly our oyster, and I blew it. I just fell victim to the ultimate drug there is, and that's the green drug money, and it led to just bad behavior and bad choices. And my life spiraled out of control, and I couldn't get it back. I am immensely sorry for the pain that this entire process has caused. I realize it's been very uncomfortable for my family, those who used to be my friends, extended family, everybody who ever cared about me. And I was blessed to have a lot of people that did. And most of them are gone now. Maybe they'll come back in my life one day. I don't know. I have to earn that back somehow. I accept the court's sentence, whatever it may be. I respect, despite how poorly I treated the profession I was so lucky to be a part of, I, I respect the system, I respect justice, and the jury's verdict. I certainly understand my rights of appeal and will 
pursue that accordingly, but that's not really what I wanted to talk about. We all wish things could be different, but I can't go back and change anything. Um, as I said, I, I just, it's, it's a very surreal experience to be sitting here. And um, words aren't going to do any good. And I just want my family to know as as I sit here now, that I wish none of us had to go through it and endure the pain of this entire ordeal. And I hope that one day, when they're ready, if they're ready, that I'd be blessed to have them in some form in my life. I have not had a single interaction with either one of my children since being arrested in Nashville. I have no idea what their lives are like. I really have no idea what they look like, what their day-to-day -day life is like. And I know it's hard for a lot of people to believe this, but I, I do love them more than anything, and I miss them terribly. I'm not trying to interfere in their lives, and certainly that being a part of it, it's a little bit difficult in prison. I've been in prison now two and a half years. Before that, I was stuck in the Cab County 14 months in COVID, so I've been incarcerated in those four years. I know how hard it is, and I know how it changes people. But nevertheless, I'm going to try to be a better person and realize that life is a blessing, whatever form it may take, even a very difficult situation such as what I'm facing right now. I appreciate the court's time. They delude themselves into believing their own idiotic ideas. Imagine for a moment that you were the sole breadwinner of your family. Whatever the case may be, you are the only person in your household who has an income coming in. You have a child of your own and are able to easily make ends meet. Now let's say one of your family members falls ill and is unable to take care of their own children. Out of nowhere, you suddenly have to take care of three children under the age of 10, and are doing so on your own. Your house becomes overrun with their things, and the paycheck that used to easily sustain your small family is now stretched thin. Since it's just you taking care of the kids, you were in charge of waking them up, getting them ready for school, driving them there, and also getting yourself ready for work. By the time you make it in, you are already exhausted, and after less than a month, your boss takes you aside and tells you that they have begun to notice your work is suffering. You explain to them the situation, and while they are sympathetic, they also relay to you that if things don't turn around, they might need to demote you. This is upsetting, not only because you need this job, but because they are making it seem as if you are choosing to be in this situation. You didn't choose to stay up all night putting together one of the kids' science projects that they didn't tell you about until 9 p.m. You didn't choose to be woken up after one hour of sleep to hear about how one of the other kids accidentally wet themselves. And you certainly didn't want to have to take out a new line of credit to be able to afford new clothes for the oldest child when they went through a growth spurt. If you could come into work with more energy, you would. But you were well and truly exhausted. Directly after that, you get a call from the children's school and you find that one of your nieces had thrown up during class and needs to go home. Frustrated, you are forced to take the rest of the day off to take care of them, even though you just had a conversation with your boss about this. As you drive to their school, a cop pulls you over and tells you that your registration has expired, and you are given a fix-it ticket. It's not a huge deal, but at this point, you feel like the world is conspiring against you. You keep yourself together during the interaction, not wanting to cause a scene or lash out at an authority figure, but underneath the surface, you are boiling with anger and annoyance. It feels like the world is truly out to get you, but you can't do anything about it. By the time you pick up your niece, you are so angry you can barely speak. The woman working in the front office condescends to you about making your kid come to school when she is sick. She tells you that it's irresponsible to allow your niece to be around the other children, and that you should really know better. But before you have a chance to respond, to tell her that you didn't know she was sick when you dropped her off, your niece is next to you, asking if she can go home. You quickly sign them out of school, but on the way home, they throw open the car. Usually, you would tell them that it's okay, or comfort them and try to get them home as quickly as possible and worry about cleaning the car after they are taken care of. But you've had it. 
you pull the car over and yell at them, unleashing the past month's worth of stress onto them fully. Logically, you know they don't deserve to be made to feel bad because they got sick. They can't control that. But something about yelling at a person who cannot yell back feels better than keeping it inside. You had wanted to unleash your anger on your boss after they implied that your poor showing at work was something that you had control over. To the officer who gave you a ticket for something as small as your recently expired registration. Or the school secretary. But you knew that if you had, there would have been some kind of equivalent response. You could have been fired given a larger, more expensive ticket, or you could have been banned from the school. But now, as you sit pulled over on the side of the road, you know that you can now unleash your anger and stress upon this little girl without any sort of repercussion. You tell them to get out of the car and clean their vomit, wanting to punish them further for negatively impacting you. They are sick and crying, but they comply. And eventually, when they are finished, you drive them back home and let them rest. The momentary feeling of relief that your outburst would have given you would have faded by then. And after a few hours, you might feel badly, but you would have justified the scenario in some way. Maybe you would apologize to your niece. Maybe you would get them a small apology gift or let them eat ice cream after dinner. Or maybe you wouldn't feel bad at all, deciding that you were just teaching them a lesson about how the world works. Many people have gone through this kind of scenario in some way, with their parents taking their stress and anger out on them throughout their childhood, and then repeating the cycle with their own kids. Doubtless, there will be comments down below citing this fact, and even implying that it's so normal that we should be ashamed of ourselves for talking about it the way that we are. But today's case shows how deeply insidious taking out one's stress on their child can be, and how two people who were so blinded by their own rage that they would eventually kill their own family member after months of torture. Welcome back to another episode of Dreading, or if this is your first time here, welcome. Today we are going to be covering the case of Shanda Vander Ark and the despicable things she did to her autistic son, Timothy Ferguson. Before we begin, I do want to state that this video contains extremely graphic and hard to listen to details of the case, and might be upsetting to some viewers. Though this is a true crime channel, and the majority of our videos deal with traumatic situations, this one was particularly hard for us to research, so go forward with caution. Your well-being is more important than any watch time demographic. And if you have even the slightest notion that this video will harm you, please exit the video now. This topic was requested by hundreds of viewers like yourself. And if there is a case that you would like to see covered on this channel, let me know by emailing us at dreading.official at gmail.com. That is the number one way to get stories like this one up on our radar, as we are consistently going through that email and adding new topics to our list. Please note that we are not a replacement for going to law enforcement, nor are we an investigation entity. Now with that being said, let us begin. Today's video is brought to you by Beam. I've mentioned plenty of times that I have struggles sleeping. Partially due to stress, I am very rarely able to get a full night's sleep. However, since I've been using Beam's Dream Powder, I've been able to get a more restful night's sleep than I've ever been able to achieve. Beam is a delicious nighttime drink that's unique blend of sleeping promoting ingredients help you get a functional night's rest. That means going to sleep faster, staying asleep longer, and waking up feeling as if you were actually able to relax. Since I've been using Dream, I can genuinely say my sleep has improved. And I am not alone. A clinical study found that 93% of people who used Dream reported a better night's sleep. I'm partial to the chocolate peanut butter flavor, but having tried most of them, I can say there isn't a bad choice in the bunch. Beam has become part of my rest routine. And if you're looking for a better night's sleep, click the link in the description box down below and use code DREADING to get up to 35% off. I could not recommend Beam more. And frankly, if you struggle with sleep, you should definitely consider them. Again, click the link in the description box down below and use code DREADING to get up to 35% off. Thank you for Beam for partnering with us. And with all that said, let's get into the video. Not much information is available about who Timothy was before the abuse began, which in and of itself is a tragedy. Usually, we spend a significant amount of time going over the victim's hobbies and interests, understanding the things that they enjoyed and why, and trying to showcase the lives they lived before they were killed. But we can't do that here. What is mostly publicized about the 15-year-old was the fact that he was autistic, and how that was used as an excuse for what happened to him. He was described as sneaky, difficult, and manipulative by his mother and brother, who would eventually murder him. However, when asked how Timothy's autism negatively impacted others' lives, the most that Shanda and her eldest son Paul could state was that Timothy was constantly taking things apart and putting them back together. 
they described Timothy's need to see how things worked as being a sort of obsession, which frustrated them. Shanda, specifically, was quoted as saying that she hoped to discipline this action out of Timothy, even though what she was describing was likely his hyperfixation. For those of you who have little to no experience with autism, a hyperfixation is when a person with autism focuses deeply on one particular subject or action. Autism as we understand it today is considered a spectrum disorder, meaning that there is no one particular way it presents itself. There is a popular saying that if you meet one person with autism, you've met one person with autism, because the spectrum is so vast. The majority of people with autism deal with similar struggles. However, how these struggles impact their lives varies from person to person. Many autistic individuals can come across to others as uncaring, unable to keep focus when another person is talking, but when their own individual interests are piqued, they would be able to focus on that topic for hours at a time. For example, an autistic individual might have an affinity for music and music composition. This could manifest in them spending the majority of their time researching how certain sounds are made, working non-stop for days on end to create a similar vintage synth sound that they heard in a Roxy Music album or something. Thus, working extremely hard in one field of study. Meanwhile, they seemingly are unable to pay attention or care about any other classes or their social lives. Timothy was incredibly intrigued by learning how things worked. He constantly wanted to pull things apart and put them back together. That way he could get his mind around what he was looking at. But all his mother saw was Timothy being difficult. Shanda Vander Ark is an intelligent woman, although her own lawyers would argue against that notion. She graduated law school second in her class, and as evidenced by her Facebook profile, was extremely confident telling others that she was smarter than most people around her. She regularly reviewed local establishments, condemning service workers and managerial staff for not showing her the amount of respect that she desired, and using her law background to do so, which is probably not the best use of the resources and time spent in higher learning. But Shanda was also incredibly abusive to those around her. It seems obvious in hindsight that she had some control issues, and took extreme measures to make sure things were done her way. It would appear that she viewed children as if they were adults. So if a child was to disobey her, talk back, or not follow her directions to the letter, she would view that as a sign of disrespect. A child being too distracted to listen to her, or making a simple error, wasn't understandable. It was something that needed to be conditioned out of them through physical force and her absolute authority. Though the details of why have not been made public, Child Protective Services found and substantiated multiple credible accounts of child abuse done by Shanda between 2009 and 2012. They recommended that her parental rights be terminated, and that she should not be allowed to see her children unsupervised. Instead, Shanda chose to move out of Oklahoma to Michigan, and agreed to no longer see her three children. However, that didn't last. It's unclear as to how Shanda got custody of her children back, but the consequences of that singular action were dire. According to Shanda, he allegedly called her, and informed her that he would be dropping Timothy off with Child Protective Services if she weren't to come get him. She would also allege, on this call, that he stated that Timothy's behavior was completely out of hand, and that he no longer wanted anything to do with his son. It was at that point the year of torture began. Despite Shanda's intelligence, she seemed completely unwilling to learn about the condition that her son had, and how it affected him. Instead, she perceived his sensory issues and his struggles as him being needlessly difficult and making her life harder. This was despite the fact that she herself had sensory issues and would understand the stress they cause. Shanda would characterize Timothy as a burden, getting in the way of the things that she wanted to do, and as the Vander Ark family continued to deal with the other struggles, like her husband's stroke, she began to take out a frustration on her autistic son. The following is Paul's testimony, detailing what he and his mother did to Timothy. I edited this down to its most relevant points, and we are not going to be going over his testimony in this video. But if you would like to see a full breakdown of that, let me know. Um, <clears throat> now let's back up just a little bit from, from the time your brother Timothy actually passed away. Um, when did Timothy come to live with you and your mother in that house? May 27th of 2001. 2001. 2000, was it maybe 2021? 21. Okay. I'm so sorry. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. So in May of 2021, Timothy came to live with you, is that right? Yes, sir. And at the time when Timothy came to live with you, besides yourself and, and G, um, was there somebody else that was living in the house during that time period? Um, other than my mother and half-brother, my stepfather, Adam. Okay. 
And your step your stepfather Adam was he married to your mother at that time? Yes. And is he actually the father of your younger brother G? No. Um, but your mother is the mother to you and to Timothy and to G. Is that right? She's your mother. She's Timothy's mother. She's G's mother. Is a better way. Yes. Right? Yes. Okay. Um, and at some point in time, did something happen to Adam where he wasn't wasn't living in the home anymore? He suffered a stroke in January. Did he leave the house at that point? Yes. When he left the house at that point, then is that then when it became just you, uh, your, your two brothers and your mother living in the home? Yes, sir. And when Adam suffered the stroke, was he physically able to do anything to provide any care to either you or to Timothy or to G? No. So Timothy came to live with you, and prior to Timothy coming to live with you, was it just you and and G and your mom and stepdad in the house at that time? Yes. So you went from four people in the house to five people in the house in May of 2021? Yes. And then back down to four people when Adam unfortunately had his stroke in January of 2022? Yes. Now, around the shortly after the time of the stroke, um, did there come a point in time where you became involved in having to administer some discipline to your younger brother, to Timothy? Yes. Um, we'll talk about some specifics, but uh, we've already had some text messages read, and and you've had an opportunity to kind of hear about some of those text messages throughout this, right? Yes, sir. And you sent text messages back and forth between yourself and your mother. Um, and we had those text messages from January through the time of your brother's death in July of 2022. Was that your understanding? Yes, sir. The at some point in time in February, there's a discussion fairly early in those text messages about um, blocking Timothy's access to food. Can you describe what was happening at that time and how he was restricted from getting access to food? Um, he was sneaking food that was not necessary at that time. And it was solved by placing locks on the fridge freezer and pantry. And when you say he was sneaking food that wasn't necessary, who would make that determination that it wasn't necessary? Shonda. The, uh, and what, what type of food are we talking about that he would sneak that wasn't necessary? Sweets or anything he could really get his hands on. So as early as February, there was restriction that the locks were going on the freezer and the refrigerator and you said there was also some type of lock on the pantry is that right yes sir um, and we've heard a text exchange but at some point a little bit later as, as things are progressing into April was there a time where Timothy was doing something to get the locks off of the pantry door he was pulling them off by hand and what were you instructed to do as a result of him pulling the pantry door locks off Let me ask you this way. Was, were, were you, were you given some instruction to replace that lock? Yes. And who gave you that instruction? Shonda. And, the, and what was your understanding of why you were locking the pantry back up? Because he was sneaking food. Let's talk about your brother Timothy for just a little bit. Did Timothy have some special needs? Yes. What, were, what was your understanding of what his special needs were? He was... Attention Deficit Hyperactive Disorder, as well as Autistic, he had speech and motor impairments. Speech and what type of impairments? Motor impairments, movement so, impairments. Movement impairments? Yes. And is, at the time that he came to live with you, was he supposed to be taking some medication? Yes. And did, that, did he stop taking his medication? Yes. Why did he stop taking his medication? Um, I'm, Could you please reiterate? Yeah, who, I guess the better way of saying it is who made the decision for him to stop taking his medication? Shonda. As far as you know, from the time that Timothy came to live with you in May of 2021 in Norton Shores to the time of his death, did you ever see Timothy go to, to a doctor? No. Did Timothy go to school? Not public, no. How was he schooled? Home. When we say homeschooled, what would that entail? Um, at first, it was assignments on a tablet, and then 
my mother restricted it to where she would print out the assignments and he would sit downstairs and do them. So he never went to school and never went to, to a doctor, as far as you could see? Yes, sir. Um, basically from January, from the time of the stroke moving forward, was Timothy allowed to even leave the house? No. When was, when, if ever, was he ever allowed to go outside? To walk the dogs sometimes. And when he would walk the dogs, where was it that he would walk the dogs? In the backyard, out of sight. Was there ever some physical discipline that was involved with him being outside as well? Yes. What was that discipline? He was <coughs> made to run up and down the patio stairs. Um, and those are, so those are stairs in the back of your house? Yes, sir. Are those visible at all from the front of the house? No, sir. Visible to anyone walking by on the street or driving by, anything of that nature? No, sir. Um, there are some text messages referenced in there where, um, where, where there's a discussion about doing the stairs chasing style. What is, what is that, if you remember? Um, following close behind him to ensure he moves faster. And, and who would be the one that would chase him if that was taking place? I had to. What was, uh, besides, you've talked about some of the, the special needs that Timothy had when he came to live with you. What was his overall physical appearance, though, when he first came to live with you? Um, he wasn't skinny, but he wasn't extremely overweight. He had a good amount of chubbiness to him. So he was a little chubby? Yes. Um, obviously, as we all know, and now the jury's already seen some of the photographs that, that went away at some point in time. Um, did the food, when did the food restriction on Timothy start with the locks going on in the refrigerator, the freezer, and the pantry, and things of that nature? When, when did that actually begin? Sometime in February. Um, there's been some testimony already about Timothy going on a hunger strike at around the time of Adam's stroke. To your knowledge, did <coughs> Timothy ever go on a hunger strike when Adam had his stroke? No, sir. There's also a reference to him going on another hunger strike about two weeks before he passed away. Did, <coughs> excuse me, did that happen? No, sir. The Police have indicated that at the time they searched a residence, there were a number of cameras seized, uh, as well as another <coughs> item. So let's talk about the cameras first. What was the purpose of the cameras being inside the residence? To watch Timothy. And who would be watching Timothy on those cameras? My mother, or when she couldn't, she had me do so. And how is it that you would, kind of explain for the jury if you can, how is it that you watched the, the cameras so you could watch what Timothy was doing? I would log into the app on my phone and it would alert me if there was a motion movement. So you had some type of, you had your phone and you had some type of app on there that was connected to those cameras? Several, yes. And, and you said that you were also alerted to movement with motion sensors in the home? Uh, they, yes, and the cameras also had that feature as well, they activated on motion. And what, what was the restriction on Timothy's movement that would cause those cameras to go off? Where was he limited to? Could you please reiterate? Yeah. Where is it that, where could Timothy go, basically? Um, mainly he was restricted to the downstairs area, to a closet downstairs. Um, the downstairs area actually contained two bedrooms. One was yours and one was G's bedroom, is that correct? Yes, sir. And there was also a bunk bed that was out in that area um, that, that, we've, that I believe that, that the defendant indicated was Timothy's bunk bed, is that correct? Yes, sir. Where did he actually sleep most nights? In the closet. This, and how, what, what did you call the closet? Was there a name you used to refer to the, the closet? The small room. And what was in the small room if, if Timothy was in the small room? There was a camera monitoring him, even when he slept. Was there an alarm on the door as well? <coughs> yes, sir. Some type of motion sensor or alarm? Motion, vibration, yes. So the, the, we had that on the door and then a camera actually inside the room as well, is that correct? Yes, sir. And were there times where you were required to watch that camera? Yes, sir. And to your knowledge, were there times when your mother was watching that camera as well? Yes, sir. 
Was there a restriction on how much Timothy could move while he was inside that closet? Could you please reiterate, sir? Were, were there any restrictions on his movement inside the closet, or was it he could move around however he wanted inside the closet? There were restrictions. What were the restrictions on his movement? Um, hands on his head, normally. Hands on his head, is that what you indicated? Yes. Was that was some form of discipline for him? Yes, on his knees and against a corner or wall of the room. Um, and when you say hands on head, I'm going to demonstrate, just putting my hands just over my head like this. Is that what he was required to do? Yes. He was required to be on his knees as well? Say yes? Yes, sir. You have to say yes or no, because this uh, is I apologize. Important. You're fine. No, it's fine. Everybody makes that mistake. It's not a problem. Um, and was he monitored to make sure that he was doing those things? Yes, sir. And for how long would he have to do these things? Several hours. And that was, and that was inside his closet, for lack of a better way of putting it, what you referred to as the small room, correct? Yes, sir. Um, were there also times when he was required to stand against the wall? Yes, sir. And would, would that be in the closet, or would that be in other places in the house? Um, at times, it would be upstairs by the back door or on the wall between me and G's room. And when he would stand against the, the, the wall, how long were we talking about that he would be required to do that? Hours, sometimes overnight. At some point, were, did you utilize some type of alarm or alarms on his body to alert you if he was moving? A vibration detector, yes. <clears throat> was, there, was there more than one that he was required to wear at times? At times, yes. Where were those devices located on his body? Um, they were normally tied to the back loop of his belt, or the back loop of his pants, I apologize. And were there, was there something placed on his wrist as well at that point? Handcuffs, and before that, zip ties, zip cuffs. When you say zip cuffs, are those put together with zip ties? Yes. And, what, and those were designed to restrict what? Movement. Of what part of his body? His hands. Uh, I think there's a text exchange that the jury's heard a couple of times where it's referencing him tightening those zip cuffs uh, on his wrist. Do you recall that? Yes, sir. And so those, what was happening that caused you to send that text message and have that exchange with, with your mother about those zip cuffs? <clears throat> he was complaining about them being too tight. And what was your mother's response when he was complaining about those being too tight? Um, to leave them and she deal with it after she got home. At the, the small room that you've described, at some point in time, there was a, uh, a, a tarp placed in there. Is that right? Yes, sir. And what was the reason there was a tarp placed in that room? Due to Timothy's bladder problem, Shonda didn't want him urinating on the floor. Would that be something that he would do? Yes. Would, did he wear some type of adult, adult diaper? Adult diaper, yes. And... Um, Let me ask it this way. If Timothy had to go to the bathroom, what was, how, how would he go to the bathroom? Um, he would have to ask and he would be timed. And who would do the timing? Um, whichever one of us was there. So we'd ask, Maisel Cast asked permission to go to the bathroom? Yes, sir. And what was the, t what time was he allowed to go to the bathroom? For urinating, it was a minute. Um, for uh, you can say the word, it's okay. Taking a poop, it was <clears throat> two minutes. And who set those time limits? Shonda. We've seen a lot of text messages and references to hot sauce and hot sauce re retrieved from the home. Um, at some point in time, did you have, were, you, were you asked to start feeding him bread with hot sauce on it? Yes. And who asked you to do that? Shonda. Um, why were you giving him bread with hot sauce on it? Um, because he was supposedly misbehaving. And how would you 
I mean, describe to the jury what you would do to do that and to make him eat the bread with hot sauce. Um, I would put it on bread, have him stand in the kitchen area near the back door and watch him eat until he finished. And was he required to eat it until it was all gone? Yes, sir. Did it ever look like he wanted to eat the bread with hot sauce? No. Were there times where you were told that he could have something besides bread with hot sauce on it if he ate the bread with hot sauce first? Regular bread, yes. So he had to eat that bread with hot sauce first and then he could have some regular bread? Yes. Did he have to wait a period of time before he could eat the regular bread then? Yes, sir. Well, do you remember about what that was? About how long? 30 minutes. With taking out the bread out of the equation, was hot sauce used in some other fashion as a form of discipline for him? It was poured <coughs> directly into his mouth. And who would, who would do that? Uh, me or Shonda, me under her um, orders. And it's just like what you sound like? You just, how did you do that? I had him open his mouth and put it, poured it in. The, the, there's some text messages. Do you recall a text message you exchanged with your mother in, I believe it's around April or so, where <coughs> you've alerted her to the fact that he's eaten some, uh, some part of a burger? Yes. Do you recall that? Yes. What, what was it, what part of the burger is it that he ate? It's the crust. And what was your mother's response when you told her that, she, that he had eaten the crust of that burger? make him throw it up. Did you try to do that? I tried at first, yes. How did you try to do that? Um, putting a finger into his mouth as instructed to his, the back of his throat to induce vomiting. So who gave you the instruction to put your finger in the back of his throat? Shonda. We don't see a text message to that effect. Were you two also communicating by camera as well? Yes. The, the cameras had a, was it a two-way capability, basically? You yes. could talk to the camera or something. You could talk the and they could hear. At certain times, it could be activated. Was there ever any other time where she instructed you to make Timothy throw up? Yes. About how many times did she instruct you to do that? Um, three or four. At some point in time, did was there a form of discipline introduced that involved you placing Timothy in a cold tub? Yes. And what was the what was the mechanism for that? How did how did you do that? Um, clo clog the tub, plug it, um, turn on the water, and take the ice that was in our ice maker upstairs and put it in. And. Get, have him get in. Initially, how long was he supposed to sit in the cold water? Um, 30 minutes. 30 minutes? And that, when we say cold water, we actually mean water with ice cubes in it? Is that what you're talking about? Yes. Um, and how often, how, when did that start in relation to when Timothy died? If you remember. I do not remember the exacts. And do you know about how many times you did that up until the day that the, the day before Timothy died? Um, before the day that Timothy died? The day before Timothy died. We'll get to that in just a moment, and I believe that three. Then. So you remember doing it three times before the day before Timothy died? Yes. And who would direct you to put him in the ice bath? Shonda. Was there? some type of camera in the bathroom as well? Yes, on the counter. Was that camera monitored by somebody if, if you were in the bathtub, or if you were in the bathroom with Timothy? Shonda. Were you instructed to stay in the bathroom with Timothy when he was in the tub? Yes. Why? To ensure that he couldn't get comfortable or try to turn the water hot. And what would you, if you tried to move around, what were you instructed to do? Um, 
I don't quite understand. If, if you said that you were supposed to make sure that he stayed uncomfortable, how were you supposed to make him uncomfortable in an ice bag? Um, put his body at an odd angle that was not a comfortable position to be in. When he was in the tub, would he try to rest his head somewhere? On his shoulder, yes, or the lip of the tub. Is that allowed? No. I know this is difficult for you, Paul, and you and I have had a number of conversations about this matter. Um, but I need you to look at a text message that you sent to your mother. It's got a photo that you took of your brother. You remember sending that text message? Yes, sir. For the record, this is People's 36A. This has been previously shown to the jury. Um, who took that photo of your brother? Me. And you sent it to your mother? Yes, sir. Why did you send it to your mother? Because I was concerned with how thin he was. And that photo was taken on, um, do you remember what the date was? Not the exact, no. If, if your phone indicated it was June 13th, you'd have no reason to dispute that? No, sir. Um, and you just became, again, the reason you sent it to your mother was why? Because I was concerned about how thin he was. Do you remember what your mother told you to give him after she, you sent her that photograph? Bread. And then is there a reference to bread and some peanut butter? Yes. The, so at that point, he's, your brother's very skinny, right? Was he eating regular meals at that point? No. Were you still administering the hot sauce on the bread as a form of punishment for him at, during that time period? Yes. And did that continue all the way up until the time of his death? Yes. Did he ever eat any normal type of meal leading up to his death after you took that photo and sent it to your mother? Um, that day I made him an actual real meal, some, an actual peanut butter and jelly sandwich, as well as scrambled some eggs and put cheese in them. Did you tell your mother you made that meal for him? No, sir. Why not? Because I didn't want her to be upset with me. Let's move up to the day before your brother passed away. Do you remember the day before your brother died? Um, he was unresponsive when I went to, when I was told to get him up. So you were given some instructions to wake him up in the morning? Yes. Was your mother already at work? <clears throat> yes. Were the, the cameras activated at that point though? Yes. So your responsibility when you had to go wake him up was what? Just to do what? To get him up? Um, just wake him up, which normally wasn't difficult before then. But And this is the day before he passed away, but was it difficult on that day? Very. Um, did you scream at him and yell at him to get him to try to wake up? Yes. And at some point were you instructed to do something with him because he wouldn't wake up? Put him in an ice bath. And did you do that? Yes. Was he able to, where was he sleeping that night? closet. So when you went to wake him up and he was unresponsive, was he still in the closet? Yes. How did you get him from the closet to the bathroom with the I ice had bath? to drag him. He wasn't, he didn't stand on his own? He couldn't, no. Didn't walk on his own? Is that a <coughs> no? Is that no. A, um, was he even talking at that point? No. Do you remember about what time it was that you put him in the ice bath? Um, not exactly, no. Um, if the text message indicated it was around 2 o'clock, does that sound about right? Yes. What time did you have to leave for work that particular day? Um, I was supposed to be at work at 4, but unfortunately due to a flat tire on my e-bike, I had to wait till 6 for my mother to get home and drive me to work. So from 2 to 6 until your mother got home, you were home with Timothy, is that right? Yes. And where was Timothy that entire time that you were home with him? In the bath. In the ice bath? Was yes. your mother giving you instructions on what to do with him while he was in that tub then, at that point in time? Yes, sir. What was she telling you to do? Um, make him uncomfortable 
and at one point she had me heat up a pizza roll to see if he would be responsive to enticement. Did you actually do that? Yes. And what did you, so describe to the jury exactly what you did with that pizza roll with Timothy in the tub. Um, I held it close and when he responded, as per instruction, I was to pull it away from him. So you, and you did you actually do this? Yes. So you actually held a pizza roll in front of him to see if he would respond? Is that yes? Yes, sir. I know it's difficult. Did he respond? Yes, sir. And what did you do when he tried to respond? I had to, or as I was told, I pulled it away. So we didn't get to eat the pizza roll? No. Do you recall um, while Timothy was in the tub an exchange where your mother inquired about pouring hot sauce on his private parts? I do, yes. Did you do that? No. That was beyond cool as everything else was. So you put him in the tub around 2. Did your mom come home at 6? Yes. And when your mom gets home at 6, did you go to work at that point in time? She drove me to work, yes. And was Timothy still in the tub at that point in time? <clears throat> yes. So you and your mom drove to Grand Haven to drop you off at work, and Timothy's just in the tub? Yes, sir. Was he even physically able to move around at that point in time? No. Do you recall getting a text message from your mother um, <coughs> around 11.30 or so that night while you were at work? Yes, and though I saw it later than that because I was busy. So you received the text message, but you didn't actually read it until a little bit late, uh, later than it was received? Yes, sir. And what, was, what did you understand from that text message from your mother about where Timothy had been up until the time you were at work at 11.30 at night? Still in the tub. So that's nine hours plus from the time that you first put him in the tub at two o'clock? Yes. When you got home, do you remember about what time you got home that night? One o'clock. How did you get home? Did somebody give you a ride? Yes, a so coworker. Did your mom, your mom didn't pick you up that night, did she? No. When you got home at one o'clock, did you go to your bedroom? Yes. Downstairs in the in the basement area, the lower level. Yes, sir. Did you see Timothy at all? No. Did you check on him at all? No. When did you next become aware that something was happening with Timothy? The next morning. And what happened? Um, I had had to get up early so that Shonda could drive me to the premises area of work. Um, and I'd, been, I'd gone to the laundry room to get a pair of clean socks and was then made aware that he was not breathing. And where was he at that point in time? In the closet. And who made you aware that he wasn't breathing? Shonda. Was he on his bunk bed? No. Was he ever on his bunk bed from the time that he was in that small closet until the time the police arrived? No, sir. If you know, do you know how much time passed from the time that you first became aware he wasn't breathing until 911 was called? 18 minutes. And during that 18 minutes, was there, did you tell your, your mother or ask your mother if you were going to call 911? Yes, sir. Do you remember what she said? No. She said no. Sorry, that was my bad. I'm sorry. Good. Let's clarify that. Do you, do you remember what your mother said when you asked her if we should call 911? She said no. So you didn't call 911 at that time? No. Um, during that time period, uh, what were you doing? I was attempting to resuscitate, though it was too late. At the time when he came out of the, the small room, how did he get out of the small room at that point? How did his body actually come out of the small room? He was removed. By who? Uh, 
Shonda, and I believe I helped a bit. What was he wearing when he came out of the room? Nothing but an adult diaper. At some point, did you put clothes on him? Yes. Who, who put the clothes on him? Um, both me and Shonda, per Shonda's uh, request, order, however you'd like to phrase it. So we, before he was wearing the diaper, and but you put the clothes on him while he's unresponsive outside of the small room? Yes. And what, do you remember what clothes you put on him? Um, a hoodie, a pair of my jeans, and Shonda had me remove my belt and put it on him. Did she tell you why she wanted you to take the belt off and put it on? Because the pants were too big. At some point, the 911 is actually called, is that correct? Yes, sir. Now, before 911 was called, and I guess let me ask you this, who actually called 911? Me. Um, but did Shonda actually talk to the, the 911 folks, if you remember? Not that I remember of, no. Okay. Um, before 911 is called, was there some discussion about a hunger strike? Yes. What was the discussion about the hunger strike at that point? Shonda said to say that he'd gone on a hunger strike. Was and that we found him on the bed. Seems dead. obvious, but who was she referring to? Timothy. And said that he was found on the bed? Yes, the bed. So 911 comes at that point, and then the police are also involved. Is that right? Yes, sir. At some point in time, did the police leave you guys alone in the home? Yes. Later that night? Yes. And when that happened, uh, did Chanda do anything with any of the items in the house? She disposed of evidence. What did she dispose of? Vibration detectors, a camera upstairs that was not confiscated. She broke the memory chip that was inside into four pieces and threw them out the window as we were driving to Grandma and Grandpa Vander Arks. So you went down to Grandma and Grandpa Vander Arks that night? Yes. And she disposed of evidence on the way down to... Yes, and okay. the vibration alarms were thrown into a trash can were in a, stuffed in a plastic bag and thrown into a trash can at the Chick-fil-A near our house. Um, and you say the, vi the vibration alarms, are you talking about the sensors that were on the doors? Yes. Was, that this, was one of those the sensor that was... From Paul's accounting of events, it's clear that Timothy was thoroughly tortured and abused. Despite his impairments and sensory issues, he was forced to do manual labor, sit in freezing cold bathtubs for over nine hours, kept away from food, and meant to sleep on the floor of a closet, while constantly being monitored by his mother and older brother. Even when he was sleeping, he wasn't given respite from the abuse, as they had shackled him to the walls and attached sensors on him, so if he moved while sleeping, they would be alerted and be able to punish him. The lengths to which he was abused caused him to go from a healthy weight down to less than 70 pounds, with him routinely only being allowed to eat slices of bread that were covered in hot sauce. He was so hungry that he would eat frozen, uncooked food, but when he would be caught, he was forced to throw it up. That would then be used to justify further punishment and abuse. What's also apparent from Paul's testimony is the fact that he is clearly afraid of his mother. He spends the entire time on the stand looking between the prosecutor and his mother, displaying signs of stress and fear. It's apparent he is not remarkably intelligent, and the way he physically cannot sit still when talking about obeying his mother's orders is in line with a person who feared her wrath above all else. That is not to say he is not responsible for what he did to his brother, mind you. He had the power to help Timothy, to give him food, talk to the police, and he failed him. But it's obvious that Paul is not the one in charge. That was Shanda, who spent her time watching Paul on the stand, looking at him with contempt and shaking her head, as if what he was saying was not accurate. But his version of events matches the text messages shared between the two while the abuse was going on. Shortly after Paul left the stand, Shanda would testify in her own defense. Her lawyers never argued that she was not responsible for Timothy's death. Rather, they noted that what happened had not been intentional. Though they spoke highly of her intelligence, they argued that she was overworked, overstressed, and was simply trying to correct her son's behavior through repeated punishments. How was she supposed to know that keeping food away from someone, forcing them to sleep on the floor of a closet, making them run up and down stairs for hours at a time, and shackling them to a wall was considered abuse. It was an easy mistake to make. 
Her lawyers had very little to work with in terms of argument, but as Shanda refused to plead guilty, despite the deluge of evidence against her, they were forced to use those arguments in court. Notably, they rarely objected or even tried to contest the prosecution throughout the trial, almost as if they knew they were going to lose anyways, but Shanda didn't believe that to be the case. Again, she went to law school. She graduated second in her class, and she worked at the very courthouse her case was being heard at. Even though all the evidence points directly towards her torturing her autistic son to death, she believes that she can outmaneuver all the evidence. She can validate the way she shackled him to a wall, the way she texted her son to pour hot sauce on Timothy's genitals when he was in the bath, and why they locked up the food even though he was starving. Her lawyer would have told her not to take the stand, and to take a plea deal, and to serve her time, but she believes she's going to get away with this. As we go over her testimony in court, pay special attention to how Shanda discusses her own stresses in life, how much attention and emphasis she places on what she was going through when she was torturing her 15-year-old son to death. The introduction of this video will make more sense the more she speaks. Now, let's begin. All right, Mr. Johnson, you can call your first witness. Uh, the defense called uh, Vander Ock. All right, Mr. Vander Ock, if you can come around here, please. Stand in front of that chair, raise your right hand, please. Raise your right hand, please. In this manner now pending, do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to so help you God? I do, Mr. All right, you can put your hand down, grab a seat. Please state your name for the record, spelling your first name and last name. Uh, Shonda, S-H-A-N-D-A, Vander Ark, V-A-N-D-E-R, space, capital A-R-K. As the direct examination begins, Shanda is extremely confident in her case, which, as we established, she shouldn't be. She has heard all the testimony given. She spent the majority of this day listening to the horrifying text messages she exchanged with Paul, telling him what to do with his little brother, and still, despite all of that, she confidently strides up to the stand. Mind you, during the three-day-long trial, Shanda has pretended to have a panic attack while listening to the details of the case and attempted to distract the jury by feigning hysterics. But now, as she approaches the stand, there is no sign of remorse or discomfort. There is no sense of shame in her actions, no understanding that even if what she is about to say is true, even if it was an accident, she is still at fault for killing her son. You would expect a mother who had killed their child, even accidentally, to display some sense of shame or sadness about that, especially while in court. But there is none of that. Uh, thank you, Ms. Vander Ark. Uh, uh, you're being called to testify in your own cases. You understand that? Yes, sir. And, and to do that, you have to make sure that everyone can understand you, correct? Yes, sir. With you, uh, and knowing as I do, I don't think volume's going to be a problem with you? Probably not, sir. Talking fast, maybe. Yes, sir. It might. Okay, so this is. Uh, are you nervous? Yes, sir. This is stressful. Yes, sir. Very. So you're going to be questions going to be thrown at you, uh, fast and furious. You, you've seen how trials work, correct? Yes, sir. Okay, and <clears throat> under those circumstances, you may speed up again as I do. Yes, you sir. Know? Okay, you you may be reminded from time to time to slow down just a little bit. Do you understand that? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Let's. Make sure everyone understands you. You've been sitting through this 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 trial for the since the beginning, correct? Yes, sir. And you were arrested for these offenses alleged back when? July seventh of twenty twenty two. Okay. So you've been living with this thing for more than what, eighteen months? Seventeen months, yes. Seventeen sir. months. So you know what we're talking about, correct? Yes, sir. And you understand the allegations against you? Yes, sir. And and that it also helps that, that you have a legal background, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, uh, the things they said about how well you did in school and, and all those things, were all those all true? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, I, I, I want you sitting there and regaling this, but, but the things about cum laude and going to law school, all that stuff is true. It was magna cum laude, yes, sir. Okay, thank you. It should go without saying that if you are on trial for something as remarkably heinous as the torture and prolonged abuse of your autistic son, you should not smile while talking about how you graduated at the top of your class and are incredibly intelligent. That does not come across well to the jury or to the public, and goes directly against any argument that could be made in your defense. Starting her testimony with the fact that she is supremely smart only serves to showcase her actions in a more crude light. If she was able to graduate second in her class in law school and worked in law, then there was no discernible way she didn't know that chaining her son up in a closet and forcing him to do wall sits for hours wasn't abuse and would eventually kill him. All right. Let's start, let's go back to the very beginning. Uh, when you, it, 
Okay. <clears throat> when did Timothy come to your care? Uh, May of 2021. Prior to that, who had physical and legal custody of Timothy? My ex-husband. Okay. And when he sent, and, and how, how did it happen that you ended up with custody there? My ex reached out to me um, stating that Timothy was, he could no longer handle him, that he was pushing his buttons, and that he needed to send him to live with me. Okay. And you agreed to that? Yes, sir. Okay. Had you ever lived with Timothy uh, for, during his, his... When he was younger, yes, sir. Okay. As a reminder, there were credible, substantiated claims of abuse against her from when she lived with Timothy while he was a child, which is why she wasn't allowed to have custody in the first place. All right, so uh, you, you agreed to accept him into your home? Yes, sir. And who was living in your home at the time? Myself, my husband, Adam, Paul Ferguson, and then my little man, G. G, okay, that's what we've been calling G, correct? It's really hard to do, yes, sir. Okay, do the, just do the best you can. Uh, okay, so they're all living in your home, and then Timothy joins you, correct? Yes, sir. When Timothy's joining you, did your <clears throat> ex-husband ever make any ex any effort to transfer legal custody to you? Um, we discussed it, but he never did actually sign anything, no, sir. Okay. And without legal custody, how do you get Timothy into school? You can't. And without legal custody... How do you get medical treatment for Timothy? You can't. Did your husband at least send his, I assume he had medical insurance for Timothy, did he, he send that? He did not send me. I requested his medical uh, card, his insurance card, and he never sent it to me. Now, she absolutely could have enrolled Timothy in school and gotten him medical attention without having the legal documents from his father. And in fact, seeing as she worked in the legal field to ascertain those documents from him, that was both not a priority for her and something she didn't want to do. Firstly, she likely would not have been allowed to have custody of Timothy in the first place, so contacting anyone to become his legal guardian could have led to her youngest son being taken out of her care. Moreover, when she moved to Michigan, she had established a life for herself, one in which she presented as a hardworking court transcriber, caretaker, and mother. If she was to be investigated by CPS, word could get back to her work, and that perception could change, which was not something she wanted to have happen. That was less preferable to her than her son having to go cold turkey off of his ADHD medication. By the way this was presented by her attorney makes it appear this was something that Shanda had no control over. It was her ex-husband's fault that she couldn't get her son medical attention. It was his fault that she couldn't enroll him in school and therefore kept him confined to the home the entire time he was in her care. Therefore, she is blameless. You heard the testimony uh, that Timoth Timothy saw the doctor in nine 2019. Did you hear that? Yes, I did. That was a year before you received him? Two years before I received him. <clears throat> two years before. So in the prior two years before you received him, as far as you know, based on what you heard here, your ex-husband never took him to the doctor? As far as I know, yes, sir. How do you know if he had medical insurance for this young man? He told me he did. Okay. But he never sent it to you? No, sir. Okay. Um, what was your what was your financial situation once Timothy arrived and your husband had a stroke? After the stroke, we yes. lost my husband's income, um, and it was <clears throat> paycheck to pay not even paycheck to paycheck. Almost everything was paid late. Um, I was struggling. I I asked Paul for help with groceries sometimes because we were struggling. Okay, and Paul was working full time. He was working part time. He's working at, at Applebee's? At yes, sir. Okay. So he's working part-time. And so what, were you receiving any child support? No. So the entire financial burden was on you? Correct. Could you have, could you have um, uh, afforded um, daycare for any of your children? Absolutely not, no. And could you have uh, um, afford any extra expenses other than the ones that you were providing for? No. What type of expenses were you able to provide for this family? Just basic living expenses. Rent? Yes, sir. Uh, utilities? Yes, sir. Um, uh, food? Yes, sir. 
Shanda and her attorney are about to argue that because of the lack of finances coming into the household that she was forced to put locks on the food in the home because Timothy would eat it all. This of course is false as Timothy only began to sneak extra food when they began to purposely starve him. But we can also assess that it's false based on the fact that their abuse of Timothy became an extremely costly endeavor. By the time Timothy died, he was forced to wear a motion sensor on his person that would let out an alarm every time he moved. The closet that they forced him to sleep in was monitored with a motion-activated camera, which Shanda could and would watch while it worked to make sure he didn't move too much. His bathroom also had a camera, and she would flip between them regularly. They also had purchased multiple locks for the kitchen pantry and the refrigerator, and they also bought leg shackles to keep Timothy attached to the wall. His abuse wasn't inexpensive, and her trying to justify it now as being necessary is depraved. You heard the testimony uh, that Timoth Timothy saw the doctor in 2019. Did you hear that? Yes, I did. That was a year before you received him? Two years before I received him. <clears throat> two years before. So in the prior two years before you received him, as far as you know, based on what you heard here, your ex-husband never took him to the doctor? As far as I know, yes, sir. How do you know if he had medical insurance for this young man? He told me he did. Okay. But he never sent it to you? No, sir. Okay. Um, what was your... What was your financial situation once Timothy arrived and your husband had a stroke? After the stroke, we yes. lost my husband's income. Um, and it was <clears throat> paycheck to pay, not even paycheck to paycheck. Almost everything was paid late. Um, I was struggling. I, I asked Paul for help with groceries sometimes because we were struggling. Okay. And Paul was working full time? He was working part time. He was working at, at Applebee's? Yes, sir. Okay. So he's working part time, and so what, were you receiving any child support? No. So the entire financial burden was on you. Correct. Could you have, could you have, um, uh, afforded um, daycare for any of your children? Absolutely not. No. And could you have uh, um, afforded any extra expenses other than the ones that you were providing for? No. What type of expenses were you able to provide for this family? Just basic living expenses. Rent? Yes, sir. Uh, utilities? Yes, sir. Um, uh, food? Yes, sir. Okay, that leads to the next question I have for you. You, you had monitors and, and cameras in your home, is that correct? Yes, sir. And the impression from the, from the testimony I heard is that it was for the purpose, the sole purpose of ensuring that Timothy could not get the food. Was that, is that accurate? No. Why did you have all those monitors and cameras in your home? When Timothy came to live with us, his stepmother informed me that um, they had had motion sensors. Um, they weren't as tech savvy as I was. I worked in tech, before law school, I worked in tech support for several years. Um, but they had motion sensors because, she, and she told me that she didn't sleep at night. She only slept when he was at school because he was into everything. And so, because my, my younger child, he used to, when he was about two, he would take all his clothes off, so we started putting a camera in his room. And then once we moved to the Marshall Road uh, location, it was bi-level. My husband was born with a disability. Um, my husband was wheelchair bound. So he would, we had an extra wheelchair that we kept on the upper level, that's where the master bedroom was. Um, but that way, if, the, if little man, if G was down in his bedroom, my husband could talk to him through the camera and have him come up. It was much easier. My husband could crawl down the steps before the stroke, but he didn't, we didn't want him to have to crawl up and down those steps. Okay. Uh, <coughs> and, and again, let's go back to the issue of food. Was food the only reason why you felt you had to monitor Timothy, or were there other issues? There were plenty of issues, sir. So, well, Take note of how she states that. She is talking about the son that she tortured to death. The son who, when she was forced to look at a picture of what he looked like before he died, she feigned sickness, and yet she could not bring herself to act compassionate when discussing any of the issues he might have been struggling with. That is something that Shanda seems entirely unable to grasp, because to her, his behavior was a nuisance. His motor and sensory issues were seen as annoyances, things that he was doing to piss her off. His incontinence towards the end of his life, due to malnutrition and starvation, that was him being dramatic. Him trying to eat any food he could get his hands on after she had fed him nothing but hot sauce for months, that was him being sneaky. She has absolutely no ability to emphasize with her son and what he could have been thinking and feeling. Well, first of all, the, 
what we've heard some testimony as to uh, Timothy's special needs. What were his special needs? He was on the autism spectrum, but he was completely verbal, and he was grade level in school. He was not behind in school at all. Um, he was diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. He was diagnosed as bipolar and sensory processing disorder. Um, I heard Paul mention physical disability. He didn't have any. Now, Timothy, when he first got there, said that he had a physical disability, and I asked his, his stepmom about it to make sure, and she said, no, he's, he was not coordinated at all. Um, the first summer that he lived with us, my youngest was playing baseball, and Timothy actually mentioned, because we had planned to put him in public high school, I'm gonna try out for the baseball team, and I didn't say anything to him, but I remember thinking, sorry, sweetie, there's no way, you don't have the coordination for that. All right. Uh, and he, he liked uh, to take, well, you tell me, did, did he like to take things apart? Oh, yes, absolutely. Can you He's, give some examples? Um, he took batteries apart, he took toys apart, my, my youngest son's toys. Um, he, if he could get a hold of anything from Paul's room, he would take like, mostly it was Legos, Paul still had Legos. Um, <coughs> he, at one point, um, messed with our water heater. What do you mean? Uh, he actually turned the gas off to the water heater. Um, he, he knocked out the pilot light and then turned the gas off as well at different points. Okay. Were you, did you have any concerns as to whether or not this, his, his predilections, his, his, his desire to get into things, might be a safety hazard for either him or somebody else in the home. Extremely, I was extremely concerned about that, yes sir. So it is, it was your desire to, it was it just your desire to monitor Timothy or did you, did you also have a younger child in the home that you wanted to monitor? Oh, we had both. Okay. Was it, well, who, who did you want to monitor? One or the other or both? Both. Okay. This would make sense. However, that is not what she used it for. Had locks and monitors been in place on where the water heater was or placed on areas that were dangerous for Timothy to get into, that would make sense. But that isn't what happened. Instead, locks were placed on all the places where food was stored because she wanted to punish Timothy for things like not sitting still enough or turning over in his sleep. Cameras were placed in the closet he slept in and in the bathroom to make sure that he was spending hours a day sitting in a cold ice bath or sitting in a stress position that is usually used on prisoners of war. There is literally no rational way to justify what she did, and they are pretending that she did something else. All right. So you set up these these video and audio cameras, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, and alarms on the doors? On Those didn't get installed until about three weeks before he passed away. Okay. And uh, motion sensors? Yes, sir. Okay. He got around the motion sensors multiple times. Shanda once again cannot help herself but to express annoyance at her deceased son. She forced the 15-year-old to live as if he was being held hostage and in his anguish, he would find ways to get around her torture. He would break into the pantry or the freezer and eat whatever he could find. He would get around the motion sensors and try to escape her abuse. And instead of seeing in hindsight that he was trying to get himself any sort of help because she had gone too far, she is annoyed. She's pissed that he was able to do that when she had spent so much of her time, money, and energy trying to punish him. The argument that her lawyers and her are trying to put forth was that she was so extremely traumatized during this time and was so mentally unwell, she could not process what she was doing to Timothy. But since she's been in prison, she has gotten help and is now, according to their argument, mentally well but she is still expressing contempt with the things he did while trying to survive. She still holds the son she murdered in a negative light. And worse still, she expects every member of the jury and the viewing public to agree with her. Were you able to, were you able to stay home and personally monitor your children? No, I had to work full time. Okay. Uh, how were you, were you able to get, specifically, were you able to get Timothy into school? No, we were not. We tried to, to enroll him in Mona Shores High School and um, Mona Shores told me that my ex, I guess Timothy had damaged a Chromebook in Oklahoma, and because my ex owed money on that, they would not send his records up to us. So we were not able to enroll him. So I found an uh, online homeschool curriculum that I had to monitor, but I, I enrolled him in that. Let me make sure I understand. Was it your original intention to put Timothy into public schools? Yes, sir. We okay. started the process. I filled out the paperwork. Um, because of my work schedule, I couldn't actually take paperwork to Mona Shores. My, my husband did that, Adam did that. 
Um, but yes, we did try to, to get him enrolled. Earlier, she stated that she couldn't get Timothy enrolled because of her ex-husband not making her the legal guardian. But now she is stating it was because her former school was withholding the records. Once more, this was still something that could have been easily remedied. She could have used any of the money she had put towards torturing Timothy to pay off his former school. Or she could have called the school and worked with them to resolve the situation. Seeing as she works in the legal sector, she also could have demanded they send over the records, as withholding them hardly seems legal. But for some reason, that seemed to be too much effort. According to Paul, she didn't want Timothy to go to school, or even to be seen by others. She wanted to keep him out of sight, likely because their abuse was so obvious that had he been seen by anyone outside of the family, she would lose custody of the children for a second time. Okay, the youngest child, G, was he in public schools? No, he was homeschooled. What about Paul? Do you know if he was homeschooled or if he, when he got to you, was he still in school? No, he had graduated high school. Okay. All right. Um... Okay. Now, you, you mentioned that you weren't able to stay at home and and uh, uh, care for your children at home, in the home, um, as, as a stay-at-home parent. Is that correct? That's correct. And um, <clears throat> what what type of, I assume you're in the, out working? Yes, sir. Okay. Ex explain to, to the jury the work that you did during the period of time that Timothy arrived in your home. I was... When, when he first arrived, I was still studying for the bar exam, so my husband was working full time, um, and I was just doing, uh, I, I trained dogs on the side, everything from basic obedience up through different types of service dogs for other people, and so I had a couple of dog training clients, but mostly I was studying for the bar exam. I also was an intern here in this courthouse. That, that paid a lot of money? Oh, it was, it was not paid at all, sir. Okay. Um, but uh, it was... The week of the bar exam, um, my actually my, my judge that I worked for here as a law clerk informed me of this position that was open in Nuevo County, and she knew that the judge referred me, and that's when I did the interview, and, and I started work, I think it was three days, two days after I completed the bar exam. Okay. Was that a paid position? Yes, it was. Was, was it lucrative enough where you didn't have to do any other work? Um, well, with my husband's income, it was. Okay. But your husband's income stopped when he when he got sick. When he had the stroke, yes. Okay. So at that point, was it enough income to provide for you and your family? No. Were you receiving any other outside income? <clears throat> um, my um, older brother lives in the home that I, used to, that I still own in Oklahoma, and he paid rent to us. Okay. But it wasn't a lot. It was That went towards our house rent. Child support? No. My, my ex, one of the siblings was forgotten yesterday. Um, I, there's five total. We talked about the four boys. I also have a daughter. Um, she is now 19, but she stayed down with her dad. Okay. So we each had one, so there was no, um, there was no child support. And because of child support on the, the other four kids, I actually was still paying my ex child support. It was still being deducted from my check. Okay. So you had that. That's another deduction from your income. Thousand dollars a month. Yes, okay. sir. Okay. So. Um, Were you also doing tutoring when you went to the judge who was paying you? Were you still tutoring or doing any other outside work? Not at that. I was doing the dog training. Okay. Let, let me ask you this. What time in the morning did you leave to go to work? Um, I usually left the house about 6.30. And what time, on average, were you getting home? About 6 o'clock. Okay. So we're talking about 12 hours away from the home. Yes, sir. Okay. Those, those, those monitors, um, uh, the video cameras in your home. You were able to, or to re, to view them while at work from my phone occasionally, yes, sir. Okay. Um, and you, were, but you were still working. Yes, sir. I didn't view them at all until after the stroke. I mean, because my husband was there, or we had we had arrangements where my husband was off certain days of the week, Paul was off one day, specifically one day a week, so he took care of of Gabriel and Timothy, and then. Um, the other two days that I need to care for Gabriel when my husband was working, he actually went to my in-law's house down in West Olive. May I approach the witness for just a moment, John? You may. Uh, let's see. You, you have, so you have three children at home. Yes, sir. Okay. And my understanding is you, you, you faced other challenges personally in terms of your own personal health. Yes, sir, I did. Okay. 
Uh, for instance, let, let's run down the list. You have insomnia. Severe insomnia caused by attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Okay. And, and uh, for those folks who, who get a great night's sleep every night, don't understand <clears throat> what insomnia does to, to your ability to function, can you explain to them what impact chronic insomnia has on a person? It limits your ability to think clearly. Um, your energy level is, is greatly reduced. Um, takes a lot longer to process things. Um, you forget things easier. Uh, it, was just, it was much harder to function with, with so little sleep. Again, pay special attention to how hard she says things were for her due to the stress she was going through and her ailments. Now imagine dealing with ADHD, autism, and motor issues, being shackled to a wall, forced to take ice baths, and starved to the point of not being able to stand. But she was the one who deserves empathy and understanding. Shanda might be the least self-aware person we have ever covered, and we have covered a man who, while on trial for his mother's murder, claimed two men killed her in front of him, then called the men gentlemen in his testimony. Okay. And you talked about your other, your other personal disorders. Were you seeking medications for those? Um, I was for, um, I had, I have severe attention deficit hyperactivity disorder combined type. Um, I also have sensory processing disorder and OCD. Um, and then after my husband's stroke, as a result of my husband's stroke, because I viewed him, I, I, I wasn't in the room when he had the stroke, but I, it was, I was there right afterwards. And so I developed post-traumatic stress disorder with disassociation from that. The only medication that I was on was for the ADHD. Okay. Uh and you had you had the service dogs in your presence to. I had one service dog for me. Yes. Okay. Sir. Um, what source of medical? What source of interventions were available for for Timothy's disorders? Um, when he came to us, he was on medication. He was on. They gave us a whole like large gallon size Ziploc bag of medications for him. Um, I could not refill them because I could not get him to the doctor. Um, we were going to try to adjust his medication because when he came to live with us. When he took his medicine, he was a zombie. It was, it was just horrific. Um, and when Paul came to live with us, because Paul had only been there a year when Timothy moved down, or moved up, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, and when Paul, he was on the same big bag of medication, um, and there were serious concerns that they just, instead of handling, especially my ex, he wanted to medicate them. But I never got that option because I couldn't take him to the doctor. She's sitting on the stand for her son's brutal torture and murder, and she is attempting to condemn her ex-husband for medicating the son she killed. She is saying that he was over-medicating Timothy, and that the state he was in when he came to live with her was so horrific. Meanwhile, she killed him. Maybe Timothy was over-medicated. Maybe he hadn't found the right dose, and what Eric had him on was too much. But the audacity for her to say that, when she is the reason he's dead, is outrageous. Okay. All right. Um... There's been uh, some allegation, let's get, there's some implication, let's put it that way, that you uh, tried to keep people from seeing Timothy, that you tried to keep him away from public view, that he didn't go to school, he didn't go to the doctor, et cetera. Then he went to, he went outside, he was in the backyard. Do you remember that testimony? Yes, sir. Uh, from, if, if someone's outside in your backyard, is he, are there trees or fences or other obstacles to keep the neighbors from looking over there? and seeing uh, who's out in your yard? No, there was a clearing before, there was, there was woods at the back of the lot, but there was a clearing, and at least the neighbors on each side, they, there were pretty sizable windows on the back of their homes. Mm -hmm. um, they weren't in the, I think the next door was a two level, but the one on one side was just a, a single level, it may have had a basement, I don't know. Um, but there was big windows, and they could see into our backyard easily. Okay. Um, was it ever your intention to keep people from seeing Timothy? No, my mother-in-law saw him, we had a, they do rental home inspections, I guess, the city of Norton Shores. Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember if it was late April or early May of 2022, but it was in that neighborhood. And so we'd had the inspection that day, and my mother-in-law happened to stop by that day. And I invited her in. We, we sat and talked, and Timothy wanted to come say hi, so he, he came up and said hi to her. Um, now, you're, you're a uh, Muskegon County transplant, correct? You're, you're, yes, I'm not okay. from around here. So, and where's... And I'm assuming that your 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 bot your direct biological family there's not a lot of them in this county. There's no bi I don't have other than my children I don't have any biological father biological family here. Okay, how far away are they? Uh, my older brother is in Oklahoma City, and then I have two sisters that I have not talked to in over 20 years, and they live in Alabama, where I'm from. Okay, 
So how, how often do those folks, your bio family, stop by and to see how sister's doing? Um, the last time I saw my older brother was when we all, we went down to North Carolina for my oldest son's wedding in October of 2021. And then my, my brother and sister-in-law drove over from Oklahoma for the wedding as well. We FaceTimed a lot. We watched football games on FaceTime, but um, I didn't get to see them after we moved up here. Okay. Do you have a lot of friends in the area that will come by, will stop by, on, uh, maybe on, does it happen to be in the area, that sort of thing, that will come by and, and, and visit your home? Most of my friends were from work, and they actually, because I worked in Nuego County, they lived in Nuego or Oceana County, or even further, I don't know, I'm not from here, I don't know what county is next to Nuego East, um, but I know at least one person from work lived in, I think it's Big Rapids. Yes. Um, so no, they didn't stop by because they were too far away. Did you have a lot of time for social interactions at your home? No, not at all. And how about Paul? Did he have friends that he'd bring by? Or? No, he talked about people at work, but he never asked to bring anybody over. Did, were there any, was he ever given any instructions? You can't have people in this house? Absolutely not. And what about uh, the youngest child, G? Did he have any friends that, for sleepovers or anything like that? We didn't have any friends over for, no. Um, he had, he played baseball. Um, because of me not being able to get out, he didn't get out a lot. I mean, I wish I could have gotten him out more. That's why we put him in baseball, so he could get around other kids more. Um, I had been looking into homeschool co-ops, but with my schedule, I just couldn't do that. Okay. What, in your opinion, what which would you say was more impactful in terms of your, you know, get Timothy out of the house? Was it, was it your desire he not get out of the house or your work requirements? Um, it was work requirements and his choice. Um, there was... I want to say it was April. The weather was halfway decent. I guess people here were, I mean, there was kids down the street. There was teenagers playing basketball when I came home from the grocery store one weekend. Mm -hmm. And I, I stopped and rolled my window down and said, hey, I've got a 15-year-old at home. Can he come play with y'all? Even though I knew he wasn't coordinated, I, knew he, I thought he would enjoy it. And they said, yeah, sure, absolutely. And he <coughs> did not want to go play. Okay. Did he ever request to go play? And you denied him? No, no, he never did. Actually, Paul, we had, um, mom and dad, my, my in-laws, got Timothy a bike for his 15th birthday. And Paul and he, we were on a cul-de-sac. And um, Paul had tried to teach him to ride the bike. Um, okay. I know, I know they had a few sessions. I don't know how many. Okay. So those, on those occasions, he'd be outside Oh, in yeah, the front he was out house. in the cul in front of the house on the cul-de-sac. Okay. All right. Let's talk about some of the things that have come up in this case. Uh, there, there were, uh, okay, there, there are leg irons discovered in your home. Were you aware of those? I, I was aware that Paul had them. Um, you actually could look on my Amazon. Paul had the option to do payment on the Amazon as well as mine. Uh -huh. And Paul had actually ordered those under his, his account. This is a stupid thing to lie about. She had instructed Paul to buy them, and she would repeatedly make reference to them in their text messages saying how she had shackled Timothy to the wall multiple times. It's not as if she is unaware they have this information either. It was discussed before she testified. More importantly, she also claimed that she had to rely on Paul's income as well as her own due to financial strife, meaning it's just as likely that she was the one who made the purchase. Okay, you did not order the leg irons? I did not, no. Did you, did you ever use them? No, sir. No, uh, I never instructed. Let's be in specific. Did you ever use them with Timothy? No, sir. Okay. Uh, did you ever notice any uh, bruising on Timothy's wrists or legs uh, that might be attributable to the use of leg iron? No, sir. I never saw anything like that. Uh, you heard Paul talk about plastic ties. W what was that about? I honestly don't remember. Okay. Um, I, I don't know why we would order. I mean, I saw the ties. I don't, I don't remember ordering them. Okay. I don't know what happened there. You're going to say I don't remember a lot, aren't you? Unfortunately, yes, because of the dissociation. Okay. Explain to, explain to the jury what that means. Um, well, there, I guess there's different forms. Somebody told me this. I did not find out about the PTSD and the dis disassociation until about seven months after my husband's stroke, even though it had been going on since the stroke. I need to place an objection on the record, and I think we're going to have to excuse the jury. Continue. Uh, Mr. Johnson. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ms. Van Ark, uh, you, you, you've, you've told the jury about how busy you are, and you told the jury... That, that you have some, some physical things going on with you, correct? Yes, sir. How did those things impact you in terms of, of your, your, your 
the, your ability to think clearly, organize, and uh, follow through on information. Starting right after my husband's stroke, um, I started experiencing episodes where if you've ever passed out, like the world closed, you get tunnel vision and the world closes in on you until you, you completely black out. It felt like I was blacking out, but I didn't actually pass out. Um, and the events that happened after that, I have no idea of what happened. I don't remember it. I, I don't know. It might surprise you to learn that this is a lie. According to multiple experts who examined Shanda, she did not experience depersonalization, disassociation, or any episodes like the one she is describing. But it's obvious why this lie was put forth. Because saying you experienced blackouts in your memory whenever you abused your son is definitely preferable to saying you abused him because you thought it was fun. Okay. And this happened anytime I got even a little stressed. This so, happened. so you're understanding, you're under oath right now, correct? Yes, sir. And you're asked to tell the truth right now? Yes, sir. Okay. So we're, we're asking you that you not fill in, not guess at anything? Correct. That, okay. Do you understand that? Yes, sir. So it is, if you don't understand, we need to say, you don't, or you don't remember, we need to say those things. Correct. Okay. Um, and, and you did, you did testify that these symptoms and this pressure impacted your recollections. Is that Absolutely, yes. And then there's the, the final pressure. You, you're, you're raising children and, and teenage children, uh, some of them, in your home at the same yes. time. So all these things are going on at once. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Um, while you're at work monitoring, and you've got the ability to monitor the home, uh, would your job permit you? Did you have the ability to sit in front of a monitor and watch the home all the time? Or did, were there times that you could not do that? Most of the time I couldn't do it. And why is that? Because I had work to do. Um, we were, part of the time I was in court with my judge, um, and then most of the time I was doing research or doing other tasks that my judge or one of the other judges in the county assigned. So I didn't, I didn't have time to do that. Uh, you're, when, when you're watching the videos on the phone, you said you watched them with your, your telephone screen, correct? Correct. And it is a standard screen, nothing special about it? It was an iPhone, I think it was a 12. Okay. Um, I've seen those video cameras where they were systems where they, you can have four <clears throat> different cameras going all at one time, all the same screen. Was that your situation, or did you move from camera to camera and only have that camera visible? No, the cameras were different brands and different cameras, so you could only do one at a time. Okay, all right. So, and were you wearing an iWatch as well? An Apple Watch, yes. Apple Watch, Apple Watch. thank you. Uh, were you able to monitor your children uh, from the Apple Watch? No. Okay. Uh, so. If you, were, if you were, say, in a courtroom like this and you're doing your job, you got a message on your Apple Watch, would you, what would you get? Um, I, you could get messages and pictures. You couldn't see it. I mean, the screen was tiny. Um, but you could get messages, and then there's certain, like, pat responses, like pre-programmed responses, or you can type with your finger. Okay. I'm going to ask you about a specific uh, email or text that you received uh, that accompanied a picture. Uh, is, is the one that the prosecutors given to, to, the, to the jury where that shows Timothy uh, from the chest up and then his legs. You know what I'm talking about? I have heard about it. I have not actually seen these pictures. How could well, you respond to it? How's it come from that be? I typed on my, we were in court that day. Uh -huh. I actually think I responded. I'm in court. Um, I scribbled out a message real quick. To, back okay. to Paul. <clears throat> so, just so we are up to speed, she is saying that whenever Timothy was being abused, which was all the time, or simply whenever she experienced any sort of stress, she would black out. She has no recollection of anything, at all, that would have happened when she was stressed, because she had PTSD. That isn't exactly how PTSD works at all, but that's what she's arguing. Alongside that, when she got damning evidence sent to her in the form of a picture of Timothy when he would have been below 70 pounds from Paul, where he directly stated that they needed to start feeding him or he would die, she didn't exactly see it because she only saw it on her Apple Watch, which is complete and utter nonsense. She is saying she didn't see it except for when she saw it and acknowledged it, but also that she remembers seeing a picture of her emaciated, malnourished son. And that didn't make her stressed to the point of forgetting. These are excuses a child would make because they disobeyed their parents. But she believes this will be enough to either convince the jury of her innocence, grant her a mistrial, or that she will be let off on a lesser offense. So, you, you, did you see the photograph afterwards? No, I had too many messages on my phone. I don't usually scroll back. Okay. So how did you know to respond to, to, to Paul to say, give him some food? 
Because of what he said. He had sent a message saying something. Okay. So, you were able to see the message. Yes, I saw, I saw the message. And the, the picture, I mean, it's this big, but there was pictures. I just couldn't see what it was of. Okay. Let's, and I, I deviated again. I tend to do that. Sorry about that. I need to be more organized, and we'll get there. Um, we talked about the leg irons. We talked about the plastic ties. And Did you purchase those plastic ties? I don't remember, honestly. Okay. Uh, what about the hot sauce? Talk, tell this jury about hot sauce and your son, Timothy. My, my under, well, I'm not going to ask you, tell you my understanding because you don't need to know that. The question is, whose idea was it to, to get hot sauce and to administer it to your son? The idea was originally Paul's. This could be true, but the reason that most people don't believe that it was Paul's idea is because out of the two of them, he is clearly not the mastermind. He is not a dominant or strong personality, and even while he was testifying, he was worriedly looking over to his disapproving mother. It is, of course, entirely possible that he did suggest they use hot sauce on Timothy, but it's also apparent he was not the one in directing the abuse as it was taking place. Okay. And what was the, what was the point of the hot sauce? Um, because we had tried multiple other discipline methods, and he thought maybe that would get him to stop misbehaving. Okay. He suggested it to me, and I, at that, I was so wrung out, I was willing to try just about anything. All right. Were you aware of how, that this, were you aware that this hot sauce was purchased online? Yes. Do you know why it was purchased online instead of going to Meyer and, and picking up a bottle of hot sauce? Well, I didn't go, I didn't have time to go to the store. I mean, our groceries were, I did the grocery delivery through okay. the Walmart app or through the Meyer app. Um, so, and I didn't see anything um, they just had basic stuff, and from our discussion, we had talked about something. And Timothy could handle this child. When I got well, pregnant, I, I, okay. I know you're going. You're gonna, hold on a second. Okay. Sorry. I, I, I want to make sure we understand this. Th this this hot sauce has a, has a particular label. I, I've never seen it Meyer. Did you did you see the label? Did you see the, the hot sauce itself? Did you what what did you did you order it? I believe I ordered at least one of the bottles. Yes. Okay. Why did you order this particular hot sauce? Or these particular hot sauces? What did they have in common? Um, because, I think it was the same brand, um, the same one. Um, because it was hotter than what you could usually get and because Timothy could, he liked spicy food. Okay. He loved spicy food. Think about what she just said. She said that Paul suggested that they use hot sauce on Timothy as a punishment. Timothy misbehaved so much that they had tried to punish him in every other conceivable way. That finally, Paul suggested that they should give him hot sauce and see if that would work. Eating hot sauce in this case would be a negative thing. It was them disciplining Timothy. And yet, she follows that up with saying that Timothy loved spicy food, that he was obsessed with it, which makes no sense. If you have a child who is misbehaving who loves sugar, you don't punish them by giving them a Snickers bar every time they do something wrong. You take away something that they like, or you give them something that they don't like, because you don't want them to repeat that behavior. Paul and Shanda forced Timothy to eat ridiculously spicy hot sauce. When he was allowed to eat, which was rare, he was only allowed to eat slices of bread with hot sauce smothered on it. And only if he could keep the bread down was he allowed to eat a normal slice of bread with butter on it. This was obviously not something that he liked, but something that they did as a punishment, or because it brought both of them some kind of sadistic pleasure. All right. Uh, how, how do you know you like spicy food? That actually started before he was ever born. Um, before I got pregnant with Timothy, I didn't like spicy at all. I mean, I nothing, no heat, nothing. And when I got pregnant with him, I started craving, um, my ex liked spicy foods, but I didn't. And I started craving, like I would outspice my, my ex. Um, it was amazing. Um, I still like, I, not to the extent when I was pregnant, but it, that some of that remained. But Timothy, as early as age two, he could eat a whole bag of the flaming hot Cheetos without a drink. I mean, just he could down, he, he loved spicy food. It was okay. it used to scare the heck out of me. But you were aware that this, these spices were, were hotter than what you yes. admire. Yes. Yes. And and that it was for disciplinary issues. Is that yes. correct? Did you ever? Uh, the, the testimony was that you did child care while uh, Paul was at school or at work. Did you ever administer any of the hot sauce yourself? If I remember, I might have have done some on bread a couple of times. Okay. Um, but usually by the time I got home, um, that either we were cooking food, I, I had to cook, or I had had Paul cook something so I could feed everybody. 
Um, but I don't recall, I, I think I did it on bread once or twice maybe, but that was it. There's a text out there that says, you suggested putting hot sauce on his penis. Do you remember hearing that? With the I remember hearing it, yes. Do you remember saying those things? I do not, no sir. Again, Shanda thought she made the absolute best excuse in the book. Sure, there was direct evidence showing she took pleasure thinking up new sadistic ways to torture her underage son, including thinking about burning his genitals. But that was just because she was so stressed, and when she was stressed, she would black out. So it really wasn't her fault. Sure, she directed a months-long campaign of abuse and torture of her son that led to his death. But she doesn't remember, so it's okay. Oh yeah, um, we talked. We talked about the ice baths. I'm like, some talk cold baths, and sometimes they were called ice baths. Do you remember that testimony? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, the the source of the ice, according to the testimony I heard, was your home refrigerator. No, it was actually a countertop ice maker. The it, refrigerator did not have an ice maker in it. Okay, and you didn't go on buy the, the fifty pound bags of ice for the home. No, I did not. How much ice are we talking about for that 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 tabletop ice maker? It actually made about a cup and a half of ice. I had to measure it to use it for, I made some frappes at times. Okay. Um, the basket was maybe this wide, and then underneath was the water, um, where the water was kept, because that's how it made the ice. Okay. And then it took about two hours to remake more ice. Okay. Basically, this is a defense's way of saying that her instructing Paul to force his brother to sit in a bathtub for nearly nine hours a day wasn't really that bad, because he only had to sit in a cup or two of ice, which might not be that bad for someone who is a normal height and weight, but Timothy was 60 pounds when he died of malnourishment and hypothermia. It was torture. You admit getting frustrated with uh, your child care efforts with Timothy, is that correct? Yes, sir. Um, frustrated, discouraged. Did you ever intend to hurt him? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. You, you raised other children, correct? Yes, I did. And uh, while Timmy was malnourished, do you, to your knowledge, have any of your other children ever been reported as malnourished? No, not at all. I, as I looked at Paul, he seemed uh, like a thin guy to me. He is. That's, we're all pretty small. Well, okay. other, my oldest is a little bit thicker. Okay. My, my question is this. Is, it, was Timothy's, when he was healthy, was his build like his brother's, or was, is he, was he built like his older brother, <coughs> who's a little heavier? He went back and forth. Um, he actually, there was an, um, a situation where he actually got on the, the bathroom scale in, it was after Mother's Day of 2022. Um, I can tell you why I know it's after Mother's Day if you want me to. No, that's not necessary. Okay. But um, I, was, I, I was training a new service dog, as has been discussed, he's a great Dane puppy. He was seven months old at the time, and he was too big to sit on the bathroom scale to get his weight, and I wanted to see what he weighed. And Timothy, what we would do is somebody would stand on the scale, get your weight, and then you pick up the dog. And Timothy wanted to help out that day. Um, so I, I thought the dog would be too big for him at that point. He was already really big at seven months old. But uh, I said, okay, let's try it. And so it was, like I said, sometime after Mother's Day. It wasn't very long after Mother's Day. But at the time, he was 104. Timothy was. Okay. Um, he could not pick up the dog because the dog was 102 at the time. Okay. <coughs> Part of this process of providing child care, mm -hmm. somebody had to be the eyes in the house when you weren't there. Is that correct? Yes. And you selected Paul for that purpose. I didn't have a choice. That was my only option. How much did you rely upon what Paul was telling you? I totally relied on him. Do you remember the, the uh, during the reading of the uh, uh, transcripts, the, the text, that you asked Paul? Matter of fact, let me. Be honest with me. Are you worried about him at all? Or is it all a bunch of BS? Like it has been for days. Do you remember that? Do you remember that text? Um, vaguely, yes, sir. Okay. Do you remember his response? I remember he said he wasn't worried about it. Did you rely on that? Yes, absolutely. Mm. He was the one. I was. I was at home so few hours when the kids were awake, unfortunately. And then you had to sleep. Try to sleep yourself. I tried, yes, sir. And they slept better than I did. Let's let's face it. Your house is a mess. It's a wreck. Yes, sir. Why was that? 
I'm honestly, I'm not a great person at keeping things clean and having three boys that contributed. Um, I tried to, to get help, their help cleaning up as much as I could, but I just didn't have time or the energy with the lack of sleep and everything else going on. I, I barely functioned. Okay. And um, that, that, e that message I, well, strike that, I need that. Did you depend, uh, I asked you, did you depend on what Paul was telling you? Yes, sir. Did your, in your opinion, did Paul ever, for lack of a better term, sound the alarm? Not I mean, that I was aware of, no, sir. Okay. Do you, that one message, was, Just, was that it? That was it. That's the only thing I got from Paul that ever had any concern. With the one little picture's in it? Correct? Yes, sir. Okay. To be clear, Paul is just as responsible as Shanda. He could have saved Timothy's life, and his choices directly led to his brother's death. But Paul didn't need to raise an alarm to Shanda. She is not an idiot. She knows that if you don't feed someone, force them to run up and down the stairs of your home for hours, then place them in the freezing cold bath, that that would lead to their eventual death. She knew that forcing him to sleep in the closet, locking the food up and away from him, and making him do manual labor naked wasn't something that she would find in a parenting handbook. She knew that what she was doing was wrong, and she didn't need to be told by her son that it was. And it's, okay, let's talk about some of the stuff here. Um, once, once you discovered that, that Timothy had passed, uh, and once the police get there, do you tell them the truth? I was so freaked out, I was, I'm sorry. I've got one. I'm sorry. Thank you. You're welcome. Why didn't you tell me the truth? Why were you so free? I don't remember what my line of thinking was at the time. I was so tired. I, I don't. I don't know. I wish I had an answer for you, but I don't. Were you tired at that point? I was exhausted. I, the night before he passed, I had had less than an hour of sleep. The night before he passed, I had less than an hour of sleep. Even in his death, even after they murdered him, she can only think about herself. She has no empathy for his life, or what she put him through, and how she affected him. His death is an inconvenience to her, and she frames it as such. To make it even more clear, she is trying to state that the only reason she lied was because she was tired, not because she was cognizant of the fact that she had done something wrong. As mentioned previously, before the cops were even called to the home, nearly 20 minutes had gone by since Shanda and Paul discovered Timothy's body. Paul tried to resuscitate his brother, but when they realized he was too far gone, Shanda and Paul carried him over to one of the beds in the basement, dressed his nearly naked body up, and tried to stage the scene as if he had died in his sleep. She then instructed Paul to claim that in the two weeks leading up to his death, he had been on a hunger strike. Timothy had only been wearing a diaper when he died of malnourishment and hypothermia, and she believed that all she had to do was tell the responding officers that he had been on a hunger strike, but otherwise, he had been alright before he died. Whenever someone tries to argue diminished capacity, which Shanda is clearly trying to imply here, the topic of what the guilty party did immediately after the murder is always brought up, because in most cases, it shows that they did know right from wrong. If Shanda believed what she had done to Timothy was justified, she would have justified it. She would have told the police the truth, said that she believed in a more rigid set of disciplinary measures, and would have told them that she forced Timothy to sleep on a tarp in a closet. But she didn't do that. She went to great lengths to hide what had happened, instructed Paul to lie, and hid evidence to try and make it appear as if they hadn't been brutally torturing him for months. It also bears repeating that if she, quote, blacks out every time she is stressed, unquote, then she shouldn't be able to remember anything from the night her son died, unless she wasn't stressed when that happened. Or, you know, she's lying. Are you frightened at that point? Absolutely. I just lost my son. She didn't lose her son, she killed him. She tortured him over the span of months. This was not an easy or simple death. She took pleasure in hurting him, forcing him to work well beyond his limits, and pretending it was for his benefit. And her attempting to cry now doesn't change that fact. Um, were you expecting? Were you, were you, was this, some, this outcome expected by you? Absolutely not. No. So would it be safe to say you were surprised? I was shocked. Were you in disbelief initially? Yes, absolutely. Um, you've got a, 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 a there's there's an indication that it took you a while to call the police. In fact, you told you told uh, 
uh, Paul not to according to Paul's testimony. Why did it take you so long? He said 18 minutes out. Why did it take you so long to call the police? I have no idea, honestly. It was, I was, I'm trying to figure out how to describe it. It was, it was surreal. Like, you're not even, you don't even know what's going on. It was, you just, time slowed down and I didn't know what was going on. When was the first time you found out it took 18 minutes to call the police? Um, was it yesterday or the day before? Um, yeah, it was it, within the last few days. Okay. That's the first time. Do you remember who was testifying when you found out? Um, it doesn't matter. Right. I think we discussed it at a meeting on Monday. Um, was it Monday? Okay. I think it so. Um, but And I heard 14 minutes initially, and then the first time I heard 18 minutes was when Paul said it okay. yesterday. Um, do you remember? <clears throat> How clear is your memory of the of the of your time and from the time you found uh, Timothy and and he had passed and the t to the time you finished talking to the police that day? It's spotty. Okay. Uh, the 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 first officer said that uh, 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 you were distraught. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. Assessment? Uh, he said that you were crying. Do you agree with that? Yes, sir. Do you remember telling the police that you that uh, uh, you pulled Timothy from his bunk bed when you found him in distress? I remember saying something like that, yes, sir. Was that true? No, sir. Do you remember uh, providing CPR for Timothy? Yes, I do. When, when did you stop that? Um, when the pro-med people walked down into the basement. I, I, um, I had asked them to take over, and they didn't take over right away, but they said I had to, to leave the area. Okay. Let's do the hard stuff here. Uh, jury's seen pictures of Timothy. We've all seen pictures of Timothy at the time of his death. How could you not know he was that ill? How could you not know? Honestly, I just, I was barely functioning. I missed a lot. There's, I mean, I hate it because, I mean, I feel like a complete failure, but there was things that I just didn't see. There was a lot that I didn't see. Let's discuss things that she saw. She saw him running up and down the stairs and ordered his older brother to chase him to make sure he was running fast enough. She saw him doing wall sits in the closet for hours, monitoring him on the cameras she had set up while she was at work. And if he passed out or didn't do them right, she would punish him. She watched and timed him as he went to the bathroom, keeping a motion-sensing camera in the room at all times. She saw him take ice baths, and if he ever seemed too comfortable in the tub, she would instruct Paul to move him and make sure he wasn't enjoying himself. She saw him become incontinent, unable to control his bowel movements due to malnourishment. She saw all of this, and she acknowledges all of it. She just doesn't want to take responsibility for it. It is quite sincerely that simple. At this point in the testimony, she still believes that what she is saying is completely understandable. Unfortunately. Those, on those, in those texts, you, you instruct Paul to make sure he's getting enough calories, correct? Yes, sir. I did. You had a restricted diet, correct? Yes, sir. But you instructed Paul to make sure he's getting calories. Yes, sir, I did. Did you rely on that? Absolutely. Um, Paul says he called the police Ultimately, who called the police? I called 911. It was on my phone. I'm sure you can pull the call and find out where it's from. Did you intend to hurt Timothy? No, never. Did you, did you know he was being hurt? No, I didn't, unfortunately. The, the, the tactics that you use First of all, we're, we're, the tactics well, the tactics that you use to, to discipline Timothy, did they seem extreme or outrageous to you at the time? No. Um, do you re Timothy remained in, you'll admit it was, it, the, the bath was not warm on the day he died. It was a cold bath. Correct, the day okay. before. It wasn't an ice bath, though, correct? I wasn't, um, I 
from the text, it looks like he did, but I, that wasn't the, what was said to do. Okay. Paul chose to do the ice on his own, if you look at the text. Okay. So, <coughs> do you, there's testimony that you remained in that tub for hours. Were you aware of that? No, I, I didn't realize he was in the tub, no. When you came home, you didn't realize he was in the tub? You I did. When I got home, I actually ran him a warm bath when I got home. Okay. Where? In the tub, downstairs. Okay. So, once you found him in the tub, you, what did you, explain the dream you're talking about. Um, well, I, I had to get Paul to work, and then I came home, and um, my understanding, at least, was that when Paul had splashed water, he had splashed it on his face only. That's what I understood. Um, so I didn't realize he was still there. Um, and so when, he, when he, I got home, I was like, wait a second, what the? So I, I decided to go ahead and run a warm bath just to... to there's, there's a bunch of stuff in there talk about make sure he doesn't sleep, make sure he doesn't sleep. What's that about? Um, there was a couple of situations where he actually, Timothy actually intentionally kept everybody in the house awake. Um, he would intentionally set off the motion sensors. Um, he would make noise. Um, with the house being a bi-level, you could hear a lot from the downstairs. Um, but he intentionally kept everybody awake. No, he didn't. Shanda, you forced a person to wear a motion sensor at all times. You forced him to sleep on the cold, hard ground and never gave him food. If he moved at all, even if he was just adjusting while sleeping, the alarm would go off, waking up everyone in the home. No one more than him. But again, she has no consideration for that. She cannot have any empathy for her deceased son, because to do so would say that she did something wrong. So instead of looking at the situation and saying that maybe he wasn't intentionally keeping everyone up by setting off the motion sensor because it's crazy that he was forced to wear one in the first place, she has to say that he set it off on purpose. He was truly the evil one, tormenting her by not accepting the abuse correctly. She was the one being tortured, because why couldn't he just sleep on the cold floor and not move the way she wanted him to? Okay, if you're going to keep us awake, then you have to stay awake. Okay, so here, here's, the, here's my question. If he slept all day, what would he do all night? Oh, he'd be up all night. There's no, he had to, you had to get him up no later than about 10 in the morning or he was, he was up all night long. Okay. Uh, there's, there's a door that has a, a, a dent in it that we saw an exhibit of, okay? Um, and, and you heard Paul testify that he, he did that. Yes. What is your recollection of that incident? Um, I, what I remember is I, hear, I remember hearing Paul yell from his room, because his room was directly below the master bedroom. Um, and then I pulled up the, I wasn't asleep, um, so I pulled up the, the main camera in the, the basement area, and I see Paul come out and kick that door. And I, I went to hit the button. He was screaming at Timothy while it happened. And I hit the, the um, two-way talk button on the camera and said, hey, what the heck, go back to bed. And I actually had to physically go downstairs and get him away from the door and, and send him to bed. Was the, in the text on occasion, Paul would have uh, say things that suggest aggressions <clears throat> towards Timothy on occasion. Was that, did you know any other circumstances other than what's in the, those, those situations in the text? Oh, absolutely. Paul was, he never displayed that towards my youngest. He never displayed that towards my husband when he was still at home or myself. Um, he would get aggressive when he was playing games. He would get really angry. He had some serious anger, anger issues. Um, and then when Timothy moved up, and Timothy did push his buttons some, but he just, he never reacted well. I mean, he just overreacted to Timothy every time. It was, he hardly ever reacted rationally to Timothy. Then why the fuck did you put him in charge of Timothy? You were the parent. You were the one responsible. If you cannot take care of the child, if you cannot mentally or financially handle being a parent, or even taking on the care of an autistic teenager, then don't. Even if what she is saying is true, she would still be responsible. She wouldn't have put her son, who she knew hated his brother, in the care of that same brother. She had other options. She just wanted to abuse Timothy because it was fun for her. And so, uh, other than what he was texting you, and other than what you could see when you weren't working at, the, at, the, at your job, uh, you don't have first-hand information as to what's going on between Paul and Timothy. Is that correct? No, I, would, I asked my little guy occasionally, okay. um, but Timothy never told me anything that was going on. Okay. So um, I did, I mean, I asked just because I, I if, if I 
had texted Paul and he seemed upset, um, then I would get home and, hey, is everything okay? Um, and my, my little guy, um, honestly, I don't remember him ever saying that there was, there was an issue. He said, yeah, Paul got mad, but that was it. He never said anything happened. Okay. <clears throat> One moment. What was your intent when you would administer punishments to Timothy? To get him to behave. Was it ever your intent to harm him? No, absolutely not. No, I, the, the, uh, the locks on the fridge and freezer, they're actually, he, that was, he scared the heck out of me after my husband's stroke. And that's what brought those two on. Okay. Uh, I can tell you what happened. What was the incident, and then I got a what was the incident that caused you to put locks on the fridge? Um, I had just purchased a two pound bag of frozen chicken nuggets and put it in the freezer. Um, and overnight, I guess he got a around the motion sensors. Um, but the next day, it was a weekend, and the next day I went to, um, little man asked for, for some chicken nuggets. And I went to get them and the, the bag was empty in the freezer. And I was like, what? I mean, we hadn't touched it. And so I started asking, and at first Timothy lied to me. He said he didn't touch it. Um, and then I went and checked with little man and with Paul, and nobody had touched the, so I went back because I had issues with both Paul and Timothy lying to me a lot. Um, so I went back to Timothy. I said, somebody, nobody else has touched this. He said, I ate them. I said, okay, did you cook them? He said, no, he ate the whole two pound bag frozen, okay. uncooked chicken. All right, were you concerned about his health and getting into and eating frozen food? Yes, and um, he ate, um, there was a time where he ate uncooked bacon out of the fridge before the chicken nugget incident. He ate a whole pound of uncooked ground beef at one point. Um, this was all after the stroke when there was less people to keep an eye on. Did it occur to you he's doing those things because he's hungry, he's starving? No, he, I mean, he, there was plenty of food. We were, there was no issues. He never told me he was hungry at the time when these incidents happened. And he did that because he was starving. If the motion sensors were already littered around the home, they would have already begun restricting Timothy's food. That boy was so hungry that the moment he was able to find food, even if it was already frozen, he ate all of it. It wasn't about taste, or disrespecting the rules or Shanda. It was about staying alive. He was so hungry that all he could think about was how to get food. And instead of being concerned about why he had eaten two pounds of frozen chicken nuggets, and if that was a sign that he was being underfed, she restricted his eating even further forcing him to only eat hot sauce at random, inconsistent intervals. Her stating that he never told her he was hungry is probably true, but there's a very good reason as to why that probably was. If you were Timothy, and every time you eat something in the home, you were being punished or abused, why would you then tell the person who was abusing you that you were hungry? You wouldn't. Moreover, how was Timothy supposed to trust Shanda at all? She had taken away his bed, his schooling, forced him to sleep with a motion sensor on, and would ridicule him day in and day out. According to the camera that she kept in the closet where he slept, the last thing she did was make fun of him for breathing with his mouth open, and called him a dummy. He could not trust that if he told her he was hungry, she wouldn't punish him or hurt him further. So he probably never said that, even when he was actively dying. So, fast forward. You offer him two pizza rolls if he does a certain thing. And you say, I don't care if they're frozen when you give them to him. If you're concerned about him eating frozen food, why would you offer him two frozen pizza rolls? Because the chicken was uncooked and it's dangerous. I was, that actually I had a, a panic attack when he did the chicken. It was, it was terrifying. I broke down completely. So the nuggets were uncooked chicken? Yes, it's uncooked chicken. That's, it, it, that could have killed him. Okay. It freaked me out. And, but the pizza rolls were at least cooked? Yes. That was just, you reheated them. Okay. He was... And I'll give you one more. He was rail thin. How did you not notice? I wish I hadn't answered that. Um, part of it, he actually, from the time of the stroke, because my husband's stroke was January 3rd of 2022, so it was, most of this was cold weather. Um, part of it was he wore, he wore big clothes, he wore hoodies. The clothes that were sent to him from his dad and stepmom, um, most of the pants didn't fit him well to begin with. And I had gotten him a couple of pairs of jeans, but I mean, I couldn't afford a lot. Um, and he also, um, once the stroke happened, 
he got really reclusive. Um, he, he just, I mean, he didn't want, and I had to force him. Um, for a while, when he was doing his homeschooling, he would do it on his tablet. And then I found out he was, I tried to lock the tablet down, um, but he was doing other stuff on his tablet when he was supposed to be doing schoolwork. So I started the, the curriculum that he was on. You could print the, the assignments and the questions. So I started printing that. And um, literally, he'd be like, just stick it on the stairs. I'd, and he'd give me the other assignments. I would grade them and stick them in the, and put them into the, the program. But he, he didn't want anything to do with me, hardly at all. Because you were fucking abusing him, what do you think? She is still condemning him and shaking her head while talking about this as if it's unfathomable that Timothy wouldn't want anything to do with her. You were starving him. Every time he saw you, you would think of new ways to torture him. Of course he doesn't want to be around you. The cognitive dissonance here is astounding. How is she fucking surprised that the son she tortured to death wasn't happy to be around her? But when you put your arms around him to hug your he son. He didn't want hugged. He was, he was 15. He didn't want, he, he didn't want me. And he was autistic, correct? He was. He was high functioning. Okay. But he, most of the autism came with like interactions with other people. He struggled there. Okay. So it wasn't, was it just you he didn't want touching? Or was there anybody, he didn't want anybody else? Um, he didn't want Gabriel, sorry. He didn't want little man hugging him either. Okay. What about Paul? Do you ever uh, see They him? never offered to hug each other. Thank you. Uh. So that was the direct examination. Shanda likely thought she did a relatively good job here. She pretended to cry when it suited her. She blamed her son for not liking the abuse she inflicted on him, and she more or less threw her son under the bus, trying to claim that he was the more abusive one, even though he only acted on her orders. After a short recess, she would retake the stand, and likely believed she was on her way to best the prosecution. But that wouldn't happen. Again, Shanda's excuses were laughably bad. The prosecution had direct evidence of what she had done, from videos of her belittling Timothy in the hours before his death, to texts of her ordering Paul to act, and comments of her thinking up new ways to torture her autistic son. So let's watch her get rightfully ripped to shreds on the stand. Good afternoon, Ms. Van Ark. Hello, Now, uh, Mr. Johnson uh, kind of tried to shortchange her a little bit, Earlier in your crossings area in his direct examination when he wanted to talk about your background, uh, your schooling. Um, remind the jury again of your educational background. Um, I have a Bachelor of Science degree, magna cum laude, and then I also have a Juris Doctorate, it's a law degree, that I graduated magna cum laude second in my class. And uh, magna cum laude, for those that might not be familiar, means with the highest honors, correct? Yes, sir. In law school, actually, SUMA only goes to number one. In, in, at the college level, you, it's above a certain GPA, but for law school, only number one gets summa, and then above a certain GPA gets magna. And then below that is even cum laude, which is what Mr. Johnson tried to say you were, yes, and I think you corrected him and made sure the jury understood, no, you were second in your class in yes, law school, sir. correct? Yes, sir. And uh, you took the bar exam? I did. Passed the bar exam? First try, yes, sir. With a very high score, right? Yes, sir. What was that score? 182 out of 200. Uh, the bar exam is an incredibly difficult test to pass, isn't it? Yes, sir, it is. Mm -hmm. It was like 400 hours of study that went into that. And the pass rate for it usually hovers somewhere around 60%. So four out of 10 people that take it usually fail, right? I did not know that, but I'll take your word for it. Okay. But you understood it to be a very difficult test when oh, we yes. took it. Yes. Uh, and I believe that score would constitute the highest score for, for, your, for that time that, that you took the bar, right? Your score. I, I mean, I don't know. I would assume so. Okay. Um, and you also were magna cum laude in undergrad as well for your yes, bachelor's sir. degree? Yes, sir. And where did, where did you obtain your bachelor's degree? Liberty from? University. You had an opportunity to actually work in this very courthouse for, for a period of time, is that correct? Yes, sir. I did my law school externship, and then after I graduated law school, I stayed on as an intern. It wasn't paid, but the, the experience was invaluable to me, so it was worth it. And particularly the field that you were working when you were working here, you, you worked under Judge Smedley, one of yes, our other circuit court judges, correct? Yes, sir. And uh, the, the, your area of focus that you wanted to, to really focus in on was appellate criminal work, is that correct? Yes, sir. And you had an opportunity to work on some cases here in Muskegon? I did, yes, sir. And eventually that, that turned into an opportunity to go work for another judge in another county, correct? Yes, sir. Up in the Waco County? Yes, sir, for another circuit judge. Right. And, and you were doing the same type of work there? Yeah, even more work than what I was doing here, more specific. Um, I didn't do the sentence scorings here, and I did that there. Um, I actually 
I helped Judge Smedley write one opinion while I was here, but I actually drafted most of my judges' opinions as law clerk. It's quite the responsibility that you had there, so congratulations on that. Thank you, sir. The prosecution isn't congratulating Shanda or pointing out her accomplishments for no discernible reason. In cases of horrendous, prolonged abuse like this one, normal people want to distance themselves from the crime as much as possible. We look at the facts of the case and say whoever did this is a monster. They have to be so fantastically stupid that they simply didn't know that doing something like this could kill someone. It's a normal instinct we want to believe that the guilty party is so ridiculously unintelligent and therefore different enough from you and I that we feel like we would never encounter someone like this in our daily lives. But that simply is not the case. Normal people or intelligent people are just as capable of horrendous actions. And Shanda is intelligent. She knows right from wrong. She knows how to take care of children, seeing as she didn't abuse the other four in the same way she abused Timothy. And logically, she would have known that if she continued to abuse him in the same way, he would die. And it's imperative that the prosecution demonstrate that clearly. Um, and remind the jury again, how many children do you actually have? I have five total. Okay, and go, if, again, we're not going to name the youngest, youngest, little man, I think. Little man, mom. yes. Um, Nolan is 23 and married. Um, Paul is 21 now. Millie, my only daughter, is 19. She's in college in Oklahoma, as far as I know. Um, I haven't talked to her in a long time. Um, Timothy was, he would be 17. He was 15, a month, a month shy of 16, and then little man just turned nine in September. And um, with the exception of Timothy, no harm has come to your children in terms of them you know, dying as a result of malnutrition and starvation, has it? No, not at all. A dehydration, hypothermia? No, sir. The implication being that she knows how to raise children without murdering them over the course of months. She just decided that Timothy deserved to die for some reason. Not, none of those inflicted on any of your other children? No, sir. They're all healthy. Um, Detective, or Detective Pieski, at the time he interviewed you, uh, I, I think attempt, attempted to get some photos uh, of Timothy from your phone, and you told him that you did, had no photos on your phone of him from January on, did you? I had one from January, but after that, no, I didn't have any. But you had a functioning phone. I did, yes, sir. You used it to monitor the cameras that we've talked about, the motion sensors, all that stuff. You had the ability to use a phone that was your own personal phone. Yes, right? sir, that was my phone. It wasn't a work phone where there was a restriction <clears throat> oh, no. to say, well, no. you can't take photos, anything no. of that nature, was it? No. So you certainly had the ability to have photographs of your child on your phone, right? I did, yes, sir. Um, Let's talk about some of your health issues because we listed quite uh, quite a few issues that, that you're, in terms of your diagnosis and health issues that you had. Um, I think you said ADHD, um, something called sensory processing disorder, OCD, OCD, um, th those PTSD. PTSD. I, I would I guess I would kind of classify those more as. Almost, I don't, I don't want to use, I'm not using this word in a negative context, because those are almost more mental disorders. Would you yes, sir. With yes, sir. No, I, I agree with that. Right. You also had some physical disabilities as well. Yes, sir. And I, I don't know if Mr. Johnson went into those, so why don't you tell the jury what your physical disorders are as well? I have um, allergy induced asthma. I am allergic to almost everything environmental other than animals, every different type of pollen and mold and, and weeds. And then I am a reactive hypoglycemic. Um, I have been my whole life, but it was actually after Timothy was born, it got much worse. And um, they finally figured out right after I moved here why it, I mean, what was going on, but it required, I can eat and my blood sugar will still crash. So I can pass out, I can be doing whatever and just pass out. So and if I'm not mistaken, you actually, eat, I, had, I had the opportunity to meet a very, very nice, but very large dog. You had a service animal when you worked here, didn't you? Yes, sir, I did. Gemini. Gemini, yes. And Gemini's function as your service dog was, was what? He was sent trained to pick up the, your blood sugar smell. Um, if you've ever been around a diabetic, when their sugar's high enough, they put off this hubba bubba bubblicious smell. Well, we, as humans, we can't pick up the low blood sugar smell, but a dog can actually pick up your sugar going up about 20 minutes before we can, and they can pick up the low blood sugar. So he was sent trained. He would let me know when my sugar was about to crash, so I always carried orange juice with me, and that would keep my blood sugar up for two and a half to three hours guaranteed. And then he was also trained if I ignored his alert, and this did happen at work a couple of times. Um, he was trained. He was off leash. He was trying to go and get somebody to bring them to me to make sure I took care of it so I didn't pass out. Um, it's just remarkable that dogs can do that. That's just it an is. aside. Um, and was Gemini the first service dog you had on? No, sir. He was my second. 
Okay, and so you had one before Gemini, I and then one after. Then one after, and that was Sharma. Is Sharma, that right? yes, sir. He was another great Dane. Another great Dane. Okay, um, I like the big dogs. So you are certainly, you are keenly aware of your health issues and the things that you need to do to address your health issues, right? At times, I don't take great care of myself. I will admit that. It, and the fallback to that is you have a dog that will it alert does. you if your blood sugar gets yes. low. Yes. Yeah. So you understand that if, so you have a backup plan. Yes, right? I do. Yeah. So if, if, if I forget to eat or my blood sugar gets too low, then my dog is going to alert me to that, so I've, so I've got a backup plan. Yes, right? sir. But you understand the, how that works. You understand yes, sir. the medical need to, to have those things treated. Right? Yes, sir. And the need to have your other issues that we talk about get treatment for those issues as well, don't you? Yes, sir. Um, sensory processing disorder involves basically overstimulation, right? Yes, sir. And you suffer from a, a disorder which causes you to become overstimulated with what audio and visual stimuli, correct? It's, it's, that's part of it, yes, sir. It can be stress related as well. But as a punishment for your child, you decided that hot sauce, audio alarms, cold, cold. We'll get into this later, but cold, at least cold, if not ice baths, and isolation and sensory deprivation were appropriate means of punishment. This is one of the best questions that the prosecution could have asked, because it immediately tells you everything you need to know about Shanda. Shanda cared about herself. She cared about if she was overstimulated, if she was impacted by someone else's needs, and the lengths she would go to to hurt someone she believed was negatively impacting her. That is how she viewed Timothy. Is that, is that your testimony? Those yes, are sir. appropriate forms of punishment? For some of it, yes, sir. You also train service animals, correct? I do. And when you train service animals, um, is, is crate training involved, involved at all? In yes, it is usually. Right. And, and explain what crate training is to a jury. Um, it depends on what you're using it for. Usually it's part of house training to begin with. Um, and when the service animal in training is very young, you don't get to take them with you 24-7. Um, so you don't want to leave them unattended a lot of times. Plus, the, putting a dog in a crate, a lot of times that's comforting to them. They like the, the, the more enclosed space. So it keeps them contained, keeps them from being destructive, and it teaches them, like for house training, it'll teach them not to do anything in their, in their house, basically, where you take them outside and where they do their business. And one of the ways you make them feel comfortable in, in their crates and so it's their house is they have a blanket or something of comfort in, in the crates, right? Uh, I don't usually, at least not for house training, because then they could actually do their business on that and shove it to the back of the crate. So I don't usually put anything in there. But that is a method that some, some people, people do use. employ. Some people training. use it, yes, right. but I don't. Right. Um, we've had a lot of, there's a lot of text messages. We had a lot of testimony from Paul yesterday and a lot of photographs about Timothy's small room. Um, that was basically like a crate, wasn't it? I don't, I don't believe it was that enclosed, but he, he asked for a space that he could close the door. He asked to go in, into that. He asked for a he he asked for somewhere he could um, some place he can go in and close the door, and it was actually half joking. I was like, "That's all I've got," because the other rooms were taken, and I, there was no way he was sharing with Paul, and I didn't really want him sharing with little man either. But you didn't set that that up as a room for him, did you? Not originally, no. He was actually out in the, the lower area for a while. Shanda's argument at the beginning of her testimony was that she was severely mentally unwell during the time she was taking care of Timothy, and that she was not fully cognizant of what was happening to him. Despite being able to take care of her toddler and everyone else in the house effectively, she simply didn't realize that she was abusing her son over the span of months. But for every decision that she made that negatively impacted Timothy's life, she has an answer. According to Shanda, she didn't force Timothy to sleep in a bare closet on a plain blue tarp because she wanted to punish him for being bad. She did it because he had asked for his own room, and that was the only place available. It wasn't this horrendously hurtful and cruel action. It was actually her being considerate. She stated earlier this very day that in hindsight, she realized that a lot of what she did was despicable, and she just wasn't mentally present during those moments. And forcing your neurodivergent son to sleep on the floor of a closet is objectively terrible, yet she is adamant that it's not that bad. Also, she never set that area up as a room for him. The way she phrases her response implies that eventually she did. But you didn't, you didn't put a bed in there? Didn't put we a did originally, yes. There. He tore it up. Okay. But there, but there was no 
mattress, nothing of comfort for there in him the day before he died, was there? Not that day, no. He had torn it up. I couldn't afford to get another one. You put a, you put a blue tarp in there, didn't you? It was on, that was what was on the mattress previously, yes. And the tarp was because he would wet himself? Yes, sir. Because he, I tried the mattress covers, I tried plastic, I tried some of the rewashable, and he kept tearing them up. So his place of comfort was a closet with a blue tarp. Is that what you, is that what you want the spent story to some, believe? He spent some time there. I wouldn't say that was a place of comfort. I mean, spent some was, time there. Well, let's get into that. He slept in there most nights, didn't he? After, I don't know. I wouldn't. I don't know when exactly. It was. I mean, I know it was after my husband's stroke. I don't know when after that. But um, once he'd asked for that, yes, he did. In, in fact, he rarely even slept on his bed, did he? Um, he had taken the bed apart and lost some of the bolts. I couldn't. It wasn't safe for him to sleep up there. Because she really cares about his safety, right? There's no evidence that he tore the bed apart, and there's also no evidence that he destroyed any mattress cover. But let's say that he did. Let's consider for a moment he did everything she just claimed that he did. He had severe sensory issues and was forced to stop taking all the medication he had been on cold turkey. And it should go without saying at this point that he was being severely abused. Even if he had destroyed the bed, he still did not deserve to sleep on a tarp in a small closet while being filmed and forced to wear a motion sensor. But again, she continues to validate that reality. It's all fine in her eyes. The only issue is that he died, which is somehow still his fault. Because as she stated earlier, he never told her that he was hungry. So, so the bed that we see in those pictures, it wasn't even safe to be used? No. So it was a complete lie when you told the police officers that you had to pull him off the bed put him on the ground to do CPR, wasn't it? Yes. And it was a complete lie when you told 911, I need to put you on hold so I can take him off the bed to perform CPR, wasn't it? Yes, sir, I don't even remember. So that. in all your days, all your confusion, all your blacking out, tunnel vision, all that, you, you were able to somehow remember. I, I ought to tell everybody that Timothy was sleeping on the bed. Remember doing that? Vaguely, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Again, though Shanda and her team aren't fighting for diminished capacity, it's clear based on what she said on the stand, she is claiming that she simply didn't realize what he was doing was killing her son. But that cannot be true because she immediately knew that she had to lie and try to hide what they had done. Had she been forthcoming on the phone with 911 and the responding officers and was otherwise unaware that she was at fault, that argument would make sense. By pointing out how quickly she began to lie and how deliberate those lies were, the prosecution is ruining the, frankly, already poorly made arguments. Have you ever given hot sauce to the dogs, to train the dogs? Um, I have put it on a couple of objects to keep them off of objects, yes. Keeps them, keeps them away from it, right? Yes, it does. Right, because they don't want to eat the hot sauce. Mm -hmm. uh, and you would, so you never actually grabbed a dog, forced its mouth open, and poured hot sauce down its throat, have you? No. Never put, bread, put hot sauce on a piece of food and then fed it to them, make them eat it, have you? No, because I don't give my dogs human food. You can't do that with service animals. No, but you could put it on dog food, didn't you? I guess. I've never even thought about that, honestly. So it never occurred to you to use hot sauce, enforcing the use of hot sauce on a dog, but it occurred to you to use that as a form of punishment for your 14-year-old child? It, it was Paul's idea, but yes, it, I was at my wit's end at, the, at that time. It was Paul's idea, and you thought, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. I think we'll do that. Is that what you're saying? I don't remember the exact conversation, but... I said, it, like I said, at that point, I was willing to try anything. I was. We'll get into the text, but there's yeah. dozens of texts in here, and this is just a small section of text where you tell Paul, put more hot sauce on the bread, give him four slices of hot sauce. Don't do you remember those text messages? Some of them, not very many, but some of them. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't punish a dog with hot sauce, but it's okay to punish a child with it. Objection, I'll move on. Okay. Shanda's mannerisms are interesting to observe, because it would appear that she believes the prosecution is being unfair towards her, and she looks towards the jury in the hopes to get that thought affirmed. She rolls her eyes, purses her lips, and altogether reacts as if she's being told that she cannot breastfeed at Tilly's. Would you stick a dog in an ice bath as punishment? I did, that would never occur to me, but... Then having big dogs, you don't. I don't bathe them at home anyway. I use dry shampoo, or then I or I take them somewhere else. I, I don't. Uh, have I'm talking about as a form of. I'm not talking about giving them a bath. I'm talking about using. I don't have as space. A form of punishment, putting a dog in an ice bath. 
I don't have space to do that, so I, I wouldn't think of that because I don't have space with that size dog. You're saying if you had a large enough tub to punish one of the dogs, you'd put them put in a nice bed? I can't, I mean, I can't imagine doing that, but... You can't imagine doing that, right? Correct. You can't imagine punishing an animal by putting them in a nice bath. Because animals can't think the same way humans can. So it's okay to do it on a human because they can think, right? They can, they can think better than dogs can, so it's okay to put them in a nice bath. Is that what your testimony is? I don't want to put words in your mouth. Can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Is it okay to put a human in an ice bath because they can think better than dogs can, but you wouldn't do it to a dog? I mean, based on the way you asked that, I guess the answer would have to be yes, but it's just a, it's not okay. the way I think, so. I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but you said you wouldn't do it for a dog, but we know you did it as a punishment for I never, Timothy. I never did personally. Yes, she did. And she also ordered that to be done. Shanda tries to appear as if she was simply complicit in the abuse done by Paul. But I ask you, does Paul seem as if he is the one in charge of anything? Based on the direct evidence, Shanda was the one instructing Paul about what to do, not the other way around. Her trying to spin it any other way is false. But you told Paul to do it? Um, yes. A couple of times. And it never occurred to you, this is not a good idea. We shouldn't be doing this, right? No, because it was... the. Um, the amount of ice was almost, I mean, it was non-existent, so. So it's okay as long as it's not a lot of ice in the ice bath? Is that your testimony? If it doesn't affect the temperature much. It starts off as cold anyway, doesn't it? Um, not originally. I don't know down the road, but originally I did, that's not what, what I had told him to do. Because the original time, the first time that happened was before my husband's stroke. It was, Timothy had... Um, the, we, we noticed there was no hot water and we were like, what the heck? And I went down and I'm looking and I noticed the pilot light's not on on water, it's a gas water heater. I'm like, what on earth is going this on? This ends with Timothy turning off the gas, doesn't it? Uh, this, yes, this, sir. This part of the story. Okay. And he lied about let, it for let, let, two days. But let, let me just make okay. sure I understand that. Is, is, is it your testimony that you put ice in an otherwise hot bath to cool it down? Yes. Why don't you just start with warm water to begin with? I honestly don't know, that, but that's what, that, what happened the first time. So if you repeatedly refer in these text messages to them as cold and or ice baths, but that's what it was at the end, wasn't it? Cold baths or ice baths, at right? At the end, yes, sir, but not the first time. That doesn't matter. She continues to try and justify her actions, as if the jury is going to follow her line of thinking that leads towards her torturing her son. It doesn't matter if the original punishment was giving her son a luxurious spa experience if it ended in him being forced to sit in ice baths for seven hours plus. That doesn't change what happened, and that doesn't justify it either. Not the first time you, you apparently needed ice to cool down hot. I have bath. no idea what I was thinking. I was... We'd, ha we'd all had to have t cold showers for two days, and he'd lied to us about the water heater. I'd had to have the gas company out. You remember taking the law school exam test? The LSAT? LSAT? Yes. Yeah. Oh, I hated that test. Oh, I did too. Yeah, I agree with you there. There's a section on there that's about logic and reasoning, right? Yes, sir. And I kind of explained it to my friends as it's the, you know, so-and-so can't next to so -and sit next to so-and-so at a party, and this person can't sit on this side of the table, and this, so, you, so you have to map out all those things, right? Yes, sir. I'm guessing you scored pretty high on the LSAT, didn't you? I, I, I scored pretty well. I mean, I got a scholarship to law school, so. So for a test that serves your interest for getting into law school, you have no problem using logic and reasoning, do you? I mean, I managed to score on I had, I hated that test. I know I, I did not miss a single, um, there's a uh, logic games section. I think I missed one question on that out of 25. And I think the reading comprehension was also something like that. So I think the lowest score was actually on the logical reasoning. Any person can assess where the prosecution is going with this. We can clearly see the tale he is trying to weave, where her intelligence and specifically her results on the LSATS in the bar exam make it impossible for her to not realize she was abusing her son, but she cannot help but to brag about her results. Instead of trying to defend herself and justify her original position by saying that she could recognize patterns in behavior on a test, but not in reality, or stating that she was so blinded by stress she didn't even realize she boasts about her high test scores. She's hurting her own argument, but she needs to talk about how good she did. And yet somewhere before the time your husband had a stroke, 
logic told you that you should use ice in a hot bath. Is that, is that your testimony? Yes, sir. But then after that, you do acknowledge that it was cold and or ice baths. Yes, sir. And that you encouraged Paul to pour water on Timothy, didn't you? Just the one day. Just the one day? Yes, sir. Which day was that? The day before he passed away. Now, Mr. Johnson asked you some questions about uh, homeschooling and not ever taking Timothy to a doctor. Do you remember that? Yes, sir. And I think you said that the reason you couldn't do that is because you couldn't get your ex-husband to help you out with signing over custody. Do you remember that? Correct. Yes, sir. The truth is you were, by court order, not allowed to have custody of Timothy, weren't you? That's correct. But I was offered the option of either taking him or they were going to put him in foster care. And I didn't, I didn't want my son in foster care. I don't think anybody would. Okay, shut the fuck up. I'm sorry, but I can't help but be pissed off by this fucking statement. The foster care system is incredibly flawed, and we have talked about those flaws numerous times on the channel. But to be perfectly clear, Timothy would have been way better off in foster care. If he had been placed in the foster care system, it's more than likely he would still be alive. Her sanctimonious bullshit is so fucking ridiculous given the amount of shit that she did to this kid. She tortured him to the point where he, as a 15-year-old boy, was regularly wetting himself. Do you know how consistent the abuse a person endures needs to be for you to become incontinent? And she has the fucking gall to sit on the witness stand and pretend to cry at the thought of him going into foster care. It's ridiculous. She hated Timothy. She abused him early on in his life, and she abused him so consistently he is now deceased. And to this very day, at time of recording, she is still justifying a significant portion of that abuse, saying that he was always misbehaving and that he needed to be punished. Meanwhile, when she asked what he did that he needed to be punished for, it's things like eating frozen food because she was starving him. To sit on the stand and state that she needed to take custody of him lest he become part of the foster care system as if she is saving lives is disgusting. It's one of the sickest things we have had to cover and that's saying something. There was a court order that said you are not allowed to have custody of Timothy. I'm not talking about a custody agreement. I'm talking about a court order that says you can't have custody of Timothy. Uh, my understanding of the, the order that you're talking about, um, it wasn't that I couldn't. It's just that I didn't get custody that time. Her understanding of that order is wrong. She was not allowed custody of Timothy because there were substantiated allegations of abuse. Ms. Roberts, you can continue. Thank you. Uh, Just to kind of put a bow on this and clarify things, Ms. Vander Ark, is it true that the last custody order from Oklahoma that involved Timothy indicated that you are only to be allowed supervised parenting time? That is correct. Now, uh, Mr. Johnson was uh, to talked to you about the fact that after Adam had his stroke tragically in January and was out of the home, that that, that was, a, was a significant financial hit for you. Is that fair to say? Yes, sir. And uh, as a result of that, you didn't have a lot of income coming in. Um, were you working in New Ago at that time? I was, yes, sir. Um, so you, the, when you worked here, it was not a paid internship. You were working in New Ago for paid internship at that time. Is that correct? For a paid clerkship, yes, sir. Right, clerkship. And then what were your other, um, what were your other sources of income at that time? Um, which time? Well, in January, right after the stroke. Right after the stroke. Um, the rental income that I received from my brother from Oklahoma, and then I had, I was down to one dog training client. Um, now, you're not suggesting to this jury that you couldn't afford to have food for your kids, are you? No, sir. In fact, you're, we've seen the pictures, and you, you don't even show you the pictures of your freezer, your oh, refrigerator, your pantry, all pretty well stocked with food. Wouldn't you agree? Yes, sir. Okay, so you, the, sir, so there certainly was a financial ability for you to provide for your children, at least in a food sense, correct? Yes, sir. Bought and, food first. And you're you're a highly intelligent woman, and I'm sure you're aware of multiple resources available in the community if that ever became an issue, right? Yes, sir. United Way food pantries, anything of that nature, but, but you never felt the need to reach out to any of those resources, did you? No, sir, because we had groceries covered. <clears throat> um, you talked about, Mr. Johnson asked you about the motion sensors, and I'm not sure we got like any real sense of clarity about the motion sensors. Um, when we're talking about motion sensors, we're talking about ones that would um, not only go off if, if there was motion, that's what a motion sensor is, obviously, but would give some type of audio alarm, right? Uh, some of them did, yes, sir. And um, Timothy had very sensitive hearing, didn't he? I was not aware of that, no, sir. That's When Paul said that yesterday, that puzzled me. You didn't know about that? You didn't know he had surgery to put tubes in his ears? I was there for the surgery for his tubes, but no, I mean, it was 
at least my experience with Timothy was half the time he didn't hear what you were saying. Shanda did not care about Timothy. That much has been made obvious. But at this point, it's absurd. Firstly, because she had sensory issues. So she would know how excruciating loud noises like alarms could be. She was there when Timothy had surgery on his ears, and she was told explicitly by his doctors growing up, as well as her ex-husband, that he had sensory issues as well. Moreover, there was no way that Paul would know that without her being the one to tell him. But beyond all of that, at base level, Timothy is autistic. If you read any literature about autism, or even just take a cursory Google search about how autism can manifest in different individuals, one of the first signs of autism in children is a lack of reaction to verbal stimuli. Individuals with autism usually have a hard time appearing to focus on anything that is outside of their hyperfixation or special interest. Timothy not, quote, hearing what she is saying, unquote, was not a hearing issue or a sign that he wasn't sensitive to auditory stimuli. It was a symptom of autism, one of the most known symptoms. Shanda wasn't stupid. If she deemed something worth her time, she would put energy into learning about it. But she didn't think her son was worth it, so she didn't even know the most basic facts about him and what he had to deal with. Um, did you know that he found it d discomforting when, that, when those noises happened? Did you know that that was, you know, for lack of a better way of putting it, that was, that was a punishment too for those noises to be going on? No, sir, I did not. Um, um, it, it's he was autistic, right? He was on the autism Yes, sir, he was on the spectrum. Loud noises, disturbances, things like that, those are troubling for folks with autism, aren't they? For some of them, but... He never, I mean, he, he liked to listen to his tablet extremely loud. Um, and I remember, because um, little man, sorry, I'm trying not to say his name. Yeah. Um, you know, when we'd have thunderstorms, it, sometimes it would freak him out, and it didn't, things like that didn't bother Timothy at all. And Timothy sat with me, okay, go ahead and judge me or laugh at me, but when I, before the PTSD, I used to watch, when I watched college football, I would scream at the television every play, offense and defense, that's just who I am. And, um, and Timothy was right there with me hollering at the TV. So, so the, the alarms didn't bother him at all? I mean, I wouldn't say that, I mean, they, they bother people, probably some, everybody, but, I, but they didn't, it wasn't, he wasn't overly sensitive to it. Right, because it begs the question, if the alarms don't bother him, what's the point in having them, right? Yes, sir. And they were there well, as part, it, a disincentive for him to do the things he wasn't supposed to do. It was to let us know he was doing it too. Right. That way we knew what was going on. But it was, it was supposed to also be you're yes. not supposed to be doing this, and we know when you're, you're going to be doing yes. this, right? It was, it was so he knew we would be notified. And the, the doing this that we're talking about is coming out of the basement area of the home, right? Coming upstairs in the middle of the night, yes, sir. Coming upstairs in the middle of the night? Yes, sir. So, so these would only be active at night? I only turned them on at night, yes, sir. So there's no text messages in there about turning on the motion sensor during the day so we can't come upstairs? I, I mean, I don't recall it, but... But you would, if those are in there... You would agree with me then that you were using the motion sensors to keep him downstairs even during the day, right? It, I mean, if it happened occasionally, I'm do, just... Do you remember the text exchange about turning off the alarms so that he can go to the bathroom and then turning the alarms back on after he's done going to the bathroom? Do you remember those? That was read the other day? Vaguely, yes, sir. Why? Well, I'm sure you remember them from being read the other day. Do you yeah. remember sending those text messages? No, sir. No memory of those text messages? No, sir. And you're talking, there's, are you talking motion sensor or there was, there was I'm one. I'm talking motion sensor right now. Okay, there, the motion sensors are, are still, that's not, that, it, that's different. You're talking about a, a, it was actually for a bike alarm, like for somebody stealing a bike, I guess it was. And you, that was the one that, that was, that you were referring to. The motion sensors that we've been talking about are posted in the house and those don't get turned, those didn't need to be turned on in our office. So the motion sensor with the alarm is the one that was outside, is that what you're saying? The motion sensor with the alarm, the, the ones that make noise, was not one that was in the house? No, they were up, up on the stairs. There was, there was a personal one that you could attach to whatever you wanted to. Right. There was one of those, and then there were several on the stairs. I see. Okay. And the purpose of the one on the stairs one was to make sure you didn't come upstairs? In the middle of the night, yes, sir. Right. And the ones to, and you actually, the ones that you could attach to a thing, you actually attached to a person, didn't you? Occasionally, yes, sir. So, the, let's talk about the cameras then. Um, well, I guess let me ask you this question. So the motion sensor goes off, the alarm goes off, maybe it doesn't go off, maybe it's not one of the ones that have, have an alarm on it. So what? 
How, how is that a deterrent, or how is that a, a punishment to Timothy? It wasn't meant as a punishment. It was to let us know so we could go make sure that he was, you know, he wasn't wandering around. He wasn't getting into taking batteries apart and taking other messing with stuff that he shouldn't have been. So you wanted to restrict his movements, and you wanted to know if he moved out of the basement area whenever the motion sensors were on. Yes, sir. And the cameras are, I, I think you testified that the camera, at least initially, you put the camera in place in, Gabe, in G's room to make sure that he wasn't running around without his clothes on, right? Yes, sir. When he was a toddler, he would strip down. How does putting a camera in his room to show him running around restrict him from doing that? Well, it doesn't restrict it. It was to let us know that he was doing it. And you have a problem with him running around? He wasn't potty trained. Wasn't potty trained, I see. But other, otherwise, if you're potty trained, it's okay to have your children running around naked? No. No. You wouldn't want to have a child running around your house naked, would you? No. You wouldn't want G to see his brother running around naked, would you? No. Then I'm wondering why the text message that you sent to um, Paul about, about Timothy making a mess in the garage was that he had to clean the garage without anything on below the waist. And then he could stand against the wall without anything below his waist. I don't remember that, sir. I'm sorry. You don't remember that, Tuck No, sir. Interesting. Take a look at, this is from the larger text messages. This is all the text messages between you and Paul. It's a few hundred, if not thousand pages. Uh, take a look at, this is page 5783, if Mr. Johnson wants to reference. The, tech, this, the blue is your text messages. Can you read that for the jury, please? The blue one says, my, big, my bigger issue is that you said you checked every minute or so, but checking on the camera would have told you he wasn't listening. I'm not absolving him of responsibility by a long shot, but there are reasons the cameras are in place. And what time was that sent? 4.14 uh, p.m., it looks like. So at 4.14 p.m., you're upset with Paul because he's not watching Timothy every minute on the cameras, right? If I remember correctly, that particular day, yeah, he said he was going to check. That, that wasn't, I didn't expect him to check every day, but there were days that were much more challenging, and that was when I asked him to keep a closer eye on. Once again, Shanda destroys her previous excuse. She stated that she only abused him because she would black out from the slightest bit of stress and that caused a severe lapse in judgment. But now, when she is shown a text message that would have been sent while she was stressed and while Timothy was being abused, she can clearly recall why she sent it and what it was about. If I was going to claim that I had no memory of an event, I would continue to say that. But Shanda believes she can outsmart everyone in the room. She thinks that the jury is going to hear how Timothy turned out the pilot light once and ate a two-pound bag of frozen chicken tenders and immediately understand why she attached a motion sensor to his person. Where is the text message that describes what the challenging incident was that day? I don't know, sir. I mean, there was, it was, there was a lot of challenging incidents. Going upstairs? No, sir. Going upstairs was okay during the day? Um, as long as, the, as he was being monitored, yes. This is another change she is making midway through cross-examination. Earlier, she stated that Timothy was always allowed upstairs and they had never restricted his access to the main floor of the home during the day. But now she says that he was only allowed there when he was being monitored, meaning that whenever Paul and Chandra weren't directly watching him, he was placed downstairs, either in the freezing cold bath or in a small, dark closet where he wasn't allowed to move without her express permission. You talked about, we, we talked about the autism already. You talked about a number of other issues that, um, that Timothy had. Bipolar, ADHD, were there some other ones? Or sensory processing disorder. Sensory process. So he had the same disorder that you did. Yes. The sensory processing <coughs> disorder. Um, but there's different, it's, there's different manifestations of it. He had the one where his senses being overloaded didn't have, didn't make a problem for him. Is that what you're saying? His was, he was more hyposensitive, which means he didn't, he didn't react the way a typical person would as, as far as less of a reaction. Um, there was a, a time I was told about it when we still lived in Oklahoma. Um, I guess he was being given a bath and he fell and, and hit his jaw and they didn't, he didn't say anything. He wasn't, he didn't say he was in pain. Well, I guess he went to someone's bedroom and my oldest son brought him back out and he had completely bitten through his tongue and not said anything. 
So he, he did not react as much to stimuli as most people do. There's hypo and hypersensitive, and he was hyposensitive. Mm -hmm. And is there medication for that that you take? Not that I'm aware of. I don't. Uh, do, do you go to counseling for, for, for you, or did you go to counseling for, for you? Not for that, no, sir. Um, for any of your other issues, though? I have over time. Right. It's been a long time. Um, but in fact, the entire time Timothy was in the state of Michigan, you never took him to a counselor or a doctor to address any of those issues, did you? No, sir, I didn't have insurance, the insurance information. Again, she didn't need the insurance information to get him access to the medical professionals that would have helped him. You didn't reach out to any resources in the community that might have been available to help, did you? I, I did actually contact... Yes or no? Did you reach out to any resources yes. in the community? Which ones? I contacted DHHS about uh, getting on Medicaid, but they said that because he had other insurance, that would be primary, so we still had to have that information. Did you reach out to Community Mental Health, or Health West, I guess it's called now? I didn't. I wasn't aware of it. I, didn't, I hadn't heard of Health West until I started working in the courthouse. Right. You worked in this courthouse, in the county that you live in, for at least an entire summer, as I recall correctly, you, you, and you never knew that we had a, a, a mental health agency here, here in Muskegon County? I didn't realize that's what it was for. I, I honestly, I didn't think about it. I re the only, as far as resources go, the only thing that I thought about was DHHS for things like Medicaid and food stamps. Mr. Johnson asked you about the alarms on the doors, and you, your, your response to him was that the alarms went on the doors about three weeks before Timothy passed away. Is that correct? Somewhere in there. I was approximating Somewhere it. Somewhere in there. Okay. <clears throat> you can look up the Amazon history on my phone. Well, I'll tell you one better than that. This is page 3932 of the text messages from you. Could you go ahead and read that exchange for the jury and the date, please? Uh, did he say miraculously? Uh, no, I was, This is huh? Paul's response now, right? Yes. No, I was emphasizing because I turned on the alarm, yet he slipped past. Uh, that's not good. We need to put up the other two alarms tonight later on. Hmm. That's the motion sensors. But you referred to the alarms. <coughs> yes, sir, I did. Right. And that was That's in... what we called them. That was February. February. That was motion February. sensors. Right. Months before he died. Yes, sir. You just mixed up what an alarm or what a motion sensor is? Yes, sir. That's why I, ca I called them alarms. I didn't call them motion sensors most of the time. Mm -hmm. This was a little bit longer exchange, but if you could read 3996 for me, please. Just this page? Nope, the whole thing that's stable, please. <clears throat> uh, is it snowing at home currently? KK, Timothy apparently ate my Pop-Tarts a few days back. Not anymore. Uh, are you kidding me? When did he do that? He said he doesn't know the exact day. Um, that's a bunch of BS, and how did he do it? Did he sneak down to the bathroom? He says it was before we had the other alarms. Um, I said, that's not true because we've had those for over a week now. And you had Pop-Tarts in that box as of this past weekend or Friday at the very latest. That's still the motion sensors. Okay, that's so again, you refer to the motion sensors as alarms yes, right. there. And you're upset at that point because Timothy did some Pop-Tarts. Is that my understanding of this text messages? In that case, because he stole them, Paul had, had gotten them for himself and because he stole them. Mm -hmm. Because he was starving, because you weren't feeding him, because you were neglecting him and he was going to take and eat whatever he could get his hands on, because that is what a person does when they're being forced to go without food. Again, every single opportunity she is given, she attacks Timothy's character and tries to paint him in the most negative light possible. He stole the Pop-Tarts from Paul. He snuck past the alarms. He woke her up on purpose. Even with the benefit of hindsight, she has no compassion for the son that she tortured. She is entirely unable to look at the situation from another perspective and see that maybe what she did was wrong. She knows to say it because she knows saying that she wanted him to die would be wrong, but she validates everything she did to him that resulted in his death. The only thing she seems to regret is the fact that he died, and that's because it means she will be spending the remainder of her life in prison. And that date, uh, I don't know if we read it or not, but you would agree with me that, it was, oh, it's on Valentine's Day, February 14th, 2022, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, I want you to take a look at 3702. Crossed out the parts that it's not really necessary for you to read, and just go ahead and tell the jury that date and what's on there. Uh, the date is January 24th. Okay. Uh, did Timothy have to wash his sheets? 
question mark, yes. I said, ugh, K, pretty sure that is him pouting over the extra camera and motion sensors. So, and that was in January of 2022, correct? Yes, sir. So no problem referring to the motion sensor in January of 2022, but suddenly, come February, you mix up what an alarm and what a motion detector are. <coughs> yes, sir. Correct? Yes, sir. Yeah. Like I said, you can check the Amazon history. You don't want to revise your testimony about when it was that you started using alarms on the doors? No, sir, because it's in my Amazon history when I purchased those. You, Mr. Johnson asked you about Timothy being on medication for a lot of his issues, is that correct? Yes, sir. And uh, I think you said that when he came to you, you, he was like a zombie, right? Yes, sir. So you decided to take him off those medications, didn't you? No, sir, we didn't, we couldn't get refills. We, well, had, to, we had to get a, a refill through a doctor and we didn't have a doctor. So yes, adding extemporaneous detail doesn't change the answer. It just serves to make the decision look a bit less callous, but the overall answer would be yes. So your testimony wasn't that you took him off those medications? I said that I wanted to. You wanted to? Yes, sir. At least some of them because he, they were, I mean, he was, he was a zombie. It was horrible. You wanted to take him off the medications and it happened anyway because you can get refills for him. So you're actually happy that that happened. Not the way it happened, but he wasn't a zombie afterwards. But you definitely did not consult with the doctor before you did that. No, sir, because we ran out. But you, you, and again, didn't reach out to any, the, besides DHHS, didn't reach out to any resources in the community that might have helped you out with a child with such severe emotional issues that you have to use motion sensors and later alarms and locks on things. You, you didn't reach out for any resources before you just decided to stop him taking medication. Before we, before he ran out, I, I wasn't aware of, like I said, I, DHHS is pretty much the main resource that I was aware of. Did you ever talk to somebody and say, look, I'm at my wit's end here. I did reach out to resources and talk to the judge that you were collecting for. I said, what can I do to get some help here? Did you ever do any of that? I talked to some friends at work. And they but I didn't come ask, up with an idea? I didn't ask for resources. I just vented to them, and nobody suggested anything. I didn't ask. Um, it's rather unusual the way this, this question was answered by you. She said there was one time that... Your mother-in-law saw Timothy? Yes, sir. One time? Yes, sir. Just the once? Um, after the stroke, yes, sir. Just once in six months was the only time? As far as I remember, yes, sir. That's what I believe. In fact, you went to great lengths to make sure that the grandmother, that's Grammy, that's the person Grammy, you referred yes. to as Grammy, right? Your mother-in-law. You went to great lengths to make sure that she wasn't allowed in your home, didn't you? I mean, that was just because the house was a mess. Did you have some type of tracking device on her to know where she was? Um, she, we had her phone under our, our phone plan, so I could look up on find my iPhone. Because usually when she was, that way um, Paul wanted to know when she was coming to get Gabriel. Oh, gee, sorry. Uh, let me show you what's uh, page 4284. This is a lengthy exchange, but go ahead and read that for the jury. It's from I believe, March 28th. Uh, soot, mm. uh, stupid thing writing on my watch, that should have said good. Uh, Grammy left home about 10 minutes ago, hopefully she will not beat me there this time, but please have him ready to go, and please keep a very close eye on your messages. I will track her on the app as I head home. Um, hey, I need to, see, to make sure you're seeing these messages, and please make sure his new shoes are on him, okay, thank you. Um, and do not, do not, do not let Grammy inside. Exclamation point. Yes, sir. Right. Okay, uh, she will probably beat me there, but not by more than a couple minutes. You get clothes on too, please. Okay, uh, go ahead and take Gabriel outside and set the puppy down and stand up against the wall downstairs. You can, it says create the puppy too, but um, OL and then okay. She should be pulling up pretty soon. Okay, I got it. I'm glad you got it, but you better be outside. Uh, he is outside, do you want to say goodbye? That's Paul's response back to you, right? Yes. And I said, yes, I do. I'll be there in just a minute. Headed to the car now. How's it going there? He said, good. Already taped the coat rack. I think you should stop there. Um, so you're tracking her movements on your phone as you're driving home? <coughs> At stoplights, yes, sir. Because you're worried that she's going to see a messy house? Yes, sir. And the solution to that is put Gabriel outside when, so that he's outside when she gets there, right? Yes, sir. That was 
I'm sorry, I misspoke. That was March 8th, right? And so rather than his grandmother come into the house, into the, even the entryway of the house, in the middle of winter, not middle of winter, on March 8th, your solution was put Gabriel outside, make sure she doesn't come in. Do not, do not, do not let her in the house. Paul was outside Exclamation with point. I wouldn't end up, never put him outside by himself. Paul was outside with him. 4044. <clears throat> uh, please also have some decent clothes on in case I need you to bring a little man out. I'm hoping Grammy does not beat me there. It looks like it will be close. Uh, he said, okay. said, I will tell you when to take him outside to wait for her. Just please make sure she doesn't leave until after I get there. I haven't been away from Gabriel at night since this all started, and I wanted to give him a hug and kiss before he goes. Uh, okay, go ahead and go outside and wait for her. It shouldn't be more than a few minutes before she gets there. Just please don't let her leave until after I get there. Uh, she is almost there. Are y'all outside? I would like a response to that message. Um, question, question mark, question mark, question mark. You might need to make Timothy stand with his nose, it says, of against the front door on the inside. Please tell me that you and the child are outside. Seriously, no response. I am almost there, and I'm more than a little upset at the moment. You're upset because at that point you don't know whether or not she's going to come into the house, aren't you? I was upset because I wasn't getting a response. That drives me crazy. It's a pet peeve. I hate not getting a response by a text message. Right. So you better have my child standing outside so his grandmother doesn't go inside. And oh, by the way, put my other child up against the front door with his nose against the wall, right? Because he was in trouble for something. I mean, I don't know what happened before that exchange. <coughs> What would, what, would, what, what would he do to get punished to have him make sure he's standing against the wall with his nose against the door? That's, that was one punishment. He would we'd make him stand against the wall with his nose. And the reason I had it against the door is because I didn't want him getting into anything. That way Paul had a better ability to monitor him. 4123. Remember, we're not saying your younger son's name. Yes. When you get home, please make sure G's face is not a mess and he isn't filthy dirty. And then please get socks and shoes on him and his headphone case in his backpack. And maybe his blue headphones as well. Okay. Uh, also, please watch him, but please have Timothy get those two pumpkins off the front porch and into the trash can before Grammy gets there. Grammy isn't supposed to get there until 6.15, but she was early last time, so she might do that again. I hope not. Uh, Remember to bang loudly on the door three times, please. I will let Timothy know to listen from here, for you here in the next few minutes. And Grammy may just beat me there again, which doesn't make me happy, but anyway. If she does, do not let her in the house this time. Okay. Work was fun. I accidentally scratched my palm with a knife, opening a bag, and then cut my elbow from banging my funny bone on a metal carton. That was Paul's response back to you. Yes. Yeah. So that's three text exchange, all within a couple of weeks of each other, where you are absolutely consistent that you're... That the boy's grandmother's, the boy's grandmother, G's grandmother, not come into the house. Right? Yes, sir. To the point where you're tracking her phone while you're driving home from work. Right? Yes, sir. I did. I only tracked it when I was stopped. I wouldn't do that while I was driving, but. Now, Mr. Johnson asked you about the uh, leg irons. Do you recall that? Yes, sir. And you said that those were uh, Timothy's leg irons, correct? Or no, I'm sorry, that they were, your testimony here today was that those were ordered by Paul, and Paul would use those on Legos, correct? Yes, sir. Actually, I don't think I testified about the, I just, I know that he, per did, they were Paul's purchase. I don't think I actually testified about the Legos. I think that was a conversation with police. Well, I'll leave the jury to their recollection of that, but I, I, I remember you saying Legos, and not ashamed to admit the fact that I'm actually a fan of Legos too, so that's why it stuck out in my mind that you just said it earlier today. Um, but to be clear, your testimony is those were Paul's, those were never used on Timothy, right? As far as I know, mm -hmm. yes, sir. Okay. Let's look at that top text message, 5460. <coughs> top two text messages. Again, the blue is you. Uh, the Wisely transaction is handcuffs and leg cuffs for Timothy from Amazon. Figured it would be okay to get those right away until we can talk about the sensors and stuff. If not, please say so and can cancel the order. Okay. I don't remember that. 
You, you don't remember that message? Strange that she doesn't remember that, but remembers a very elaborate story that is probably false that she said earlier in the day. It's almost like she is lying on the stand in order to get away with torturing her autistic son, because she is doing that. You really do have some memory problems, don't you? Yes, sir. That's common with PTSD. Yeah. Page 5829, if you could read that last text there at the bottom and then continues on to the next page. Uh, he has moved around, so he got the cuffs in front of him instead of behind him. Go ahead and flip the page and read the next one. Uh, I put the cuffs back behind him. I will have to deal with less than two hours of sleep today, but not letting him get away with this BS. I put the cuffs back behind him. That is your text message. Yes, sir. So you use handcuffs on Timothy? I don't remember, honestly. You That's... don't remember using? No, sir. And you said that the transaction, the wisely transaction, was the light cuffs and handcuffs for Timothy. That was your text message. That's you know, what the message said. Is that the I don't know as well? You don't remember that one either? There, between the time of the stroke and Timothy's passing, there's, I don't remember a heck of a lot. But somehow you can remember when the police ask you about the leg irons and the cuffs, you say those were for <clears throat> Paul for a TikTok video, right? I, th I think that's what I told that's them. That's what you told the police? Yes. So you don't remember things, but you have the wherewithal to make it look like, no, no, those don't involve Timothy, those, those are Paul. It's pretty self-serving, isn't it? Before we go any further, I just want to say that this may be my favorite prosecutor that we've ever observed on this channel. A close second would be the prosecutor for the Chandler Halderson case, but you can hear this man's actual annoyance with Shanda. Knowing the details of the case, her attitude becomes so impossibly grating, and the fact that she didn't hide it is really great to observe. I'll withdraw the last part. You had the wherewithal to say that the, like, the, the cuffs that they found belonged to Paul when your text message indicates they were actually for Timothy, right? Apparently, yes, sir. Mr. Johnson asked you about the zip ties. Remember? Yes, sir. Did you ever use zip ties on Timothy? Uh, to attach the... Um, the personal sensor, okay. and then I, I, I remember hearing about a conversation about them, yes, on text. I don't remember it, but I, I remember hearing about it when it was read. You remember hearing about a conversation. Did, did, that, did, did that make you stop and go, oh my, oh my goodness, we can't be putting Timothy in, in zip ties? Yes, I mean, that's what I thought here, yes, yeah. sir. Sure, okay. Well, then this, uh, if you care to read the bottom of 4227, that's Paul's message to you. Uh, oh, this is from earlier. He just won't listen or does something I didn't tell him he could. He just tried claiming his zip cuffs were too tight when I didn't even tighten them to where there's no room for his wrists. This is your response now. Yeah, leave them as they are and I will check them when I get home and you can tell him that. And if he lied about that, he gets himself in even more trouble. You want me to keep going? No, that's fine. Leave them as they are and I will check them when I get home. <laughs> You want to revise your earlier answer to the question when you said that you would have said, oh, no, don't use zip cuffs on Timothy? I don't recall that, sir. I'm sorry. Don't recall that either? Huh? No, sir. Okay. Um, you, you seem to be having a lot of difficulty in when it comes to the text messages that are talking about the things that you either did or want done to Timothy. Um, is, is that where the, the, the memory issues kick in for you? It's most of what happened. It's not just text messages. It's, and it doesn't just involve him. It's, I mean, the events of the whole six months are. So if, if, so all the other text messages that are just about, you know, hey, how's your day going, or get your bike tire fixed, all those types of things, those are all clarity moments, right? <coughs> you, you know, I, I don't issues rem with. I don't know if I, I mean, if you showed me, I don't know if I'd remember them or not, honestly. That's, we send a lot of text messages. No, but I'm, what, what, I guess that was a clumsy way of asking that question. You're certainly capable of engaging in a conversation with Paul that's not about anything for Timothy, right? I mean, I would assume so. I don't, I mean, as far as memory goes, my, my memory of those is not. Um, well, let me just, we'll just see what your explanation is for this. So we're, this is 5785. This is June 21st of 2022. This is a week or so after that picture, and we'll get to the picture in a minute that you say that you never saw. Go ahead and read your text message to Paul. 
uh, four with hot sauce that he has to eat, and he has, has allowed another four without, it says house sauce, but he has to do the hot sauce one first, and then set a timer for 30 minutes before you can eat the others. What time is that set? Uh, 8.05 p.m. To the, to the second, please. Uh, 18. Okay. What's your next text message? Um, 80547. 30, um, 30 seconds or so later. Yes, sir. I was using Siri because yeah. I was driving. Yeah. You could tell by the issues with the text message. Sure. I found enough in change to get Gabriel some chicken nuggets and french fries from Burger King. It's like three bucks total, so we will be home as soon as I do that. Do you remember sending the hot sauce text? I don't remember sending either one of these texts, sir. Don't remember sending either one of those? No, sir, I don't. But you can process that Timothy needs to eat some bread with hot sauce on it. But you scrounged up enough change to make sure that G gets some chicken nuggets and fries. We're Within 30 seconds. Processing that all in your mind. Sending it all out in a text message, right? Apparently, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Like I said, he's serious. Let's talk about the photograph. It's... People's 36A. Uh, Mr. Johnson asked you about it, so if you remembered the text exchange, <coughs> including the photograph of Timothy, right? Yes, sir. And, uh, just, well, I, the jury's seen that a couple of times. I don't think they need to see it again right now. Let's go ahead and read the exchange there, starting with the message that Paul sent to you with the photograph. Um, Timothy tried to sneak food. I yelled at him, and then he became momentarily unresponsive, and then I saw this. He's bone thin, Mama, I think. I think we need to actually feed him. Okay. And what's your response to that? I said, Kay, give him bread, please. And then I said, I hear you. Give PB sandwiches and water. You want me to keep going? Yep. Yeah. Okay, the unresponsiveness is probably fake, but I see what you mean. Okay. And go ahead and the next page. Uh, also, it's no wonder he's hardly kept ending. Then that's one was photographs of his legs, right? Yeah, and then I said, I'm in court. So was it really your testimony that you never saw that photograph? I do not recall seeing it. I, that was it. I feel like I want to throw up. If you recall, Shanda said that she never saw the picture that was sent, specifically because she responded to the text message via her Apple Watch. She claimed the photo was too small to make out, but here she clearly remarks on the photo, states she saw it, and notices that Timothy's legs were so thin that it was no wonder he had a hard time standing. And yet, even after this, the abuse did not stop. This was shortly after he died, when he was under 70 pounds, and they still chose to restrict food from him, as well as have him sleep on the cold ground, force him to wear a motion sensor alarm, and had him sit in ice baths for hours. To be clear, she didn't say she didn't recall seeing it earlier in the day. She recalled, in immaculate detail, getting and responding to the text message. She said when she got it, how big the image was on the watch, and remarked exactly how quickly it took her to write back. If her story was simply that she didn't recall seeing the image, that she had no idea how bad things were, and that she sent those messages while blacked out, she would have said as much. But instead, she gave an entirely different version of events, one that doesn't align with the direct evidence. We know she has done this before, given all the lies she told the police the night of Timothy's death, so this is in line with her pattern of behavior. When someone makes her look bad, she will simply lie to try and make herself look better. The only issue is that there is no amount of lies that can actually excuse what she has done. You don't recall seeing the photograph, right? No, sir. The unresponsiveness is probably fake, but I see what you mean. You literally use the word see in your text message about see what you mean. But your testimony today is, I didn't, I didn't look at the photograph. I didn't see the photograph. Yes, sir. That's, I mean, it's a phrase that you use. It's a phrase that you use? I see what you mean? Yes, sir. Isn't that usually when you see the things that the people are talking about? Sometimes. Mm. I'm wondering why. She says G is under her breath here, and it seems that she might be realizing, finally, how horribly this is going. Your response to your son saying that your other child is bone thin and needs to eat, actually feed him. That's the phrase. Actually feed him. Right? That's what he said, yes sir. Right? And your response to that is, K, give him bread please, or bread with peanut butter. Is that right? Yes sir. Not, oh my goodness, this is, if he's that hungry, yeah, make him a, 
make him some chicken nuggets, make him some pizza, make him some pizza rolls, make him any one of a dozen or so things that were in your freezer or your refrigerator, any of that. But that wasn't your response, was it? No, sir. I was, like I said, I was in court. I just was scrambling for an answer. You were in court, but you were able to send one, two, three text messages before you said you are in court, right? Yes, sir. And the first answer you come up with to feed your child was giving bread? I don't remember what I was thinking at the time, sir. I just know that I was distracted because I was in the middle of stuff with court. But not so distracted that you can say, well, the unresponsiveness is probably fake, but I see what you mean. Like, I don't know how, I mean, I don't know what was going on when that was sent. Mm -hmm. I honestly don't. Mr. Johnson asked you about the hot sauce that you uh, ordered, and we saw the bottles of hot sauce. Those weren't, <clears throat> those weren't just ordered from Meyer, were they? No. You had to special order those, didn't you? On Amazon, yes, sir. Um, I think you said the reason that you couldn't just get those from Meyer for your grocery delivery things is because they just didn't have hot sauce, right? No, they didn't have that type of hot sauce. That type of hot sauce. Yes, sir. Okay. How did you, how did you conclude that that was the type of hot sauce that Timothy? How do I put this? Both loved and got to be used as a punishment? Because the, the hot sauce that I had and the ones that I could access on the apps, he, could, he loved those hot sauces, so. So you had to go out of your way to find one even hotter, one that he didn't like? Yes, sir. Okay. And the, the hot sauce started as Paul's idea? Yes, sir. How do you come up with the idea to do hot sauce if Timothy likes hot sauce? Um, well, he said that, that if he, I guess he'd read something, if I remember correctly. I don't, I mean, this, the conversation's not, I mean, it's vague at best, but um, from what I remember, he'd said something about, he'd read something about something really hot, some new something. He's like, oh, this might be an idea to do it with a, a sauce that he doesn't like. So you tested out other hot sauces before you got to that point, and because he didn't react, you figured, let's just keep increasing the heat? Is that it? No, that, I mean, I don't remember which, I mean, how, how many I ordered, but I just went with something that was, that, was super, that was hotter than what I could get. So you tried to punish him with a lower hot sauce, but he, he doesn't respond, so then you increase how hot it is, I right? didn't try with the lower because he already knew he liked the lower hot sauce. <clears throat> so how did it even occur to you to be a punishment for him for, to find one even hotter then? How is that even a punishment if he likes hot sauce? He never liked even the hot sauce, did he? Huh? Yes, he did. He, he, he ate spicy food. You heard, you heard Paul's testimony yesterday. I did. And you heard him say that he never wanted to eat those slices of bread with the hot sauce on it. Didn't you? You heard that testimony. That's what he, I heard him say, yes. And, and, and your response to that in a lot of these text messages was make sure you use even more hot sauce than <coughs> you did before, right? If that's what you say, the text messages say. Oh, you just read the one that said he yes. can have four, and then he can wait 30 minutes, and then he can have some without hot sauce on it. You read that one, right? Yes, sir. But again, you don't remember sending that text message. No, sir. But aliens didn't take a hold of your phone and take over your body or anything like that, did they? No, sir. No. Mr. Johnson didn't ask you, so I'll just go ahead and ask you. You used a number of other physical methods of punishing Timothy, didn't you? It's a fine number. Yeah, okay, fine. Two. You made him do wall sits? Uh, one time. And that was Paul's suggestion as well. He said, oh, this, this used to drive me crazy. Um, I guess he said that, Paul said that his dad and stepmom had used that as a punishment with him. And so we decided to give it a try. And Timothy could have cared less. He, he what? He could not have cared less? No. So, so being made to stand as if there's no support under your legs, he was, he was okay to do that? I mean... How I, long did you have him do it for? A couple of minutes. A couple of minutes? Yes, sir. When was that? I don't remember, honestly. And running the stairs? Yes, sir. You had him do that a lot, didn't you? I wouldn't say a lot. I, it was some. In fact, there was one, there's one text exchange in here where you talk about make sure that he does it a lot, even if it's raining and cold outside, right? That's what the text says, yes, sir. And Paul talks about doing it chasing style at one point, where he follow, he chases him up and down the stairs, right? Yes, sir. And the stairs we're talking about are outside. Yes, sir. They're not inside. No, they're out back. So cold, rainy. Yep, go go run the stairs outside. What what did he? Do? What was the awful crime he had done to warrant doing that? I don't remember, sir.
direct you to page 6011. Bottom text. I wonder how it would feel to have that hot sauce on your private parts. I'm not saying touching there, not at all, but dripping a little bit there is that horrible. Yes, it is. This is a mother openly fantasizing about burning the genitals of her underage son with her adult son. Did you have to ask that question? I wouldn't think so. I don't remember that. I can't even imagine saying that. But you did. I know, but I can't even imagine it. About your child, right? Who at that point was in the middle of an ice bath that had lasted at least two and a half hours at that point, right? What, are you asking if I said that? I'm asking you if you said that when your child was in an ice bath for two and a half hours at that point in time, because this is 425 in the afternoon and you're watching on the camera from work and texting with Paul about what he's supposed to be doing with him, with him in the tub, right? I mean, if that's what was, I, I don't remember. I, if that's what it says, I'm not arguing that. I'm not trying to argue that. I'm just saying I don't know. It just popped in your head today. Yeah, I wonder what hot sauce on your private parts would be like. That. I have no idea where it came from. No I have no idea. idea. Did you ever try that hot sauce? No, I don't like food as spicy as Timothy. Mm. Okay. About the hottest I can handle is um, jalapeno cheddar Cheetos. I'm, I'm with you there. I can't handle hot sauce either. So you never even, but administering it as a punishment multiple times, you thought was okay without even trying it yourself first. Yes, sir. I have a very weak stomach, and so I didn't want to throw up. Um, let's talk about the ice maker for a second. Uh, People's 31 and People's 32. Yes, sir. You recognize that as the ice maker? Yes, sir. It's the countertop ice maker. Right. You said it makes about a cup and a half of ice? Yes, sir. This is a cup and a half of ice in your mind? No, I measured it. I actually used it to, um, you can get, I don't know if you've ever had a frappe from McDonald's, but uh, Walmart sells a powder mix that you can, you add uh, milk and ice to. And it's really good and it's only like a dollar, three dollars at McDonald's. And so the, it calls for, I, for some reason I want to say it actually calls for more than a cup and a half, but that's all I could get out of it. But yes, that's in a measuring cup, like a sitting up measuring cup, it's a cup and a half. That's all it does. Shanda clearly understands how poorly her time on the stand is going now, and she is trying to distract herself from what she is doing. All she needed to say was yes or no, and instead, she went on a sputtering minute-long diatribe about McDonald's iced coffees, and how she bought the powdered coffee mix. The jury just heard her openly fantasize about burning her son's genitals with hot sauce, so they're likely not believing her narrative, and it's just beginning to dawn on her. And this reality is simply too much for her to handle. Any other topic, no matter how trivial or silly it seems, would be a welcome distraction. And the, uh, I think your testimony earlier was you didn't know that ice was being used, is that right? As far in as the what? cold baths. Not unless it was specified. I mean, there was, there, was, there was sometimes where it said cold and sometimes where it said ice. I didn't say I didn't know it was being used. Okay. It was, if, it, if it was cold, it was supposed to be just cold. But all you would use would be the ice that, was, that you get out of that ice maker. You wouldn't make any more ice and put it away and no. store it up so we could have extra for the next day, would you? Not that I remember ever doing, no. Okay. Page 5823. I'm going to read that. Those are all your text messages. Um, oh, yeah, I know, but I wasn't nice tonight either. Made me feel horrible, but no way was he getting away with that crap. Um, let him know that if he tries to sleep at all, he'll get another ice bath sometime before you leave for work and another when I get home. Um, and I said, might want to toss that, the ice that is made into some Ziploc bags in the freezer tomorrow for if we need a bunch more. You want to change your earlier answer? <clears throat> no, because we never did it. Not that I, I mean, you can ask Paul, you can recall him, but I don't remember ever tossing it. But your suggestion to him was, hey, we need to be ready to make more ice and use in the ice baths, right? That's what the text message said, but we never saved the ice. So that was your intention, was to have a backup plan if you needed to have more ice, right? That's what the text says. And that was Mark. That was June twenty seventh. Or excuse, yes, June twenty seventh. That was about a week before Timothy died, right? Yes, sir. And that's about two weeks after you were sent the text message with the picture that you didn't see. Yes, sir. 
Mr. Roberts? Yes, sir. Uh, sidebar, please. Sure. One of the biggest issues that Chandra is facing right now is that either way you slice this story, she is still a liar. Even if you believe she did as she said and saved up bags of ice to make Timothy's cold baths even more excruciating, or you believe that she decided that that was a bridge too far and lied about that in her text messages with her son for virtually no reason, she has already proven to the jury that they cannot put their faith in anything she said for the past three hours, which is the exact opposite of what she would be after. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Van Ark, I think we're just finishing up. I was just talking about the ice bath with you. Again, your text was, let him know that if he tries to sleep at all, he'll get another ice bath sometime before you leave for work and another when I get home. So let's, let's break apart that sentence for just a moment if we can. And that was on March 27th. Right, so yeah, about nine days or so before Timothy passes away. Let him know that if he tries to sleep at all. Let's start there. This is at 3 o'clock in the morning, you're saying he is not allowed to go to sleep, right? Yes, sir. So 3 o'clock in the morning, your 15-year-old child is not allowed to be sleeping, and if he does, he gets an ice bath, right? Yes, sir. And he'll get another ice bath, i.e., there's already been an ice bath prior to this text being sent, correct? No, sir. That, that was, it would be one and then another, is what it says. Okay, well, let me read it again and make sure I, maybe I've misread it. Let him know that if he tries to sleep at all, he'll get another ice bath sometime before you leave for work and another when I get home. There's two anothers in there, isn't there? Yes, sir. The first another refers to the first ice bath. In other words, there's already been an ice bath, right? I mean, I don't know. It's, I'm not questioning the, the, what's in the text, but I don't know. But you do know. You just said he was wrong, based on your first-hand knowledge, believing that you could make the texts where you were talking about torturing your autistic child sound less damning. Let's put ourselves in Shanda's shoes for a bit. Let's say we are talking to a friend about how we blacked out during the previous week. Maybe we got a little bit messy, said some things we didn't mean, and acted like a drunk fool for a night. We remember what we did. We were in control of what we did, but we feel mortified by our actions, so whenever they are brought up to us, we claim we simply have no memory of them. Surely, no one will hold us accountable if we have no idea what we did. We can sweep the whole night under the rug and move on like nothing happened. But then, we talk to a friend who we saw that night, a person whom we spoke to in an inappropriate manner. We said some things we regret, and we use the patented, sorry I was just, blacked out drunk excuse. They seemingly accept that, yet they still want to discuss my behavior and how it made them feel. If we, the person who is pretending to have no memory of that night, were to start rebutting them, telling them I never actually said some of those things that they are talking about, remarking that they got details of the event that I swear I don't remember wrong, that would immediately inform them that I am lying. They would quickly realize they cannot trust my first-hand account of the event at all. That is what Shanda is doing. She's been demonstrating this the entire time she's been in court. Whenever other witnesses were called to testify and give their account of what happened, including Paul, Shanda would shake her head, get extremely agitated, and remark how they were lying under her breath. But, in her own version of events, she has quite sincerely no reason to believe that. If what she's been putting forward is true, and she has no memory of any of the abuse she inflicted on her son, she would be horrified at her actions. She would be in court looking incredibly repentant, saying that while she has no memory of what she's done, she deeply regrets hurting her child. She would have the wherewithal to realize that putting Timothy in foster care was a better choice than torturing him to death, and she wouldn't constantly be excusing her behavior. Yet, that is all she's been doing. She is trying to weasel her way out of saying what she did was her fault and she was wrong for doing it, but she ruins her own arguments at every turn. And then sometime before, he, before Paul leaves work, he, he'll get another ice bath and then another one when you get home. So two ice baths, in addition to the one he's already had, right? If that's what it says. And that's for the crime of sleeping. I don't know what the, uh, the original, whatever happened before that. But you know what it was to, to get him to not do another one, right? Yes, sir. Let him know that if he says. tries to sleep at all. That's what it says, yes, sir. Yeah. Might want to toss the ice that is made into some Ziploc bags in the freezer tomorrow for if we need a bunch more. I think that kind of speaks for itself. We'll move on. Let me show you an exchange um, from May 9th, 2022. This is pages 5348. 
<clears throat> Give me just a second. I apologize. Start at page 5340, and this is from May 9th. I don't think you need to read the top one. That's Paul's message. Go ahead and start reading there. From May 9th, 2022. Um, what is daddling anyway? Um, please make sure Timothy goes into his room with the alarm on when you leave. I should be home not too long after you go, as long as you, as long as you before you go. And please let me know where you put the alarm when you leave. All right, let me stop you right there. This is May 9th. And again, you're referring to an alarm, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. This Go is, ahead. okay. Go ahead. I know what just, that's referring just, to. Let's keep going. Okay. Okay. KK, thanks. Uh, YW, you're welcome. Um, I logged out of that for you, but you will not be allowed to have any devices tomorrow before work unless you manage, unless you manage to get everything done I assigned to M standards, which will not be easy. <coughs> not sure what part of Timothy going nowhere but the bathroom without being watched closely but he stole a bunch more of the Easter basket today and hid the wrappers behind the washer and dryer because he obviously wasn't washed as he should have been. Okay, so at that, so at this point on May 9th, you're saying that Timothy needs to be watched if he goes everywhere except for the bathroom, right? He needs to be watched, yes, sir. For committing the crime of what? Uh, we had a combined Easter basket that year, and so I had divvied it out between everybody, and he stole some that was Gabriel's cheese and... Uh, I don't know if it was Paul's or mine, but he's, he'd already had his portion of it. No, he hadn't, because you were starving him. The fact that she wants the jury to believe that while she was starving him to death, she was also lovingly dividing the family Easter spoils with him is ridiculous. She was punishing him for the crime of eating her Easter candy by locking him in a closet, and she continues to defend that action. When she discusses Timothy stealing food, she insists that it wasn't the eating that was the problem, it was the fact that he was lying about it but she wasn't feeding him at all. By the end of his life, Timothy likely associated eating with being punished, so asking his mother or Paul directly for food would be terrifying. He wouldn't feel the need to lie about what he ate. If he did get his hands on food, and the fact that he felt the need to hide candy wrappers behind the laundry machines shows how deeply paranoid Timothy had become in the home. Well, taking candy from an Easter basket means that, that he gets watched and can't have any privacy anywhere except the bathroom, right? Yes, sir. Okay, keep going. Um, that I, it was a star. What part of watching Timothy closely was unclear? Sheesh. Let me stop you right there. What okay. part of watching Timothy was unclear? Why was it that you believed at that point that Paul wasn't watching Timothy? I was correcting. It's the little star. I was correcting what, um, where was it? Usually if I use the star like that, it was for, um, to correct something that Siri messed up or something I messed up. I don't know, I'm not sure. I've only got these messages, I'm not sure. Okay, but but the, the part that you read there said what again? What part of watching Timothy closely was unclear, sheesh. Okay, so you were upset at that point that Paul wasn't watching Timothy closely enough, correct? Yes, sir. And the only way you would know that Paul wasn't watching Timothy closely enough is if you were also watching Timothy closely enough, correct? I don't know at that point. I don't know if somehow I found out about the Easter basket. This is, well, this is, hold on. <coughs> okay, yeah, this was, we must have been at a baseball game. It was 6.20 p.m., 6.43 p.m. So, yeah, I must have been watching him from. So you're at a baseball game for G, and, and you're watching Timothy, Timothy and yes. Paul to make sure Paul's watching Timothy closely enough. Correct? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Do you remember all this text exchange? No, sir, I don't. You don't remember this at all? No. Okay, go ahead. Keep reading. Okay. Okay, there's no way that was today, Mama. Don't blame me. He that's literally Paul, right? yes. I didn't mean to cut you off, but that's Paul, right? Yes, sir. Okay. He literally never had the opportunity to steal anything. I made sure of that. The response to that is? Uh, when he was putting clothes on my bed, he did actually. And watch, it's ye tone with me. Should have been the, not ye. Right. Um, so you knew that Timothy had done something when he was putting clothes away. Yes, right? sir. And the only way the, you would know that is by monitoring the cameras, right? Yes, sir. Um, I never gave him permission to even set foot in your room. I swear he must have done it when I went to the bathroom. Okay, keep going. He's trying to get me in trouble here, this Mom. This is all Paul, right? Yeah, this is okay. Paul. And I told him to go to his room when I did. I brought him downstairs with me so his sneaky butt escaped. 
you have to remember that at the same time Shanda is saying that everything she had done to Timothy was justified, she was also claiming that she technically didn't do the worst of it and was just doing what Paul told her to do. But this text exchange shows that can't be true. Paul was scared of his mother. He was an adult who was stronger and could defend himself from her if need be. But when she tells him to watch his tone with her, he immediately becomes submissive in these messages, saying that he's been torturing Timothy the exact way that she has, because he's such a good boy, and that Timothy must be trying to get him in trouble. He has no backbone to stand up to her, and is so conditioned to do whatever she wants that he views his autistic brother trying to find food as him trying to hurt him. This is also the same brother who was you know, only 15 and starving. We watched Paul earlier in this video. He has admitted fault and has openly discussed the abuse he put his brother through, acknowledging that what he did was wrong and that there was no excuse for it. But Mother of the Year over here is trying to assert that, somehow, he was the criminal mastermind, that he was the one manipulating her to hurt her son, and she was powerless against him. I watched him go into his room. And what's your response there? We uh, I said he never. He said he never asked, but I've mentioned before you need to take him downstairs when you go to the bathroom so he can't escape. All right, yes. Let me, let me just. Okay. That's. I think we can stop there. You don't remember sending these text messages. No, sir. No memory from this time period. No, sir. Because of all the blackouts, all the tunnel vision, all the PTSD, right? No, sir. Okay. He said he never asked, but I've mentioned before you need to take him downstairs when you go to the bathroom so he can't escape. That was what you said though, right? Yes, sir. You actually used the phrase escape in relation to your 15-year-old child. Apparently, yes, sir. As if he was some prisoner. No, sir. Well, who else needs to escape but a prisoner? I'm going to draw that. May 9th, right? I, is, yeah, that's what it said. You don't remember that at all? No, sir. When was Mother's Day 2022? I don't remember honestly. If I told you it was May 8th, would you have reason to doubt that? No, sir, not at all, I believe you. Mr. Johnson was asking you, uh, and you were very eager to tell him about something that you remembered happening on sometime just after Mother's Day, right? Correct. That Timothy got on a scale and weighed 108 pounds. 104. 104 pounds, I'm sorry, I'm glad you corrected me. I wrote it down as 104 pounds, right? It's amazing your memory is that good that you can remember what your son weighed sometime after May 8th, but you can't remember talking about having him escape. Would you care to explain that to the jury? Yes, sir. That happened with the PTSD, with everything else that was going on. I would, especially when I got stressed, it would, the, the tunnel vision, and I mean, I can't, for lack of a better term, blacking out. Um, it, pretty much any time my stress level went up, and it, I mean, it wasn't up that day that, that we did the weigh the dog. So you can't remember all of these text messages about the ice baths and the hot sauce and the zip ties and the handcuffs, but you remember over 18 months ago that your son weighed 108 pounds sometime after Mother's Day of 2022, correct? 104, yes. 104. Sir. You, well, you it was, got it down. You're right. When we have covered men and women taking the stand in their own defense, there is usually some moment like this one where they feel the need to correct the prosecution on something small to assert their dominance over them. They want to regain some sort of control over the situation, because being forced to sit in a room and answer questions about a crime you committed is inherently uncomfortable, especially if you are someone like Shanda, who feels the need to deeply control the people directly around her. But why she would say this, why she would correct the prosecution by stating that Timothy weighed less than he had just said at this moment, I do not know. It's so unfathomably stupid, it makes her look so horrendously terrible that it probably felt involuntary to her, like it's her fucking Tourette's. She just had to correct the prosecutor to make him feel small, like he was less than her, which is re fucking markable. He made well, he made a, a comment that just things like that will stick out to me sometimes. And when when he couldn't pick the dog up, bear in mind this is a service dog in training, so he's he's used to being getting commands. And Timothy, I remember he put his hands on his hips and looked at Sharma and said, "Next time you get to pick me up." And the dog tilted his head like. I don't understand that command, and it just, that struck me, it sticks in my head. I don't know why, but that sticks in my head. What day was it? I don't know what day of the week it was, sir. It was during the week. But how long after Mother's Day was it then? I don't remember, sir. I know, the reason I know it was after Mother's Day is because um, mom, my mother-in-law, for, for probably the last four or five years, as a Mother's Day gift, has given me um, cherry tomato plants and then miniature cucumber plants and I keep them in like plant bags 
I no land of black thumb, I admit it, but I've managed to keep these um, alive pretty well. Um, and I had just, when we came, when I came upstairs to weigh the dog, I had just gone downstairs and checked on my plants. So the plants were outside then, so I know it was after Mother's Day, I just don't know when. Plants never missed a feeding then, did they? Objection, Your Honor. I love this prosecutor. He's the absolute best. But he's right. She is so proud about how she has kept these stupid fucking plants alive, but who cares? You killed your son. You withheld so much food from him that he went from being comfortably over 100 pounds to being 60 pounds when he died. The fact that she is shocked and offended by this comment is so out of touch. You killed someone. You can't say it's offensive to call you a murderer. What's argumentative about it? She's, she's proud of herself and keeping plants alive. Plants never Mr. Roberts, says it's no relevant question, so sustain. So your testimony is Timothy weighed 104 pounds sometime after May 9th, correct? Yes, sir. That doesn't look anything like 104 pounds, does it? No, sir. And that's not even a month, that's barely a month after May 9th, isn't it? Yes, sir. I lose weight very quickly. I'm assuming he got that from me. And again, the response to this was give him bread, right? If that's what the text message says, yes, sir. <clears throat> Mr. Johnson asked you about the, uh, some text messages back and forth between you and Paul during the ice bath the last day, the day before Timothy dies. Um, and you were observing that ice bath from work, right? I glanced in on it. I wasn't observing the whole time. I, didn't, I couldn't. You weren't observing the entire time? Not the entire time. I glanced in on it. Whenever you'd send a text message, you were also looking at the camera, weren't you? No, I wanted Paul to think I was. And Mr. Johnson asked you if you remember the text about, honestly, tell me if you think this is all fake. Remember that? Vaguely. You vaguely remember that text? Yes, sir. So you can remember the text where it, it, it tries to provide you with a defense to this, but you can't remember any of the horrible things that you did to Timothy. Is that your testimony here today? I don't have any control over what I can remember and what I don't, sir. You recall Paul's testimony yesterday about what he did in response to that photograph that he sent you and about saying we really need to feed him, Mama? I think we actually need to feed him, I believe, is the actual text. Yes, sir. I remember his testimony. And what was his testimony? That he gave him peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and I guess he cooked him some eggs. That was the first time you heard about that, wasn't it? Yes, sir. And that was not his instructions, was it? No, sir, but that was fine. I had no problem with that. Well, why did you just tell him to make him some eggs in the first place, then? Because I didn't think of it. I was in the middle of something. As a reminder, Paul said when she gave his brother a sandwich and a small portion of eggs, he purposely didn't tell his mother because he didn't want her to be mad at him. He knew implicitly that if she had known he fed Timothy more than just some bread with hot sauce on it, he would face her wrath as well. So like Timothy had been doing the entire time he was in the home, Paul hid the evidence and lied to his mother. The next portion of the video involves Shanda, pretending to get sick on the stand when looking at a picture of Timothy. If you are sensitive to people pretending to throw up, skip ahead to the timestamp on the screen. But to be clear, she doesn't actually throw up. She just mimes it poorly. I think we actually need to start feeding him and the only thing you can come up with instead of Paul thinking to give him scrambled eggs is give him some bread. That's all you could think of. It's, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I was in the middle of something. I wasn't... I wouldn't have thought of eggs anyway, not in the middle of the day. You said that you would, the, the punishments, and I guess this 3 o'clock in the morning one about not letting him sleep or he gets an ice bath, so he's got to be awake at 3 o'clock in the morning. You said that was because he would keep you guys up in the middle of the night or wake you up in the middle of the night? Yes. Yes, sir. Can you, and again, you did really well on the logic and reason por reasoning portion of the, the LSAT exam. Can you explain the reasoning behind keeping somebody awake when they're keeping you awake? To show them how it feels. But they're already awake, aren't they? It made sense to me, sir. That's, now that you ask it, but it, it doesn't seem to make sense. But it made sense to me at the time. You didn't actually mean that as a punishment. That, that was just out of spite. You were just angry with Timothy for keeping you awake, weren't you? No, it was meant as a punishment, sir. But it's also a punishment for yourself because you have to stay awake as well, don't you? I don't sleep much anyway, but yes, sir. Or Paul has to stay awake, right? Yes, sir. Paul's an insomniac as well. You testified that you gave, Paul, you gave Timothy a warm bath the night before he passed away, that last night, July 5th. Do you recall that? Yes, sir. That was the first time you've told anybody connected to this case that you'd done that, isn't it? 
Yes, sir. You never told the police officers you did that, did you? No, sir. <clears throat> I imagine a warm bath sounds just like, it's just what it sounds like, right? You, you got him, you took him to the bath, you grew a warm bath for him, and you put him in the bathtub, right? Yes, sir. This is hours before he dies, right? Yes, sir. You look like that when you put him in the bathtub? Just to be clear, again, she didn't throw up. When a person throws up, there's usually a subsequent noise that follows them gagging, which indicates the liquid that came out of their mouth has landed on the floor, or in this case, a trash can. As anyone who has ever thrown up, they will tell you that it's not a silent affair. But despite Shanda's theatrics, there is no sound after she gags. There's no splash, there's no liquid hitting the bin lining, it's just quiet. I know the uploader of this footage didn't remove the sound, as the ambient noise of the room is still very much present. So Shanda, knowing she is coming across poorly, knowing that people don't believe that she cared for her son or has blackouts in her memory, decided to pull a Hail Mary by vomiting at the side of her son. Mind you, she didn't throw up when she tortured him. She took glee, talking about pouring hot sauce on his genitals. And when he was dying, sitting alone in the closet she kept him shackled in, she came in and made fun of the way he was breathing. None of that made her sick, but she wants us to believe that seeing it does. <coughs> you may be seated. Sir Roberts, you can continue. Thank you. Uh, before we get back to the question I originally, originally asked Ms. Van der Ark, um, you just obviously had quite a, uh, a visual reaction there to the jury, a physical reaction in front of the jury looking at those photographs. That's not the first time you've seen these photographs, though, is it? No, sir. In fact, you sat in this very courtroom not even a week ago on Friday when we had a hearing about those photographs and looked at those photographs, didn't you? I did not look at them last week, sir. You didn't look at them last week? No, sir, I did not. But you've looked at them before, haven't you? It was, I think it was at the prelim, and I just felt, I gagged that day, too. It just wasn't as bad. Didn't throw up, though. No, it wasn't as bad. So if there's video from that hearing that we had last week where you thumbed through the photographs, including the autopsy photos without vomiting, do you just not remember that as well? We didn't have the autopsy, we didn't have those photos over at our table, sir. You, it won't be on the video, I can promise you that. Well, then I'll return to my original question. Those three photographs depict your son hours after you supposedly put him in a warm bath. Did he look like that when you put him in the warm bath, but for the fact that he was alive? I did not look at him, sir. He was 15. I tried to give him his privacy. It may sound lame, but I, I intentionally look away. That's, that's why Paul did most of his baths, is because he's 15 and I didn't think that was appropriate. So she didn't give this poor kid an ounce of privacy in his life. He lived with her for a year and she had cameras in his room, motion sensors meant for bikes locked to his body, motion sensing cameras in the bathroom he used. She timed his bowel movements, giving him one minute to pee and two minutes to defecate. And she wants us to believe that the day he died, she finally gave him some privacy. That she put him in a nice warm bath lovingly, and finally, didn't observe him at all. She spent her days at the courthouse, glued to watching Timothy on the cameras linked to her phone. Torturing him was her favorite reality show and hobby. She fantasized about pouring hot sauce on his genitals. But sure, she gave him his privacy. So you didn't put him in the bathtub? No, he was already in the tub. I did, just looked at did you get him out of the tub? Um, I don't remember. I think, I think so later that night. I would assume so. Later that night? How long was he in the tub? Well, night to me is any time after work. So. Okay. How long was he in the tub? I don't, I mean, I don't think it was long after I got home, but I don't know. And again, you didn't tell the police officers this when they talked to you about what had happened the night before, did you? I, I don't remember. Apparently, I didn't. Well, so you don't remember what you told the police officers? I remember part of it, but, I mean, I'm, I, if you say I didn't tell them, then I'm, 
I trust your word there. If you told the police officers that you noticed he was skinny, so you made him some bread and put some butter on it and watched him eat three quarters of it and then sent him to bed, is that, does that refresh your recollection about what you told the officers? I mean, I, I hear what you're saying. I don't remember saying it, but... So you don't remember saying those things to the police officer? No, sir. And those things clearly didn't happen, did they? No, sir. How did he get into his room that night? I don't remember, sir. Last page of text messages. You can go ahead and read that very top text message, please. Please set your alarm for 6 a.m. I ended up dragging him back to a small room because I wasn't going to risk him having access to the tub or other things overnight. He's still trying to be stupid, but I will tell you more tomorrow while I take you to work, describing how many different ways I proved that he's still faking. He's still doing it, though. It's beyond ridiculous. In the last days of his life, Timothy was nonverbal. He could barely keep his eyes open. He was incontinent and he could hardly stand without assistance. But to Shanda, that was all fake. She had starved him so severely, but in her mind, everything he was doing was simply to inconvenience her. He had eaten all the candy because he was greedy. He had set off the alarms on purpose to keep her up at night. He had begun wetting the bed in order to hinder her. It never occurred to her that those things were all signs of failing health and continuous abuse, and that those were things that were also hurting him, because she had absolutely no ability to empathize with her son. Even now, as she validates and justifies her behavior on the stand, while saying she has no memory of it, she still cannot empathize with the boy she murdered. If you have ever been around someone like this, you know how frustrating even talking to them can be. Normal things like not responding to a text message are seen as deliberate acts of malice, and even if you simply fell asleep before responding, or were busy with something else, they will berate you for making them wait. Anything that inconveniences them is an act of treason and aggression, and thusly, you may as well have been skulking around in the shadows with a betrayer, so any response they have there and after is justified. There is no understanding what someone else is going through, because to them, that doesn't matter. It's not happening to them, therefore it's not real. And even if it is real, it's not as important as what they are dealing with, since they basically are the Senate. Being around them can be anxiety-inducing. Even when everything is going right, you are always waiting for the other shoe to drop. Living with a person like that is stressful for anyone. Then add to the fact that Timothy was neurodivergent and needed special assistance from Shanda. His death feels almost inevitable. The moment he first asserted a need that didn't benefit Shanda, the moment he first ate something that she was saving or accidentally woke her up, she viewed him as a troublemaker who deserved to be punished in the most brutal of ways. And to this day, she will justify that. <coughs> I ended up dragging him back to his small room because I wasn't going to risk him having access to the tub or other things overnight. Plan was for him to sleep in the bathroom, wasn't it? I don't remember, sir. I mean, I know that if, in the text message, but if that's what the text message says. Okay. And you had to drag him back to the small room. Again, the small room being the closet, right? Yes, sir. Supposedly that he wanted to sleep in. Yes, sir. But you had to drag him there. Why was that? Well, Dragging, I mean, that could be anywhere from grabbing hold of an arm and because someone's not being cooperative, that's, that, that can be a range of things, sir, so I don't know what I was referring to there. You've seen the video, haven't you? No, sir. I haven't seen any videos. Do you need your, do you need your memory refreshed about him getting back in the small room that night? No, sir. I mean, like I said, I'll take the, I just, I don't remember actually doing it. Did you physically pull him into the room that night? Yes, sir. I mean... Shanda has seen the video. She knows she pulled him into the room. She knows that she did, by all accounts, physically drag her son's 60-pound body into the closet for him to die of hypothermia and malnourishment. But again, she needs to assert control over the situation. Correcting the prosecutor does nothing to benefit her. It makes her look worse. And there is also direct physical evidence of her guilt. Even still, she needs to lie to not let him have control in this situation, because that is more important to her. Above all else, she needs to be in charge. And did you, set, did you push him down onto the ground so that he was laying and facing the camera? If that's what it shows, then yes, sir. And did you put, position his face towards the camera? If that's what it shows, I... And did you tell him that he owes you the biggest apology on the face of the earth, and then maybe he can get out to go to the bathroom? If that's what it shows, sir, I... I don't remember. And did you return a little while later because he had rolled over away from the camera so that you couldn't see him on camera? 
If that's what it shows. I don't yeah. remember any of this. And did you tell him you don't need to open your mouth every time you breathe, dummy, and then hold his mouth shut? I don't know what I said, sir. I mean, I'll take your word for that's what the video Oh, you don't have to take my word for it. Let's play the video for you. Sir, that's not necessary. If that's what you're saying it shows. I believe you. I'm not. So you're acknowledging that the night before Timothy died, hours before he died, you dragged him, looking like that, back into his small room, positioned him in front of a camera, told him he owed you an apology, then came back later because he rolled over away from the camera and held his mouth closed and said, see, 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 you don't have to open your mouth when you breathe, dummy? You're acknowledging you did those things. If that's what the camera shows, yes, sir. You didn't put him in a warm bath that night, did you? Yes, sir, I did. But you have to drag him away from it? If that's what it says, I don't... I know that he, I, I know he had a hoodie on. You said the locks on the refrigerator were there because he got into the refrigerator, and if I heard your testimony correctly, he ate a pound of frozen hamburger? Yes, sir. That and was back. And a bag of chicken nuggets? A frozen bag of chicken nuggets, yes, sir. And, and frozen hamburger? Yes, sir. The, the hamburger was not frozen. It was refrigerated. But frozen chicken nuggets? Frozen chicken nuggets and raw bacon. And raw bacon? Yes, sir. Frozen raw bacon? No, it was in the refrigerator. The, the frozen stuff was the chicken nuggets. The chicken, chicken nuggets. nuggets. That was the only frozen yes, sir. Did you think he had an affinity for frozen food? I, I didn't know. The, frozen, the only thing he ate frozen was the chicken nuggets. Is that why you sent a text message to Paul while he was in the ice bath at 3.43 that afternoon and said, oh, okay, crazy thought. Tell him if he actually sits up by himself and stays sitting up, he will get some pizza rolls. Don't tell him it's only two, and I'm okay if they are frozen rather than cooked. Why'd you send that text message? I don't know. Don't remember that even either? No, sir. So you're not worried about him eating frozen pizza rolls if he sits up? If that's what it says. You've heard it read several times. Yes, You're not sir. doubting that's what it says, right? Yes, sir. Just another one of those memories that you just just gone from your head, right? Yes, sir. So when you told Detective Pisky that the reason the locks were on the refrigerator is because he would he would get into them and he'd leave the doors open, that was that was a lie, wasn't it? No, that was also true. He did that as well. How does putting locks on fix that problem? He can't get into it then, so it doesn't get left open. Oh, no, so, he was was, so you admit that he was not allowed access to the refrigerator or the freezer or to the pantry? As far as and the refrigerator and freezer, after we put the locks on. He it, couldn't get into them, could he? No, not after that. And the pantry had an alarm on it as well, didn't it? No, it didn't. Okay. We'll move on. We can circle back to that one. Let's talk about some of the other things that you told Detective Pisky. <coughs> you told Detective Pisky that long, long after the stroke happened in January, Timothy went on a hunger strike. That was a lie, wasn't it? Not long after. And no, that was not a lie. That was the truth. He went on a hunger strike. Yes, sir, he did. It, was, it wasn't immediately, but it was within a few days. And uh, a hunger strike is... Refusing to eat, right? Yes, sir. So he's refusing to eat food not long after your husband has a stroke, right? Yes, sir. Then you don't need to put locks on the refrigerator and the freezer, do you? If he's refusing to eat. He, he stopped. He, he actually he started eating again. He started eating again, so then you decided he's been on a hunger strike. He's eating again, so now we better lock up the food. No, I did the, the locks to protect him because he could have... He could have killed himself eating those chicken nuggets. It's infuriating watching her try to insist that she deeply cared about if Timothy lived or died. She has done this three times during her three hours on the stand, and each time it feels more inappropriate than the last. She hasn't cried because she murdered her son. She has justified all of her abuse and torture of him. But you know what really gets those tear ducts going? The idea of him dying for any reason besides her killing him. If he died of natural causes, or being put in the foster care system, or eating a bag of chicken nuggets, that would be heartbreaking. But Timothy killing himself? That's fine. I didn't put the locks on after he did the hamburger or the bacon, but the chicken nuggets, he could. it was raw chicken. Chicken nuggets are cooked, aren't they? They're pre-cooked. Are they? I didn't even think about that. But it's okay if he has a frozen pizza roll or two, if he sits up, right? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. 
February 18th, 2022. Find out what he has snuck right the heck now. Because I know he has snuck all stuff since you weren't doing what you were supposed to. What do you mean you didn't know he was awake? You both should have been awake at 10.30. I am not happy. You know he wasn't just sitting there. Check the brownies in the kitchen. Check everything not locked away. Check where the flipping keys have been. So starting February, you had to lock up all the food. Make sure he's not getting into the brownies, right? And all of the food was never locked. We had a, There's no pictures of it, but one of the, the lower cupboards had um, quite a bit of canned food in it. And he actually would get into that and eat stuff out of cans as well. Because there was nothing else to eat. You can't say that you did leave food out out of the kindness of your heart while also expressing annoyance at him for eating the only thing you left out. But there was never there was never a lock on that lower cupboard. I don't know if they... So I, I know they took pictures of it because I showed it to them. So he had access to one cupboard of food? Um, the pantry wasn't locked at, at the whole time. I know that. So the, there were times the pantry was locked or had an alarm on it, wasn't there? It, there was no alarm. I never got one for the pantry. I don't... I mean, I've heard the text messages. I don't remember there being a lock on the pantry, but I've heard the 228, messages. check his breath. I can almost guarantee he's eaten something. He was chewing on something when he walked downstairs. You and I will be talking about this on a later date when we're both home. Paul's response, yes, he grabbed some chips. I know. So he wasn't allowed to eat chips on 228 at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Couldn't have some chips. Right? I mean, it's, I, I don't know what happened in that situation. I, well, you didn't say, make sure he didn't get into the frozen chicken nuggets because it might kill him. You said, find out what he's been into, and Paul says he's been into chips. Right? That's what it says, yes, sir. So I imagine the next text message then is, oh, great, that's fine, he can have some chips. Well, no, the point of it was he was sneaking things. He knew better. Couldn't have chips. It wasn't that he couldn't have chips. It was that he would sneak things. It so was how would dishonest. He, how, would, how would he earn getting chips? He didn't have to earn them. All he had to do was ask. Because you weren't feeding him. If every time you express hunger, you are given bread with hot sauce that burns you, you are not going to trust the people who are feeding you. If every time you eat food, you are punished for it, you are going to believe that if people see you eating, they are going to hurt you. She had deliberately made it, so no matter what Timothy said or did, he would be punished. He couldn't trust his caretakers. He couldn't trust his home. Because Shanda made killing him into her favorite reality show. I was trying to teach him not to sneak. He snuck. It wasn't just food. He would sneak in the garage. He would sneak toys. He, he um, snuck around and messed with his, his baby brother's homeschooling materials. I've got, like, flashcards and stuff for him. He messed with those and got them all out of order. March 4th is around the time that you, that, that you acknowledged that he was in zip cups. You, 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 we talked about that a little bit earlier, but I don't think we clarified your final text message where you said, you know what, we will start cutting off the ends once they are tight so he can't do that. Is that one of the can't remember texts too? Yes, sir. <laughs> March 19th. Okay, that only makes partial sense. What did he grab? LOL. Paul's response, I don't know, chips or something small he had in his pocket. Okay, let me just re restart it. Is not eating again. That was you. March 19th, tell him he's just restarted his not eating again. So he took chips. So the punishment for that is now he's not allowed to eat anything again, right? If that's, I don't remember, sir. Don't remember that one, okay. Talking about the punishment outside, um, Paul says, wall sits question mark, and they say, push him until it looks like he is about to fall over, please. That was for running up and down the stairs, wasn't it, on April 14th? That's what it says, yes, sir. So you wanted Paul to run him up and down the stairs until he was ready to fall over? That's what the text says. What was what crime had he committed to warrant being physically driven until you fall over? I have no idea, sir. April 18th, he managed to come upstairs, yank the locks off of both the freezer and the pantry without you noticing, and he stole a bunch of crap that squished and rattled and did all sorts of stuff, and you slept through everything. KK, no devices until tomorrow, at least my lunch other than messaging 
until at least my lunch, other than messaging me, which would be very little. Remember that? I don't remember it, no, sir. So, but if the text message said he yanked the locks off the pantry, then there were locks on the pantry as of April 18th, right? Apparently. <clears throat> 426, almost freaking caught him again. I want all the fruit in the fridge, freezer, or pantry, and those locked. So locking up all the food again on April 26, correct? Well, the cupboard still was never locked. And what was in the cupboard? Um, canned, a bunch of canned stuff. There's a bunch of cans in there. A bunch of cans in there? Yeah. So you're okay with him getting into a bunch of canned stuff? I mean, he got into it all the time. So, so what, do you go to the drawer, get a can opener, open up the can, put it on the stove, warm the stuff up? No, he didn't. He, just, he would eat it straight out of the can. Well, that, that is weird. weird. Huh? That didn't worry you? The fact that she is taking time to insult him even now is insane. Of course he was eating the canned food straight out of the can. He was starving. You were depriving him of basic sustenance. You know this. You are literally on trial right now for it. He wasn't a weirdo who just liked eating cold soup or beans. He was starving and knew that if he didn't immediately down whatever he could get his hands on as fast as he could, he could be caught and punished. She created such a toxic environment that eating uncooked raw food was preferable to actually taking the time to prepare it. But she uses that to insult him, to remark to the public about how weird the boy she killed was. Well, when I discovered it, it did, but I just never put anything on that cupboard. So what, what caused this almost freaking caught him? I want all the food in the fridge and the freezer of the pantry, those locked up, April 28th. I have no idea, sir. Without having it in there, I don't know what caused it. It's likely related to the text before that, isn't it? I don't know. He keeps pulling his arms down, and that doesn't set off the camera alarm, so please watch him for that. Well, why did he have his arms up? He was standing against the wall with his arms on his head. So he'd have to do that for long periods of time, right? Stand there, but he didn't have to have his arms up the whole time, but I'd set a time limit on how long he had to have his arms up. And you're, you're either you're watching or watching an alarm to make sure his arm doesn't go down, right? From the sound of it. The uh, response to you about locking, to, from Paul, about locking up the food, it's just he pulled the pantry door lock. What do you mean he just pulled it? Did he take it off? Paul says, yes, that part that attaches to the wall is dangling right now due to sticky locks. Okay, get another one on it right away. Last I saw, they were on the floor in a bag in my room. And you need to make him run up and down the stairs a ton for that, even in the cold and rain. So trying to take some food, not in his cabinet full of canned goods, and pulling, a, pulling the alarm, the pantry lock off, means he doesn't get food, it all gets locked away, and he has to run the stairs, even in the cold and rain, right? Him being deceitful and sneaky. He was deceitful and sneaky a lot, wasn't he? Yes, sir, he was. Did it ever hurt you? It's because he was hungry? He was that way a lot, well before there was issues, well before the stroke. I mean, he, we always had issues with him over that, but his, dad, his stepmom warned me about that. Well before there were, you said well before the issues. What, what, what issues? Before his first hunger strike, before any of this, he was extremely sneaky. Did it ever occur to you that this is not the way to deal with a person who's been on a hunger strike? Locking up their food, locking up their access to food, punishing them when they, when they try to take food? Did, did, did that ever occur to you with your, your brilliant legal mind, as it was, that that wasn't a good idea? I don't know. I don't know what I was thinking. April 27th, Timothy is no longer allowed anywhere near the fridge, freezer, or pantry, or any other place where food is. So now it sounds like he can't even get into his cabinet full of canned goods, right? I mean, that's what I said. We never put it, there was never a lock on that. But he wasn't allowed near it. I mean, right? If that's what it says, I don't. That was, that was April 27th. Just a few days before, somehow he manages to be 104 pounds, which as we've heard from the testimony this morning, is still a good 30 pounds under average weight, right? Um, well, my, my kids are, most of them are slim. Paul is 6'1 and 130. He doesn't even hit the 134 for a 5'8 person. And I lose weight extremely easily. So mm -hmm. he, the, he, at 104, he looked average. February 14th, I may need some help with it, but I am about to get a lock for the pantry door. 
and a lock to the fridge in both freezers. And then we won't leave any food out of those areas, and he won't have access to unlock those. Okay, Paul's response. Your response, if you disagree, please say so, but he is not going to win this. I may need some help with it, but I'm out, about to get a... Oh, that's the same thing. So you were bound and determined that he wasn't going to win and get food without asking for permission first, weren't you? Even no, if that meant locking up all the food. As we mentioned, Timothy's basic needs were viewed in the most negative light that they could have been by Shanda. Her own texts indicated that she believed they were locked in a battle of wills, and she was determined to win. She viewed the things her son was doing to survive as an attack on her personally, and she was determined to beat him any way she could. When he could no longer hold himself up due to malnutrition and starvation, she told Paul he was faking in order to trick them into treating him better. When he started soiling himself due to the repeated abuse, she thought it was a dastardly attempt to try and sleep on the bed, so she forced him to wear adult diapers and sleep on a tarp. When he collapsed from exhaustion after hours of wall sits, she thought he was purpose- No, sir, I was bound to determine he would stop being deceitful and sneaky. <clears throat> he is not going to win this. Because he was being stubborn. He kept sneaking. He snuck stuff. We found out, actually, it was well before the stroke. Um, Paul discovered it. This was before his first hunger strike. I mean, before anything. Um, Paul went down to the downstairs bathroom one day, and I think it was, I want to say it was at least three cupboards, if not four across. And I guess he'd open one of the cupboards, and Timothy had snuck a bunch of stuff. I mean, there was wrappers and cans and all sorts of stuff. He did that. I mean, that was, I don't remember if it was before or after my oldest son's wedding, but it was, it was around that time. And again, your response to all of this, rather than to seek some professional help for him because of these eating issues that he apparently has, is to restrict even further his access to food, right? and then watch his every move on a camera or with a motion sensor or with an alarm, right? My response was to try to, to prevent him from being deceitful and sneaky. April 28th, do you want to have just the one on the pants for tonight? When I leave, you will have to have both of them on so it doesn't get away with anything. So by April 28th, you were putting multiple alarms on his person, weren't you? If that's what it says, I didn't realize I even owned more than one. I only remember ordering one. <clears throat> okay, take off the arm one, but warn him that I will count how many times he moves his arm from the camera picking it up, and he'll be doing stairs for that tomorrow. That's at 11 o'clock in the evening on 428. So you're watching to see how many times he moved his arm when he was in his room? How many times he dropped his arm? Was he in his room? I don't know. You I'm tell me. I wasn't there. The wall, All normally... I can do is read you the text message. It says, okay, take off the arm one, referencing back to the alarms, but warn him that I will count how many times he moves his arm from the camera, picking it up, and he will be doing stairs for that tomorrow. That he He's not sneaking around there, is he? No, he was up against the wall, and he was supposed to have his arms on his head for a certain amount of time. Okay, so at 11 o'clock at night, Sometimes. he's supposed to be up against the wall, and you want to make sure that it, 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 he knows you're going to know how many times he moves his arm, and if it's not satisfactory, he gets to do stairs for that the next day. Yes, sir, apparently. April 29th. What did he eat? I ate my burger already. Paul's response. He ate the crust. Do you remember what your response was? I don't remember. I heard it the other day, but I don't remember sending that. <clears throat> Go try to make him throw up, please. That was your response, wasn't it? If that's what it says. Don't remember? No, you put that one in the don't remember category? Like I said, I d unfortunately, between January and the time he passed away, I don't have a lot of memories in general of Gabriel, or, sorry, of G, of Timothy, of Paul. I know that there's times that I went over to my in-law's house, and there's, I don't remember a lot of that. It's not just this. So the crime he committed here, just so we're clear, wasn't wasn't sneaking frozen chicken nuggets or a bag of chips. It was eating the crust of what sounds to be an already half-eaten burger or an eaten burger. <clears throat> and your response to that is, go make him throw up, please. That's what it says. And the crime was again, it's being sneaky and deceitful. It's, it was never about the. It wasn't about the food. It was because he, he, he. Every time we turned around, he was sneaking something. Actually trying to trigger the motion alarms she attached to his body to keep her from sleeping. Everything he did to survive was viewed in the worst way possible, which is why she felt justified in murdering him. 
It wasn't just food. He snuck toys. Like I said, he snuck batteries. May 5th, did Timothy work hard enough to sleep tonight so you and I can both get some sleep? He will still have to work super hard tomorrow to earn the same, but wanted to ask about tonight first. You want to explain how that falls in with your statement that the reason he wasn't allowed to sleep was because he would keep you guys awake? I actually do remember that. Timothy asked if he could trade off um, not getting to sleep for something else, and I had him doing chores. There's a lot to unpack in that sentence, so I think I'll just start at the end. So he had to ask for permission to sleep. No, right? this was just, this was because he had kept us up. Like I said before, he had kept us up, so he wasn't going to get to sleep. And he asked if, if he could trade that punishment for another punishment. How was that not asked, having to ask for permission to go to sleep, Ms. Van Ark? It wasn't because it was a punishment. It wasn't anything about, he didn't have to ask to go to sleep. Yeah, it's, I'll, I'll do something else if you let me sleep, right? I'm tra it was trading a punishment for a punishment. That's... May 16th, where is Timothy? Paul's response, sorry, I was getting dressed. Timothy is on a five-minute bathroom timer. Well, four now. And your response, why is he on a five-minute timer? He doesn't get five minutes. He gets 60 seconds unless he needs to poop, then he gets two minutes. He only got to go to the bathroom for one minute or two minutes, depending on what he had to do? I don't remember. I didn't, I don't remember ever enforcing that, but obviously I sent it. But Does, doesn't that strike you as with everything else that happens? It's just... <clears throat> cruel and unusual to tell a child, heck, to tell anybody, that you only get a certain amount of time in the bathroom? That, that doesn't strike you as cruel? That's just the argumentative. It's argumentative. It's certainly it's argumentative. Uh, she can answer the question, but certainly the way it's phrased is, is an argument. There's no question there. It's, it's an argument. You can judge with the question mark at the end. Oh, I, I really want to know if she thinks it's cruel to put somebody on a bathroom camera. And the relevance of if she thinks it's cruel. The, it's, it's simply argumentative, Judge. It's, it's, uh... I, I don't think it's argumentative. Um, it, it would tend to give some insight, I suppose, to her intent. Uh, if, Mr. Johnson, you would like to clarify or have it clarified what her definition of cruel or unusual is so that we're all on the same page with the witness, that's fine. But I think the uh, question can be asked so that Thank the you, objection is overruled. So you, but you, your response to it, well, I, I want my question answered. Is it cruel to make a child go on, go to the bathroom on a timer? Yes, sir. May 17th, before I left, when I was having you sign into the camera and turning on the, sec the sound for the camera, so you would hear the alarm if it went off. And by the way, I told him yesterday that if he did that in the garage again, he would sleep in the garage for a night. So let him know that he would be doing that as soon as the temperatures are safe enough for him to make it, to make him do it. So you were going to have him sleep in the garage for a night. I actually remember that text message, and I was bent, I was frustrated. I never would have done it, but I was frustrated. I, I type really fast, and I, I admit I have a bad habit of saying stuff when I'm upset. And then calm it down later and it being totally different. But I do remember that and it, it never happened. You just said you don't remember. If you say you don't remember, stand firm in that. Really try and dig your disgusting little feet in and say no. I don't have any memory of the months of sadistic abuse I took part in. Whoops. You cannot say that you don't remember you blacked out, but when you did punish him it was because of something. You don't remember. So how can you say that with any authority? Especially if it goes against the direct evidence. It didn't happen? What didn't happen to you? So did, did you didn't make him sleep in the garage? No. Same day, 12.53. Did he heat the pancake in a cup? Otherwise, it's just powder, and it's not safe to eat without being heated either. And it actually says, did he hear the pancake in the cup? I assume you meant heat the pancake okay. in the cup, right? Um, do you remember this text, text exchange? I, vaguely. And Paul's response, no, he just ate the powder. And your response, that could make him sick, the dummy. Tabasco in his mouth and make him swallow and lots of it and do it every 30 minutes until you leave. This was May 17th. Do you remember this exchange? I don't remember the Tabasco because I never called it. I said Tabasco. Yeah. Tabasco in the mouth and make him swallow and lots of it and do it every 30 minutes until you leave. I don't remember that being a part of it. I remember part of the conversation, but I don't remember that part of it. Well, but I, the obviously didn't like Tabasco, did he? 
We didn't have any Tabasco sauce. That's why it doesn't make any sense. We had hot sauce, but we didn't have Tabasco sauce. That's okay, so the punishment for eating pancake in a cup is, to, is Tabasco or some type of hot sauce in the mouth. Is that right? Sneaking something dangerous. I mean, if that's what, I mean, if you're asking what he was punished for, it would be for sneaking something. You were concerned for his well-being? Yes, sir. Right. That, that's, that's why you're having this text change, right? You're yes, really, sir. You're really concerned for him at that point. Yes, sir. Those pancakes in a cup had, um, if I remember correctly, it's been a while, but I think they had eggs in them. That could make him sick, the dummy. Do you always refer to him as a dummy when you're worried about him? No, sir. You can look at the text messages. I hardly ever said anything like that. Hardly ever said anything like that? It's, it's not a good idea to call a child a dummy, is it? I never would to him. I was frustrated, like I said. <clears throat> Later on in that same text exchange, Paul says he also crapped himself. And the response is, what? In his pants? Seriously? Paul, I told him to take a five-minute shower. Make him do the work in the garage with nothing on below the waist. Just make sure the garage door stays closed, and then he can stand down against the wall with nothing on below the waist until you leave. Just please make sure G does not go downstairs at all while he's standing there like that. Break that up again. So make him do the work in the garage with nothing on below the waist. So his punishment for having an accident was that he had to do chores without pants and underwear on, right? If that's what it says, I don't remember this. That's pretty humiliating, isn't it? I mean, he was by himself. It wasn't, I would never, I mean, I don't remember this at all, sir. You don't, you don't remember that at all? No, sir. Uh, but you, you did have the presence of mind at that time says, just make sure the garage door stays closed because you don't want anyone seeing him doing that, do you? Well, I, I didn't want the garage door open ever because we had a lot of stuff out there, mm. so. And then he can stand against the wall with nothing on below the waist until you leave. So, so in addition to cleaning the garage, then he has to stand against the wall with no pants and underwear on, correct? I mean, if that's what it says, I don't, I don't remember this. Please make sure G does not go downstairs at all. Don't remember that either. No, sir. Didn't want, but you, again, you, you physically typed these words into your phone and sent them to Paul to make sure that G doesn't see Timothy like that, right? Yes, sir. His clothes need to be washed right away, but he gets to be without anything below the waist for a while today. Did he see? Did he say why the heck he did that? And Paul's response is, he didn't. He said he didn't want to disturb anyone. He had to ask for permission to go to the bathroom, didn't he? No, sir. Not usually. If he was on the wall, he did. Okay, so let's review. Timothy sleeping in the garage was a bridge too far for Shanda. But the following is a list of things that were deemed acceptable to her. Sleeping in the closet, doing hours-long wall sits, being chased up and down the stairs in the rain and snow for hours, sitting in a bathtub filled with ice while being filmed, being poked and prodded while in the said bathtub to ensure he wasn't in a position she deemed as too comfortable, sleeping on a tarp, sitting in a dark closet with both of his arms over his head in a stress position for hours, wearing a dirty adult diaper and not being allowed to change it, cleaning the garage and doing wall sits without any pants or underwear on, eating bread smothered in hot sauce for every meal, eating frozen pizza rolls, being shackled to a wall, being forced to wear leg weights, not being allowed outside or to see company. So all of that's well and good, and she can justify those things, but she cries at the idea of her being able to make Timothy sleep outside. Because you're supposed to be standing still. The handcuff transactions, we've talked about that. So let's get back to your statement to Officer, or excuse me, to Detective Pisky. Um, you, did, you didn't tell the detective about the warm bath, um, but you told him that you realized how skinny he was the night before and threatened to take him to the ER if he didn't eat. That's not true, is it? No, sir. And you didn't make him a piece of toast and give it to him and make him eat it, did you? No, sir. I have no idea why I said that. I was. I was traumatized. I actually didn't come out of the first month I was in jail. I, it was, I wish uh, the Lydia that used to work for the public defender's office visited me and she, she said it was, it was pretty obvious that I, that I was under severe trauma. Mm -hmm. I didn't eat for my first month. This was, this was while the, they were searching your house on July 6th while you were sitting in your house. Yes. If you are on trial for intentionally starving and torturing your son to death, don't try to garner sympathy by saying you didn't eat. It's a bit inappropriate and also very fucking stupid. Like we're going to feel bad for you because killing your son over a period of months was so difficult for you. So you're thinking, ooh, I better, better tell him, yeah, he looked a little skinny last night and I thought I should take him to the ER and then make some toast with butter on it and watch him eat it and he walked away. None of that happened, did it? No, I don't, I don't even remember that. 
but you had the presence of mind to lie to the officer at the time when he was investigating. Like I said, I was traumatized. I don't know. I don't remember this, sir. Um, he wouldn't come upstairs when she said goodnight. She walked down to the last couple of stairs and asked for a hug and a kiss. That didn't happen either, did it? I don't remember. I mean, I would assume not, but I don't remember. In fact, you're acknowledging that the, that video that shows you dragging him into a small room, looking like he does when he dies, calling him a dummy for breathing with his mouth open, is actually what you did to him the night before he died, right? If that's what it shows, I don't remember, sir. Your statement to Detective PC continues. She got ready for work in the morning and went to check on him. She said his name, but he did not respond. She put her hand on his chest and he was not breathing. She remembered her 20-year-old son, Paul, helping her get him off the bed. That was all a lie, wasn't it? Yes, sir. You know where he was when you found him that morning, right? In, in the closet. In, in the small room. room. And er, prior to that, you told Officer Stephanie, well, it was about 5.30, he fell out of bed, and I had to go and put him back into bed. Also a lie, right? Yes, sir. I have no idea why I said that, sir. Like I said, I was traumatized. You told Detective Pieski that Timothy started a stated he was on a hunger strike two weeks ago. This is two weeks before he dies. He goes on a hunger strike. Yes, sir. Did he go on a hunger strike? Yes, sir, he did. Show me the text message between you and Paul where it says that he's on a hunger strike. I don't know if I ever texted him about it, sir. We talked about it, but I never texted. I mean, if it's not in there, I don't. We didn't text about everything. They most certainly did. We have heard examples of her texting Paul about Timothy's bowel movements, as well as pouring hot sauce on his penis, not sitting in the precise way she wants him to sit in the bathtub, everything. If it's not in the text messages, it did not happen. You, you, know, you never texted Paul about him being on a hunger strike? No, I would have told him that in person. I wouldn't have said that over text message. That would have been imper important. But Paul has to watch him for the day when you're not home, right? Yes, sir. So it would be Paul's responsibility to get him some food, right? Yes, sir. So while he's on a hunger strike, instead of talking about the hunger strike, your response to that is, give him four slices of bread with hot sauce on it, and if he eats them and waits 30 minutes, he can eat four without. Right? I don't know what day that was, sir, if you're... Well, let's find it and make sure. I what mean, we tried to, just because he wasn't eating, we tried to feed him. That was... And the best solution you come up with is force him to eat the bread with hot sauce on it. That was the response to the hunger strike? I don't remember. I mean, it wasn't, we tried to feed him. That's, that's all I remember. <clears throat> so when would that hunger strike have started? Um, end of June, late June. Megan, you never looked at the, the bone thin photo to see what kind of condition he was in before he goes on this hunger strike. Right? Yes, sir. Did it ever occur to you, like, he's on a hunger strike now? And I know Paul had sent me that text about, you know, he's bone thin. I think we actually need to feed him. We need to actually feed him. It never occurred to you that maybe you should go back and look at that text message now and see what condition he was in at the time? No, sir. When With me, when something's out of sight, it's out of mind. Once that's scrolled up, I don't scroll back on <coughs> text messages. Out of sight, out of mind. That applies to Timothy as well, doesn't it? That applies to, to a lot of things, sir. It's not just, I mean, if not little man was Timothy. it. No, if little man was not in front of me right then, then I wasn't necessarily thinking about it. Paul wasn't. June 19th, you can do his bread with hot sauce at any time, though preferably sooner rather than later. Put more hot sauce on than you did yesterday, please. And he has to eat at least three slices with hot sauce, but he may have more as long as they have plenty of hot sauce on him. That was June 19th. Was he on his hunger strike then? I would assume not. I don't know. I don't know. I don't have an exact date. That was about two weeks before he, he passed away, and that's when you said the hunger strike started. Is that right? Yes, sir. But Did it occur to you that the hunger strike was because he didn't enjoy eating bread with hot sauce on it? Did it occur to me? No, sir, because he did it way back in January, and that wasn't the case. June 21st. How, how was everything? Did you make him eat his bread with hot sauce? Yeah, and that's when it's the uh, he gets four with hot sauce and then four more. 30 minutes, that was June 21st. You don't know if the hunger strike started there then? I don't know, sir. Like I said, I, I can only guesstimate. That's...
the only reason I remember the three weeks the first time around is because it was right after the stroke and it, he started eating again before the end of January. Did you did you think he's on a second hunger strike now? <coughs> I really need to get him some treatment for this. Did I think along those lines? No, sir. He he admitted to being. He told us very early on after the stroke that he was taking advantage of that because we didn't have the extra set of eyes with my husband, and he was being difficult. He he actually Timothy told me that. His dad and stepmom used to let him get away with everything. Whether that's true or not, I don't know, but he's, I've always been a stricter parent anyway, and he, he told me on multiple occasions that if, um, if he thought that if he pushed me hard enough that I would just quit making him do stuff and I, I wouldn't make him cooperate. Let me ask you, does this sound like something that anyone would say if not in a state of total duress? Think about a time where you needed to apologize for something, where you were wholeheartedly in the wrong and you felt bad for what you did. Did you say, hey, person I am apologizing to, I did whatever I am apologizing for because I am simply a bad person and believed I could manipulate you. I have been allowed to get away with my bad behavior by other individuals, but you were too cool and smart for me to manipulate effectively. No, because that's the dumbest fucking thing you've ever heard and nobody talks like that. If someone is a proficient manipulator, they generally aren't going to admit that that's what they're doing. Then again, in instances where a person is apologizing for wrongdoing, they will acknowledge that what they did was wrong while also telling the other person why they felt justified in doing so. Timothy supposedly monologuing like he is a villain in a kid's movie about how he used his autism to manipulate others and get away with his bad behavior is one of the most far-fetched things she has tried to sell on the stand, and she faked throwing up less than an hour ago. When a person has been abused for a significant amount of time, when they are in a near constant state of stress and anxiety, they will say whatever it is they believe you want them to say. They will admit to things they've never done. They will create elaborate lies about horrible things they have never said or done, all with the hope of getting some amount of relief. If Timothy ever did say this, which is doubtful, it was clearly something said in a state of duress. All right, well, here's an exchange from June 29th. Maybe this can shed some light on the hunger strike feeding situation. Trust me, I know he's thin. Trust me, I know he's thin. That was your, your text, no? Paul's, you sent... I, I don't remember text, the right? text, but I mean... You don't remember that one either? No, sir. Trust me, I know he's thin. That being said, he told me a week and a half ago that he wanted to be thin to make me feel bad for punishing him. You don't get to grump at him for that, though I already lit into him plenty for it. Is this while he's on his hunger strike? I mean, I would, I would assume so, yes, sir. This is June 29th. This is yes, about sir. eight days before he dies. Yeah, I would assume so. And Paul's response is, of course he did. And your response to that is, yeah, so while I want to fix it, he will get most of his calories from plain bread and rice or, you know, pulling that. He will get plenty of calories but not get to enjoy them that way, you know? Uh, that doesn't sound like somebody who's on a hunger strike to me. Can you clarify that for me, please? I don't, I don't remember. But I know he wasn't eating. There was... Continues on. KK, so yeah, we'll tell you more about what he can eat later, June 29th. Just because we offered him food doesn't, I mean, we offered him food when he was on the hunger strike in January. Um, at least I did. I mean, I would assume Paul did as well. But just because you offered stuff, I mean, you couldn't, even though it says try to force him to eat, he couldn't force him to eat stuff. I mean, if he didn't You heard eat Paul's it. testimony yesterday that he had to force him, force him to eat that bread sauce, the bread with hot sauce on it, didn't you? Yes, sir. I don't know what he means by that. Uh, it's interesting you use the phrase, we, we tried to tempt him with food. Uh, that, that came up while he was in the ice bath, didn't it? Tempting him with food. Do you mean the day before he passed? Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, if I said, I, yes, sir. I mean, I... <clears throat> You told Paul to heat up some pizza rolls because Gene needed the pizza rolls anyway, right? Do you remember that? Yes, sir. You I, I don't remember the text message. Don't remember, I... So this falls in the I don't remember category as well. Is that right? Like most of it. Yes, the text message says... Heat one up, hold it in front of them, but be ready to pull away if he tries to grab it. You don't remember sending any of that? I don't remember it, no, sir. You heard, you heard the text messages read yesterday, correct? Yes, sir, I did. Is it, is it fair to say that you just don't remember those text messages? Most of them, I don't remember. Most of them. But then you've got your big bite. I could, 
I can pretty much guarantee I don't remember most of that either. I don't, and it's not just my text with Paul. You, you don't remember anything? No, sir, I don't. But somehow you were able to hold down a job as a judicial clerk during that time period, right? Yes, sir. My you only. You were able to at least provide dog training to one client at that time, correct? Yes, sir. And you remembered to tell Paul to get up and walk Sharma just about every morning, didn't you? I mean, I, that would be automatic, would be reflex. If it's in there, then, then I would assume so, yes, sir. That would be reflex, to, to tell Paul to get up and walk Sharma, is that what you're saying? I mean, if, I, if it's a habit, if I do it enough times, then... And plus, it serves to get Paul out of bed when I left, because he'd like to go back to sleep. You told the officer that there was an alarm on the basement door. That, that's this, the closet. This is the small closet, because there was some sewing stuff stored in it. That was a lie, wasn't it? Yes, sir. There was sewing stuff stored in it before he asked to do that. But, but the alarm I don't know why I told him that. The alarm wasn't on there because there was sewing stuff on it, was there? No, sir. The alarm was on it because Paul, because Timothy was supposed to be in there, right? I mean, as far as I know, like I said, I don't. Don't, don't. You don't remember, but you were able to lie to the police officer at the time? I don't remember talking to the police I mean, I don't remember this part of the conversation with the police officer, sir. You tell the officer that there were cameras in the home because, they, because G would strip down naked and wander around. Um, well, that wasn't the only reason the cameras were in the house, was it? No, sir. You left out all the other details about that you had to monitor Timothy and make sure he didn't go certain places and sneak places and be deceitful, right? You didn't tell the officer that, did you? Apparently not. I don't know why I didn't, but... You said he fell out of bed and you went and had to get him and put him back into bed. He never fell out of bed that night, did he? Not as far as I know. I don't remember, sir. Well, you know he didn't sleep in the bed that night, don't you? Well, yeah, so I'm sorry. Right. So saying that you got up at 5.30 and had to put him back into bed... Uh, and then you changed it to 30 minutes because at some time with the ending in the 30 because you learned at that point that rigor mortis had already set in and he'd been deceased for a number of hours. That was still a lie, wasn't it? I mean, yes, sir. I don't remember any of this. I'm sorry. <coughs> the, hot sauce, the hot sauce in the bathroom downstairs was for food. Um, but it wasn't, was it? The hot sauce was for punishment, right? It was also to put on food. But you didn't mention that oh, we also use hot sauce as a form of punishment, did you? Apparently not. I'm, I'm guessing you probably didn't mention the officer. Oh, we also had the crazy idea yesterday to pour some hot sauce on his penis for a punishment. You didn't mention that either, did you? Apparently not, sir. Like I said, I don't remember. You told the officer that you did not restrict Timothy's movement at night with shackles. That was also a lie, wasn't it? Again, I don't remember, sir. I know we talked about it, but as far as overnight, no. But you would restrict his movement with shackles, wouldn't you? Whether it was zip ties or handcuffs or leg shackles. I mean, I can only go back based on the text messages. I don't know. If you can only go by the text messages, the answer would be yes. At this point, she is refusing to look remorseful or repentant about what she did. Any person who genuinely didn't remember that they tortured and abused their own child would be horrified to hear these messages. They wouldn't have pled not guilty, and even if they had, hearing the reality of what they'd put their child through would be horrific for them. But not Shanda. The only times she has ever shown any emotion has either been self-serving or when the idea of Timothy being killed or abused by anyone other than her comes up. She really wants that privilege, to the point where the very concept of it being taken away moves her to tears. Why did you wait 20 minutes to call 911 after you found Timothy deceased in the small closet in the small room? I have no idea, honestly. I did. I had. I learned of that gap. What just a couple of days ago? I it's the whole. I mean, the whole day is surreal to me. So I, I have no idea why we waited like that. I don't know. I can't imagine waiting, but apparently it happened. I don't know. Do you remember Paul asking you, "Should we call 911?" I don't remember him ever asking. I I don't. I mean, because I was the one that called, and I was the one. I, I he. I remember performing CPR, 
and he did help me out a little bit when I got tired to take over a little bit. But, I mean, I can't imagine ever saying no to that. I, but if it's on the video, that's what you said, right? If it's on there. So if the video showed that it begins with you with movement outside of the room at about 6.19.21, and 911 is actually called You say you tell Paul you have to call at six thirty-seven, so about that's about eighteen minutes, isn't it? I mean, I'll, let's see, nineteen. Yeah, that's eighteen minutes. And Timothy was never responsive to you, was he? No, sir. His eyes were completely wide open, completely glazed over, weren't they? As far as I remember, yes, sir. He never moved, never took a breath, never did anything, did? He? No, sir. And while this is all going on, you tell Paul will have to tell them he was on a hunger strike. Right? You remember telling him that? No, I don't. Don't remember that either? No, sir. You remember telling Paul, or do you remember saying, put his pants on to make it look like he's been this way? I don't remember saying that. You remember asking Paul to put the belt on to make it sure that that's the way he looked? No, sir. But if they're on video, you said those things, yes, right? Fan art. Isn't it true? Timothy had just become nothing more than an annoyance for you, and he wasn't even a human being in your eyes anymore. That is absolutely not true. So, Shanda botched that pretty horribly. Let's see how she and her attorney try to redeem themselves. Before we do that, though, I want to be clear, this attorney is not at fault for the frankly piss-poor arguments they are going to be forced to make. Any lawyer who would have had Shanda for a client would have been screwed. She is on video mocking her son hours before he died. She was constantly putting it down in writing how much she hated Timothy and the lengths she would go to abuse him, and any attorney would tell her to plead guilty. But Shanda went to law school on a scholarship. She believes she is smarter than they are, and she would believe that any rational person would have killed Timothy if they knew just how annoying he was. She also believed that she could throw her other son under the bus with no issue. Her lawyer did his best with what he was given, which was frankly an unwinnable case. Ms. Vanderar. Yes, sir. Did you, re and, and your lawyer, did you reduce everything you did and said and, and, and the comments you made into text that you put in your, your, your your phone was sent out? Oh, absolutely not. I talk a lot. I admit that. I, the text was probably 10% of what I said. Okay, so it, it, would it be true to say that there, there are other conversations, other issues, other details that are not contained in those texts? Many, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, you were asked uh, if you only couldn't remember the, the, the bad things or the, I guess, the incriminating things. You remember having that question? Yes, sir, I remember that question. Were you, did, during the course of this conversation you had with Mr. Roberts, were you ever asked about any of the good things that were going on? Not really, no, sir. So, in, and I, as I recall, you reported that you can't remember some of those as well? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I know my son played baseball. I don't remember most of his games. And I know I caught for the team because the coaches were on first and third. But I don't actually remember doing it most of the time. I remember a couple of games, but I know we had more than two games. Let me ask you about this. You, you, you had children, and you taught dogs. Yes, sir. Do you teach children and dogs conduct or responsibility in the same manner? Absolutely not. That is true. She treated the dogs better, or at least she treated them better than Timothy. Her other kids were treated about the same as the dogs. Shortly thereafter, Shanda would fake another breakdown, and her testimony would come to an end. The trial would wrap up after the day. However, the jury was in for a shock when Shanda would refuse to show up for trial the next morning. Her lawyer would claim publicly that her absence was for an unrelated medical issue, but it would seem that she realized how poorly her taking the stand had gone. She had believed on some level she would be able to explain away all of the text messages and the abuse, that the men and women of the jury would hear what had happened, hear what a nuisance Timothy was for wanting food every day, 
and think she was justified, but that wasn't the case. If you have time, I recommend watching the prosecution's closing arguments, as they were amazingly delivered. The jury would be sent out for deliberations at 2.35 p.m. December 15th, and less than two hours later, they announced their verdict. Shanda Vander Ark was found guilty of both first-degree murder and first-degree child abuse. Shanda has yet to be sentenced, but it's likely she will be getting life in prison, which is more than she deserves in our opinion. If you have made it to this portion of the video, thank you so much for watching. I do apologize for some of my outbursts in this case, but researching this video hit strangely close to home. As always, if there is a video you would like to see on this channel, or a case you would like to have examined, email us at dreading.official at gmail.com, or let us know in the comments down below. I hope you have a great day, and remember to stay safe.